Book four, chapter two, part four of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume two, by Henry Charles Lee. Book four, Organization, Chapter two, Part four, The Tribunal. The most laborious work imposed on the inquisitors was the visitation of their districts. These were large usually embracing several bishoprics and when the tribunals became sedentary the necessity was apparent of a closer watch over aberrations than could be exercised from a fixed centre already in the instructions of fourteen ninety eight a system of visitation termed the general inquisition is seen at work and in fifteen hundred Datha ordered the inquisitors to visit all places where an inquest had not been held each inquisitor was to travel with a notary receiving denunciations and taking testimony so that on his return the colleagues could consult together and order such arrests as might be found necessary in districts where such visitations had already been made one of the inquisitors was ordered to travel every year holding inquests in the towns and villages and publishing the edict of faith to attract denunciations the other inquisitor remained in the tribunal to dispatch routine business or if there were none such he too was ordered to take the road reports in detail of the work accomplished in the visitation were to be made to the inquisitor general this remained the basis of the system and the instructions of fifteen sixty one merely define more clearly the functions of the visiting inquisitor who was told that he was not to make arrest unless there were danger of flight but was only to gather testimony and carry it to the tribunal for action if he made an arrest he was not to try the accused but to send him to the secret prison trifling cases however he could dispatch on the spot taking care that he bore delegated powers from the ordinary for that purpose the importance attached to these visitations is apparent when during the siege of toledo in the comunidades cardinal adrian and the constable and admiral of castile joined in an order november third fifteen twenty one to the commanders of the besieging forces to allow the inquisitors to come out and perform their accustomed visits in fifteen seventeen these visits were ordered to be made every four months each inquisitor taking his turn under pain of forfeiting a year's salary this indicates that the duty was distasteful and likely to be shirked and in fifteen eighty one the obligation was reduced to once a year starting at the end of january and taking such portions of the district as were deemed to require special attention in sixteen o seven the districts were ordered to be laid out in circuits to be visited in turn until all were covered when the process began anew in fifteen sixty nine an elaborate code of instructions was framed by which it appears that the principal objects were the publication of the edict of faith with its consequent crop of denunciations an investigation into the character and conduct of commissioners and familiars and the maintenance in the churches of the san benitos of those punished by the inquisition for which purpose the visitor carried lists for all the places to be visited a certain amount of stateliness and ceremony attended the visit before reaching a town word was sent forward of the hour of expected arrival when the authorities the church dignitaries and the principal gentlemen of the place were summoned to go forth to meet the inquisitor and escort him to his lodgings the secretary was instructed to note the details of these receptions whether honorable or otherwise the character of the lodgings provided and utensils furnished lack of respect on these occasions was punishable in fifteen sixty four dr thurita visiting the seas of gerona and elne found the gates of castellon de empurias closed against him and one of the guards seized his horse's reins he proceeded to prosecute the local authorities when the consuls proved that they were not in fault but two guards salvador Llop and juan maraña were sent to barcelona for trial although occasionally nests of morisco and jewish apostates were discovered in these visits as a rule the practical results appear to have been rather the gratification of old grudges by neighbors in little towns and the gathering in of fines by the inquisitors in fifteen eighty two juan aymar inquisitor of barcelona in reporting a visitation of the seas of gerona and elne and part of barcelona and vich makes parade of having published the edict of faith in two hundred sixty three places but he brought in only seven trivial cases of which four were of frenchmen these trips involved no little labor and even hardship four months was the time prescribed for them commencing early in february and the vernal equinox was not likely to be agreeable especially in mountainous districts naturally the duty was shirked whenever practicable and the effort of the suprema to compel its performance was endless in fifteen fifty seven it instructed the receiver at saragossa that each inquisitor on alternate years must spend at least four months in visitations and that this performance is an absolute condition precedent to his receiving the customary ayuda de costa 
This was carried even further in a carta acordada of January 25th, 1607, to all the tribunals. The inquisitor, in his turn, must start on the first Sunday in Lent, without attempting an excuse or a reply, and the report of his visit must be included in the annual statement of cases, for otherwise the ayuda de costa will be withheld from the whole tribunal, because these visits are the principal reason of its bestowal. This solidarity enforced on all the officials was possibly owing to the recalcitrance of subordinates, for in 1598 we find a tribunal asking the Suprema to issue the necessary orders to them direct, which it obligingly did, while remonstrating that it should not be burdened with such details. Throughout the 17th century, the correspondence of the Suprema with the tribunals of Valencia and Barcelona is filled with orders to the Inquisitor whose turn it is to go and refusals to accept excuses, and in 1705, a letter to Valencia asks why the visit had been neglected. When there were three inquisitors, the absence of one did not interfere with current business, but where there were only two it was a serious impediment. From the beginning the rule was absolute that two must act conjointly in all important matters, such as sentencing to torture, ordering publication of evidence, or rendering final sentence, and this in both civil and criminal actions. Minor and trivial cases, however, could be dispatched by one in the absence of his colleague, and he could continue to hold audiences and gather testimony, while, in the habitually leisurely transaction of inquisitorial business, procrastination caused by the crippling of the tribunal for four months in every year was evidently not regarded as of any moment. In the little tribunal of Majorca, however, which could support but a single inquisitor, he was deemed competent to act by himself, and he probably was excused from visitations. Next in importance to the inquisitors stood the promotor fiscal, or prosecuting officer, in the original inquisition of the thirteenth century there was no such officer there was candor in the position of the inquisitor as both judge and prosecutor infinitely preferable to the hypocrisy that the trial was an action between a prosecutor and an accused with the inquisitor as an impartial judge how this came to pass will be considered hereafter we have seen that even in the skeletal organization of the first tribunal in fourteen eighty a fiscal was deemed essential he ranked next to the inquisitors and in fourteen eighty four it was ordered that he should assist in all public functions, after the inquisitors and ordinary but before the judge of confiscations. Yet he was a subordinate. In the regulation of salaries in 1498, the inquisitors received 60,000 marabedis, the receiver the same, while the fiscal was rated at 40,000, the same as the notaries, and even the messenger had 20,000. So in the Sicilian tribunal, in 1500, the inquisitors and receiver have 6,000 sueldos, while the fiscal and notaries have only 2,500. It was the same with the ayuda de costa. In 1540 we find the fiscal allowed only the same as the notaries and alguacil, and when in 1557 the scale was fixed for Saragossa, the fiscal was portioned with 1,000 sueldos and the inquisitors with 3,000. The fiscal was held to act wholly under orders from the inquisitors. In the instructions of 1484, they are represented as ordering him to accuse the contumacy of fugitives and to denounce the dead against whom they find evidence. So in a trial of 1528, we find the inquisitors ordering the fiscal to present his accusation against the defendant. In 1561, among his duties was prescribed that of keeping the secreto clean and in good order. He opened and closed its door with his own hands and, in 1570, he was required to have all the multitudinous documents well arranged, sewed, covered, and so marked that they could readily be had when wanted. The letters and instructions of the Suprema were placed in his hands, and it was his duty to give in writing to each official such portion as apply to him. In 1632 there was added to his labors that of furnishing the Suprema a monthly report embracing every pending case with a summary of all that had been done in it since the beginning, a duty apparently not relished for the order had to be repeated in 1639. With all these somewhat multifarious duties, we never hear of a fiscal having a clerk, assistant, or deputy. In 1582 it was prescribed that his seat in the audience chamber was to be smaller than those of the inquisitors, placed to one side and without cushions. In public functions his chair was to be similar to theirs except that it had no cushion. The inquisitors were required to address him and the judge of confiscations as merced, and when he entered, they were not obliged to rise but merely to raise their caps. The position of the fiscal gradually improved. In his instructions of 1595 to Manrique de Lara, Philip II couples him with the Inquisitor, in requiring both to be in orders, and prescribes great care in the appointment for it is customary to promote fiscals to the Inquisitorship. Similarly, Philip III in 1608 
requires both offices to be filled by jurists and when in 1632 and 1637 the suprema made holy orders a condition it included fiscals with inquisitors the assimilation between the offices was rapid and in 1647 in a payment of ayuda de costa in valencia there occurs an item of thirty thousand marabedis to inquisitor antonio de ayala y berganza quote, por la plaza de fiscal unquote, showing that he was acting as fiscal the idea of coalescence was becoming familiar when in sixteen fifty eight gregorio cid after six years service as inquisitor of sardinia was transferred to cuenca he suggested that there ought to be there two inquisitors and a fiscal or at least that the junior inquisitor should serve also as fiscal the identification of the offices was facilitated in sixteen sixty by a royal cedula prescribing that fiscals were to be held the equals of inquisitors in precedence and honors canopies cushions and the like as well as in pay and emoluments thenceforth the office of fiscal came to be filled by one of the inquisitors though he took care to preserve his dignity by styling himself quote, inquisidor fiscal unquote, or quote, the inquisitor who performs the office of fiscal unquote. Thus at length the two offices coalesced, and we have seen in the table of officials in 1746 that they were reckoned together. As a matter of course, the inquisitor who acted as prosecutor did not enter the consulta de fe, and vote on the fate of the accused whom he had prosecuted. Sometimes, when there was no fiscal and no inquisitor willing to perform the duties, the senior secretary assumed the function. Such a case occurs as early as 1655, and it continued occasionally to the end. The notaries or secretaries formed an important part of the tribunal. They reduced to writing all the voluminous proceedings of the trials, all the audiences given to the accused with the interrogatories and answers, all the evidence of the witnesses and its ratification, the endless repetitions in the cumbrous and involved system of procedure which developed until the object seemed to be to protract business beyond the limits of human endurance. They kept the records which required an elaborate system of indexing so that the name of any culprit and his genealogy could be found whenever wanted in the later period moreover when the tribunals communicated to each other all their acts the correspondence served to fill the gap arising from diminished business at the beginning they were forbidden to employ clerks and were required to write everything with their own hands and this seems to have continued to the last in the earlier period they were styled notaries and sometimes escribanos or scriveners possibly because as such their attestation authenticated all papers. Early in the seventeenth century the title gradually changed to secretaries, an innovation to which a writer in 1623 objects, as not distinguishing them from the secretaries of magnates and cities. This objection did not prevail, and a document of 1638 uses the terms as convertible, although an order of the Suprema, in the same year, forbids notaries to be called secretaries, while in 1648 we find the new appellation firmly established. The importance of the office is shown by its fairly liberal salary. In the instructions of 1498, it is placed at 30,000 marabedis, one half of that of the inquisitors, though the proportion diminished in time, for we have seen that, in 1746, the secretary received 2,352 reales, while the inquisitor had 7,352. There was compensation for this, however, in the heavy fees accruing to the secretaries from applicants for proofs of limpieza a business shared with a new official known as quote, secretario de actos positivos unquote. the number moreover had greatly increased for while at the early period with its heavy work a tribunal was allowed but two notaries in the later time there were often four or five salaried secretaries to whom were sometimes added honorary secretaries with entrance to the secreto and honorary secretaries without entrance there was also a notary of sequestrations whose duties were highly important in the early times of abundant confiscations. He was always present when arrests were made, so as to draw up on the spot an inventory of the property seized. But as confiscations diminished, the office became superfluous and was suppressed by a carta acordada of December 1, 1634. After this we hear of a superintendent of sequestrations in 1647, and subsequently its occasional duties were discharged by some other official for a moderate compensation as in sixteen seventy in valencia the procurator of the fisc received twenty five thousand libras a year for attending to them the alguacil was the executive officer of the tribunal in the early lists of salaries his pay is the same as or even larger than that of the inquisitors but this was because the prison was at his charge from this he was relieved in fifteen fifteen by ferdinand who empowered the inquisitors to appoint carceleros 
at a salary of five hundred sueldos after which the wages of the alguacil declined to those of the secretaries and even of the alcaide who succeeded him as jailer his superior dignity however was recognized in a carta acordada of may thirteenth sixteen ten which provided that in public functions he should have precedence over the secretaries his long wand of office which exceeded that of secular alguaciles was also a distinction and when in fifteen seventy six the alguaciles of the santa cruzada in barcelona ventured to imitate him the suprema ordered the inquisitors to punish them his functions were various the inquisitors the receiver and the judge of confiscations were forbidden to appoint any one else to execute their orders if he were at hand if in his absence an arrest had to be made the fact had to be attested at the foot of the warrant issued to another without which the receiver was ordered not to pay the expenses incurred he made all levies and seizures and was entitled to fees for the service by the instructions of fourteen eighty eight if the duty was at a distance of more than three or four leagues he was not to be sent but a temporary substitute whose commission expired with the performance of the errand perhaps this was because the thrifty ferdinand had insisted that if he was sent out of the city he must pay his own expenses but this was relaxed for in fifteen o two we find the rule established that if an alguacil is sent from one province to another to a greater distance than four leagues his expenses were to be paid he had however to furnish at his own cost a satisfactory person to take charge of the prison during his absence and if he required assistance in making arrests the inquisitors selected the persons and determined their pay the alguacil mayor seems to have been an ornamental personage usually a man of distinction who thereby proclaimed his purity of blood and devotion to the faith we have seen that in seville and cordoba the office was hereditary in noble houses whose ancestors had abandoned to the inquisition royal castles of which they were alcaides receiving in return this position with handsome emoluments in sixteen fifty five the alguacil mayor of the tribunal of cordoba was luis mendez de aro conde duque of olivares and his deputy was gonzalo de cardenas y cordoba a knight of calatrava in seville don juan de saavedra y alvarado marquis of moscoso served as alguacil mayor at the auto de fe of march eleventh sixteen ninety one and november thirtieth sixteen ninety three about seventeen fifty the tribunal of seville had the marquis of villafranca as alguacil mayor that of valladolid had the marquis of revilla in granada the incumbent was a minor don nicolas Velázquez, and the office was served by don diego ramirez de la piscina the humbler officials of the tribunal were the nuncio the portero and the carcelero or alcaide de las carcelas secretas strictly speaking the nuncio was a messenger or courier bearing dispatches to the suprema or other tribunals and before the post office was organized his life must have been an active one in fifteen o two we hear of his salary being twelve hundred sueldos out of which he defrayed his travelling expenses but subsequently these were paid by the receiver and in fifteen forty one his stipend was five hundred sueldos his ayuda de costa in fifteen sixty seven was made dependent on his accompanying the inquisitors on their visitations at that period the tribunals seem to have been allowed two nuncios but with the development of postal facilities the functions of the position gradually shrank the number was cut down to one and in the eighteenth century we find him converted into a nuncio de camara or interior attendant called indifferently nuncio and portero while a nuncio extraordinario makes the fires and attends to other servile work the portero in the secular courts was a kind of apparitor to serve summonses authorized to take bail up to the sum of a hundred reales and forbidden to keep a shop or tavern in the inquisition his function was to serve citations notices of autos de fe decrees and other similar work and he was prohibited from engaging in trade of any kind he was not allowed to enter the audience chamber but in the eighteenth century we find him converted into a portero de camara or usher and janitor in which capacity he had entrance to the audience chamber when in seventeen ninety six we find a doctor don jose fontana serving as portero in the valencia tribunal we may infer that the office was not servile and it is observable that the portero and his wife are qualified as don and doña a title withheld from the nuncio and his spouse their salaries however were the same one thousand four hundred twenty reales when about seventeen ten porteros laid claim in public functions to seats on the banco de titulados the bench of commissioned officials their pretensions were rejected the jailer was necessary to a tribunal which had its special prison 
At first, as we have seen, the Alguacil had charge of this, and his employees were not reckoned among the officials. The first allusion to a carcelero that I have met occurs in 1499, when Juan de Moya is spoken of as the carcerarius of the Barcelona Tribunal. He must have been an exceptional official and a person of some consideration, for he was provided with a prebend. In 1515, Ferdinand deemed it advisable to put the prisons under control of the tribunals, with which view he empowered the inquisitors to appoint carceleros with salaries of 500 sueldos. The jailer thus became a salaried official, entitled to all the privileges and immunities of this position, and gradually, toward the middle of the 16th century, the humble title of carcelero was exchanged for the more dignified one of alcaide de las carceles secretas. He was necessarily a person of confidence, responsible for the safe-keeping of prisoners and for their proper maintenance, functions which will be more conveniently treated when we come to consider the prison system. From the report of the Tribunal of Murcia in 1746, it appears that the salary then was 2,353 reales, in addition to which there was a jubilado alcaide with 330 reales. Possibly this habit of providing for supernumeraries explains why, in the table of officials, Toledo has four alcaides, and Lerena and Valencia have three each. In the early period, the carcelero sometimes served as torturer, but subsequently it became customary to employ the public executioner. The prison, sometimes crowded with inmates and exposed to insanitary conditions, rendered necessary an official physician, whose services were also indispensable in examinations before and after torture, and in the not infrequent cases of insanity, real or feigned. As his duties called him within the sacred limits of the secreto, he had to be a person of confidence, sworn like all the rest to secrecy. He was expected also to bestow gratuitous service on the officials, and the Suprema, in the eighteenth century, indulged itself in two, at the fairly liberal salary of 1,258 reales apiece, though they did not share in the extra emoluments so freely bestowed on other officials. At first the appointment of physicians was not universal although the salary was inconsiderable, attributable, no doubt, to the fact that the physician was at liberty to continue his private practice. Thus, in 1486, Ferdinand designated ten libras as the pay of the physician of the Saragossa Tribunal, while there was none provided for that of Medina del Campo. The surgeon was rated at even less, for in 1510, one is furnished to Saragossa at a salary of five libras, and the same is paid to an apothecary who can scarce have furnished expensive drugs on such a stipend. The surgeon at this period was also a barber, and in 1502 a grant, once for all, of fifteen libras was made to Juan de Aguaviva, quote, Cirujano y Barbero, unquote, of Calatayud, for fourteen years curing and barbering the poor prisoners without salary or other advantage. By 1618, apparently, the professions had become distinct, for there is an order to pay Narciso Balie, surgeon, and Miguel Juan, barber, to the tribunal of Valencia. A chaplain was also a necessity, not for the prisoners who were denied the sacraments, but for the daily mass celebrated before commencing the work of the audience chamber. In 1572, a stipend of 7,500 marabedis is assigned for this, but in the 18th century, the Suprema paid the handsome salary of 5,500 reales. Confessors were also required for the penitential prison, and were called in to the secret prison for the moribund. There were also two personas honestas, or discreet persons, friars as a rule, whose duty it was to be present when witnesses ratified their testimony. In the earlier period these services were gratuitous, but, in the later time, there was a small payment which, in the case of a friar, would inure to his convent. An alcaide of the Casa de Penitencia, or penitential prison, was also a necessity during the period of active work although subsequently it was virtually a sinecure and in many tribunals was suppressed. We occasionally also meet with the office of proveedor, or purveyor of the secret prison, who seems to be identical with the dispensero, or steward. In the sixteenth century this official had a salary of two thousand marabedis, besides two marabedis a day for each prisoner and five blancas for cooking and washing. He was required to have honest weights, and not to charge more for food than it cost him. He kept an account with each prisoner and was paid out of the sequestrations. Locksmiths, masons, and other mechanics employed on the buildings were also sometimes reckoned as officials, for their duties in repairing their prisons were confidential. All tribunals, moreover, had from one to three abogados de presos, or advocates of prisoners, 
whose duties will claim consideration hereafter they were classified as salaried officials though sometimes they received a small stipend and sometimes none and they were allowed to serve other clients if they had any end of book four chapter two part four book four chapter two part five of the history of the inquisition of spain volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of the inquisition of spain volume two by henry charles lea book four organization chapter two part five the tribunal besides these officials who were concerned in the primary business of the tribunal as a bulwark of the faith there were others whose functions may be briefly dismissed here the finances necessarily required a special organization consisting of a receiver of confiscations subsequently called the treasurer whose duties in the active period were of the utmost importance entitling him to a salary which sometimes was even larger than that of the inquisitors. The fines and penances also amounted to large sums for which, in the earlier period, there was usually a special receiver, for they were kept as a separate fund. But finally they likewise passed through the hands of the treasurer. The receiver had to pay his own assistants and agents, but in the enormous amount of complicated business thrown upon him he was aided by the abogado fiscal a salaried official of legal training while the notary of sequestrations had charge of sequestrated property until its confiscation was pronounced and further served as a check upon the receiver the intricate claims arising from these seizures were settled in a separate court of confiscations, known as the Juzgado, presided over by the Juez de Bienes, or Judge of Confiscations, and furnished with its notary and nuncio. We sometimes also meet with a Procurador del Fisco, and also with a Superintendent of Property. All this, which, especially at first, formed so large a part of the business of the inquisition will be more conveniently considered in detail hereafter we have seen how much of the activity of the tribunals was consumed in the civil and criminal business of their officials and it necessarily formed a separate department which had its notario de lo civil and secretario de las causas civiles the latter office being suppressed in 1643. The qualifications for holding office in the tribunal were simple. From some of the cases of hereditary transmission, it would appear that the minimum age was 19 or 20. Limpieza, or purity of blood, from admixture of Jewish or Moorish or heretic strain, was the chief essential as will be seen when we come to consider that important subject. Legitimacy was also a requisite in both the official and his wife, although dispensations could be had for its absence. By a carta acordada of June fifteenth, sixteen 1608, those who were unmarried could not marry without permission of the Suprema. They were obliged to furnish proof that the bride was limpia, and if a foreigner or the daughter or granddaughter of foreigners a dispensation was necessary of all of which the appointee was solemnly notified when he took the oath of office there was also a well-intended information de moribus concerning applicants for office when the inquisitor general proposed to make an appointment in a tribunal he notified it it then issued a commission to some one at the residence of the nominee, with an interrogatory, asking whether he was a person modest, quiet, peaceable, of correct life and habits, and what was known as to his limpieza, which, when returned, was forwarded to the Inquisitor General. As the witnesses examined were, however, presented by the applicant, 
the whole was scarce more than a formality. In spite of the constant complaint of the meagerness of the salaries, they seem to have been fairly adequate, at least during the first century and a half of the existence of the Inquisition. The rapid fall in the purchasing power of the precious metals necessitated frequent advances, and I have met with allusions to these in 1548, 1567, 1581, and 1606, after which they seem to have remained stationary until 1795, although the vellum coinage reduced still further the value of the currency. The salary of an inquisitor, which in 1541 was 100,000 maravedis, including Ayuda de Costa, by 1606 had become 300,000 or 800 ducats. This was not extravagant, but was fairly remunerative. In 1630, Arce y Reynoso, when occupying one of the highest professorships in Salamanca as Catedrático de Prima de Leyes, received only 300 ducats. It must be borne in mind that most of the lower officials had a comfortable additional source of revenue from the fees which they were entitled to charge for nearly all their work outside of cases of faith, and when the Arancel or Fee Bill of 1642 sought to regulate these charges, it was generally disregarded, and the inspectors winked at its violation, charitably alleging the increased cost of living as an excuse. The inquisitors and fiscal, on their side, usually held some canonry or other benefice which served to make good all deficiencies. In fact, towards the middle of the eighteenth century, when the salaries had become really inadequate, a writer ascribes the inefficiency of the Inquisition to the fact that the Inquisitors General were obliged to appoint ignorant men who happened to possess prebends or other benefices. There were also the gratifications for house rent, illuminations, bullfights, and mourning, which the officials of the tribunals enjoyed, like those of the Suprema, although not on so liberal a scale, while the ayudas de costa replaced the propinas. There was also a kindly liberality in granting extra ayudas de costa to those in need and to their widows and children when they die. Applications of this kind were perpetual and innumerable. They were made to the Suprema, which naturally found little difficulty in being charitable at the expense of others. It would be needless to enumerate examples of what was of such constant occurrence, and these liberalities, together with the exemptions and the economies in the cost of the necessaries of life, rendered the financial position of the officials reasonably secure. Perhaps the resources of the tribunals might have justified larger salaries, if they had not been drawn upon to supply the extravagance of the Suprema, and been squandered on other objects with careless profusion characteristic of the age. Thus, in 1633, a Dr. Pastor de Costa of the Royal Council of Catalonia obtained from Inquisitor General Zapata, on the plea of services rendered by his father, a grant of a hundred ducats a year, in silver, on the tribunal of Barcelona. Doubtless it was suspended during the Catalan revolt, to be subsequently resumed, and, in 1665, he applied to Arce Reynoso to confirm it to him for life, but Arce only ordered it to be continued for four years. Not content with this, he asked for an ayuda de costa on the ground of his poverty. It is not surprising that Philip V, as we have seen, in his attempted reform of 1705, forbade all grants of over thirty ducats without his confirmation. The ayuda de costa, of which we hear so much, was either a more or less definite increase of salary, or a special gift for cause, or else a simple merced, or benevolence. While the salary was a matter fixed and due, the ayuda was always to a certain extent arbitrary, and was used as an incentive to compel the performance of duties regarded as onerous. 
we see the germ of it in Torquemada's instructions of 1485, prohibiting fees and bribes, for the king provides a reasonable support for all, and in time will give them Mercedes. An advance is marked in the instructions of 1498, where, after specifying salaries, it is added that the inquisitors general, when they see that there is much labor or necessity, can grant such ayudas de costa as they deem proper. Accordingly, about this time, while we find no regular ayudas given, there are constant examples of special ones, sometimes of large amounts, granted for the most varied reasons, of which two or three instances will suffice. Thus Ferdinand, on April 30th, 1499, in ordering the payment of the salaries in Seville, includes 40,000 maravedis of ayudas de costa for one of the inquisitors, but none for anyone else. On August the 10th, 1502, Juan Ruiz, receiver of Saragossa, is given an ayuda de costa of 10,000 sueldos to meet expenses incurred in illness, and on September 27th, an official of Seville is gratified with 20,000 maravedis to help him in his marriage. It cannot have been long after this that the ayuda de costa was becoming a regular annual payment as an increment of the salary. On December the 3rd, 1509, an order for the payment of arrears to Diego de Robles, fiscal of the Suprema, speaks of their being due to him his ayuda de costa for 1506 and half of 1507 at the rate of 20,000 maravedis per annum. The first formal statement of it as a settled thing that I have met occurs in this same year, 1509, in the list of salaries made out for the attempted inquisition of Naples, where the ayuda de costa is designated for each official. It varies from a little over half the salary to considerably below that proportion, and for two of the officials there is none. Yet it was not a universal custom, for in the salaries assigned to the Sardinia Tribunal on September 10, 1514, there is no allusion to Ayuda de Costa. That the custom, however, was gradually establishing itself as a substantial addition to the regular salaries is deducible from formal lists of the Ayudas de Costa of the Suprema in the Valladolid Tribunal in 1515, and by this time it may be regarded as fairly established although innumerable special grants continued, such as one of 75,000 maravedis on June the 30th, 1515, to Alonso de Montoya, notary of the Seville Tribunal, to assist in his marriage. Confiscations at the time were fruitful, and the laborers were not deprived of their share in the harvest, if only to stimulate their industry. Reimbursements of traveling and other expenses also frequently took the form of ayudas de costa, although, as the grants were made in round sums, it is evident that no accounts were rendered and that the payments were arbitrary. However customary the annual payments had become, they still were regarded as a special grace to which the recipients had no claim of right. In 1540, the officials of Barcelona complained to Inquisitor General Tabera that the receiver refused payment on the ground that the grant had expired with the death of Manrique in 1538, and that it required confirmation, which Tabera hastened to give on February 12, 1540. In fact, a number of orders issued by Tabera in 1540 would indicate that this was the accepted view of the matter. Another marked distinction at this time is that the ayudas de costa are ordered to be paid out of the fines and penances inflicted for the gastos extraordinarios of the tribunals, while the salaries come from the funds arising out of the confiscations. For a while, there was a regular scale of fifty ducats for the inquisitors, thirty for the fiscal, alguazil, notaries, and receiver, fifteens for the nuncio and ten for the portero and alcaide, but, in 1559, 
This was increased by 20%. Care was taken to make it understood that it was a grace and not a right, and the ordinary formula was that it was given in view of the labor in determining the cases of the auto de fe of the previous year, and when, in 1561, Calahora was exceptionally active and celebrated a second auto, it was rewarded with a supplementary ayuda of half the customary amount. The grant was dependent on the receipt of detailed reports of all the cases in the previous auto, which were frequently accompanied with a humble petition for it, setting forth the insufficiency of the salaries and the cost of living, and begging the Suprema to obtain the grace from the king, who was technically the giver. Subsequently, as we have seen, it was made conditional on rendering monthly reports, and on the discharge of the duty of visiting the district, and other matters apt to be neglected, such as rendering prompt statements of accounts and of properties. Finally, in the later period, when the tribunals were under close supervision of the Suprema, it sometimes took the form of a Christmas gift. Perhaps the most remarkable of all Ayudas de Costa was one granted by Carlos the Fourth in October 1807, in the midst of his troubles with his son Fernando, when the shadow of Napoleon was already darkening Spain and the treasury was empty. It was possibly with the object of securing the fidelity of the Inquisition that he ordered an ayuda de costa of a hundred ducats to be given to every official of all the tribunals who did not enjoy an income of seven thousand reales outside of his salary. In the existing condition of Spanish finances, the money could probably have been better employed. The perfected system of records Kept, but kept by the tribunals, so greatly increased the effectiveness of the Inquisition, and rendered it such an object of dread, that some reference to it is indispensable. Its development was slow. At the start, amid the enormous labors of the slenderly manned tribunals, there could be little thought bestowed on the preservation and arrangement of the records of their operations. In the instructions of 1484, the only allusion to them merely prescribes that the notaries shall enter on their registers all orders issued by the inquisitors to the officials. As the registers accumulated, the instructions of 1488 require all writings and papers to be kept in chests in the public place where the inquisitors transact business, so that they may be at hand when wanted. They are never to be removed, and the keys are to pass through the hands of the inquisitors to the notaries, all this being under pain of deprivation of office. Ten years later, we hear of a chamber assigned to their safekeeping, with three keys, held by the fiscal and the two notaries, so that all must be present when they are consulted. By this time, indexes to facilitate references to the rapidly growing mass of papers had become necessary, and an article in Desa's instructions in 1500 shows that this had become recognized. The disabilities inflicted on descendants of culprits rendered it essential that genealogies should be traceable, but the incredible crudeness of these early lists shows how informal was the rapid work of that awful time. One kept at Toledo, about 1500, contained such entries of the individuals dispatched as un porquero del alguacil que tiene un ojo remerado, un converso retajado, un converso judío, un sastre, un patero sobrino de Lope de Cuellar Patero. In Valencia, from 1517 to 1527, the index to the fifth volume of persons denounced shows equal indifference to the identification of individuals catalogued as Le Bojes, Mare y Fies. La condesa que lleve el hábito penitencial. El bajiller que está en compañía del calonje projita. Uno que ha sido fraile. Un remendón sastre. Esta delante la reja de Mosén Penaruja, etc., 
after some contradictory decisions as to furnishing papers or information from the records to competent courts applying for it the suprema in 1556 forbade the tribunals without its express order from giving any information tending to prove that any one had not been condemned or reconciled or penanced or arrested by the holy office a most cruel regulation in view of the tremendous consequences to the posterity of those who had fallen under suspicion of heresy and had been tried or even arrested an order by the suprema in 1576 to the valencia tribunal to erase from its records the name of maestro Giuseppe esteban because he had not been arrested for a matter of faith is suggestive of the fearful power which the inquisition possessed of inflicting infamy on whole families and of the importance of the accuracy of its registers the abuse of its power in this respect is indicated as we have seen above by the instructions which sometimes followed visitations to remove from the records the names of those who had been improperly prosecuted for offences not of faith it was not easy to preserve the completeness of the records officials were apt to regard them as personal property and to keep them like the notary of calafayud who thus secured for his son the reversion of his office in fifteen twelve ferdinand desired from a tribunal complete statements concerning the finances there arose delay during which the notary of sequestrations died whereupon he ordered that the receiver should have all the papers or copies of them and if the heirs of the notary refused to surrender them execution should be levied on his estate for the whole of his salary received during his incumbency it was not only the notaries however but other officials who took and kept documents in fifteen seventeen cardinal adrian complained of this and ordered that papers should never be removed from their depository except to the audience chamber for the purpose of conducting a trial this was disregarded and about the middle of the century the instructions to inspectors required them to order inquisitors under pain of excommunication to return all papers that they had taken and to discontinue the practice even inquisitors general were guilty of this for philip the second issued an order on march the sixth fifteen seventy three on the executors of ponce de leon to allow his papers to be examined and everything pertaining to the inquisition to be removed an order which can only be regarded as revealing a general custom for ponce de leon died on january the seventeenth fifteen seventy three before entering upon his office the looseness which had prevailed during the early period is strikingly manifested when in fifteen forty seven the suprema made an attempt to gather in and preserve its past records a commission was issued to its secretary zurita reciting the importance of having an inventory of all the papal bulls briefs registers and other papers relating to the inquisition which had been in the custody of the secretaries and other officials there is it says information that many of these are at calatayud and others at huesca among the papers of calcena and urias the secretaries of ferdinand and charles v and zurita is ordered to collect these and is armed with full powers to examine witnesses and inflict penalties all holding such papers are required to surrender them under pain of excommunication and a hundred ducats the inquisitors of saragossa are instructed to assist him with censures while letters to various parties indicate that the task is expected to be arduous the instructions are not clear as to whether he is expected to seize the papers or merely to make inventories of them but there can be little doubt that whatever he laid his hands on was kept what success attended his mission we have no means of knowing but we probably owe to it many of the important documents illustrating the early history of the inquisition in addition to this source of incompleteness it seemed impossible to compel the tribunals to keep their records in proper shape 
In 1544, Dr. Alonso Perez, in an inspection of Barcelona, found them in complete disorder. Another inspection in 1550 showed still greater confusion. In 1561, Inspector Cervantes described them as being in such a state, without indexes and inventories, that it was impossible to find anything. After the visit of Salazar, the Suprema, in 1568, took the inquisitors sharply to task for not having yet provided indexes and registers. It ordered them to do so at once, and to furnish a certificate to that effect within twenty days of receipt. The certificate was doubtless supplied, but we may question whether the work was done. Possibly Barcelona was worse than other tribunals, but the memorial of 1623 to the Suprema states that in many of them there are processes, books, papers, informations of limpieza, etc., requiring to be inventoried, sorted into bundles, and reduced to order, causing great inconvenience. Meanwhile, the masses of papers had been accumulating more rapidly than ever. In 1570, the Suprema had ordered nine books to be kept, one of the commissions of officials, their oaths and royal provisions, one of commissioners and familiars with full details, one of the votes in the consultas de fe, one of letters from the Suprema, and another of letters to it, one recording the inspections made of the prisons, one of the orders issued on the receiver, one of the pecuniary penances inflicted, and one of the autos de fe, with statements as to the culprits and their punishments. Besides these, the alcaide of the prison was to keep lists of those relaxed and penanced with three indexes. All this was exclusive of the voluminous records of the trials, which it was the duty of the fiscal to keep in order. Then, in order to accommodate the increasing bulk, it was ordered, in 1566 and 1572, that there should be four apartments in the Cámara del Secreto, one for pending cases, one for suspended ones, one for those finished, divided into the relaxed, the reconciled, and the penanced, and the fourth for papers concerning commissioners and familiars and informaciones de limpieza. In 1635, alphabetical lists of all persons tried were ordered to be kept, with dates and references to the papers of the case, commencing with 1620. The order had to be repeated in 1636 and 1638, with further instructions in 1644, and these lists furnished additional means for tracing the antecedents and kindred of those who were brought before the tribunals. But more potent than the mandates of the Suprema to keep the archives in order and thoroughly indexed was the mania which arose for limpieza, or purity of blood, which, as we shall see hereafter, pervaded all classes and furnished a source of very profitable business to the officials, for the Inquisition was the ultimate arbiter and its records contained the evidence. Gradually, these records became an immense storehouse of minute and detailed information concerning all heretics and suspects and their kindred. Under the instructions of 1561, the first thing in examining a prisoner was to require of him an account of parents and grandparents, brothers and sisters, uncles, aunts and cousins, with their wives and children, and whether any of them had been arrested or penanced by the Inquisition. Then, when the accused was brought to profess conversion and to beg mercy, his confession was not accepted unless he gave information to the best of his ability as to all other heretics, whether kindred or strangers, whom he had known or heard of, with details as to their culpability. All this was carefully entered and indexed, until the records became a fairly complete directory of the suspects of Spain. A Jew, arrested in Granada, might compromise twenty others, scattered from Compostella to Barcelona, each of whom, when seized, became a new source of information, and the intercommunication established between the tribunals placed the records of all at the service of each. 
this vastly increased the effectiveness of the inquisition and rendered the chances of escape slender indeed the trials of the seventeenth century when the system became fairly perfected show that although the arrest of a few might scatter their accomplices the inquisition was ever on their track and change of name and habitation was unavailing as soon as a suspect was arrested and his genealogy was obtained the sister tribunals were called upon for reports and testimony poured in reaching back perhaps for twenty or thirty years concerning himself and his kindred the net of the inquisition covered the land and its meshes were fine go where they would hide themselves as they might the judaizers lived in the knowledge that it was ever remorselessly in pursuit and that its hand might fall upon them at any time in the eighteenth century the system was elaborated by what were known as the libros vocandorum when any one was denounced to a tribunal or came forward spontaneously his name description and offence were transmitted to all the other tribunals which entered them in alphabetical registers arranged under the first baptismal names these entries give the name the date a brief description of the person and the nature of the charge with a blank to be filled in with the result of the trial which was also reported to all thus each tribunal possessed a digested record of the current business of the whole inquisition clearly arranged for ready reference and as the years passed it afforded at a glance the means of ascertaining whether any culprit had been in the hands of the holy office before and of facilitating researches into limpieza the importance of the libros vocandorum was so fully recognized that the suprema required the monthly reports of the fiscal always to specify that they were kept posted up to date these registers were not arranged uniformly in all the tribunals but the usual plan was that adopted in valencia where there was one general index in two volumes and a third for confessors accused of soliciting women ad turpia in the confessional thus all the tribunals cooperated and with their machinery of commissioners and familiars in almost every town and village they formed one harmonious organization for the detection and punishment of culprits human ingenuity could scarce devise a more perfect system of promptly suppressing all deviations from the standards established by the inquisition end of book four chapter two part five book four chapter three part one of the history of the inquisition of spain volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by salim Siddiqui. the history of the inquisition of spain volume two by henry charles lee book four organization Chapter 3, Part 1 Unsalaried Officials We have seen, when treating of privileges and exemptions, the distinction drawn between salaried and unsalaried officials. The former, except in the case of physicians and advocates of the accused, were understood to devote all their time to the service of the tribunal. The latter were only a called upon incidentally for special work. It is true that the Inquisition was empowered to summon every one for aid, but its service was confidential and its ministers, at least in the latter period, had to be of unblemished lineage, so that it was requisite to have at hand those on whom it could rely and whom it could summon at any moment. There was no difficulty in finding men ready to serve without pay. The honor of connection with the Inquisition, the privilege of its furo in greater or lesser degree, and the assurance of limpieza which it carried with it rendered applicants for appointment more numerous than positions to be filled these unsalaried officials consisted of calificadores consultores commissioners with their notaries 
and familiars. The function of the calificador or censor were important. When the sumeria or preliminary array of evidence against the accused was collected, the theological points involved were submitted to three or four calificadores who pronounced whether the acts or words testified to amounted to heresy or suspicion of heresy. If there was doubt or disagreement, another group was called in, to whom the opinions of the first were given, along with the evidence. If the conclusion was that the matter did not concern the Inquisition, the case was dropped or suspended. If it held that there was heresy, expressed or implied, arrest and trial followed. We have seen the working of the system in the cases of Carranza and Villanueva, in both of which it played so momentous a part. In addition to this was the censorship of books. Any work against which suspicion was aroused was submitted to them, and, according to their decision, it was approved, expurgated, or suppressed. To perform these duties properly required learned theologians and they seem to have enjoyed the opportunity of displaying their erudition and prolix and elaborate opinions, developing vast ingenuity and discovering traces of the beliefs of the Marcionites and the Carpocratians and other forgotten heresies and the careless propositions submitted to their criticism. As a matter of course, only ecclesiastics were eligible, and in 1627 the minimum age was fixed at forty-five. The duties of this profitless office were not light. If we may believe the experienced Fray Maestro Alvarado, in 1811 he complains that if a book is sent to a calificador, no matter what his other engagements may be, he must devote a month or two to reading it and forming a judgment, expressed in an elaborate opinion such as would command for a lawyer two or three thousand reals or some modern philosopher utters scandals and the calificador must investigate his words and acts and point out the errors as a guide for the inquisitor. If a trial follows, the calificador must wait on the tribunal and rack his brains to decide whether the culprit's explanations are valid. If he is contumacious, conferences must be held with him until he is converted or found incapable of conversion, and all this without recompense. The calificador was thus an important and laborious assistant in the current work of the tribunal, and it is somewhat remarkable that although reckoned among the officials, with a recognized place in public functions, there should be doubt whether he was entitled to the furo. Yet in 1662, when Dr. Vincente Cortes, a cathedral canon and calificador of the Valencia tribunal, was involved in a suit, it declined to defend him. It's reported to the Suprema that it was ignorant whether calificadores were entitled to the furo, and the council replied, asking on what ground the privilege was claimed. The need of calificadores was not likely to be felt in the early period, when almost the whole business of the Inquisition was with Judaizers and Moriscos, whose guilt was assumed from their adherence to well-known customs and rites. The first allusion I have met occurs in 1520, when the inquisitors were ordered to make no appointment without submitting to the Suprema the petition of the applicant. There is no reference to them in the Instrucciones Antiguas, but in the Nuevas of 1561, their employment is fully developed. As the appointment was in the hands of the inquisitors, there was a tendency to undo multiplication, and in 1606, there was an effort to check this by calling for reports as to the number existing, and how many were necessary, pending which no applicants were to be admitted. This resulted the following year in an order limiting the number to eight in each tribunal. Only the most eminent theologians were to be selected and appointments were to be made only to fill vacancies. Again in 1619, reports were called for an emphasis was laid on the importance of the position and the necessity of discrimination in the choice. This received scant attention, and the memorial of 1623 to the Suprema recommends the reduction of the number to three or four in each tribunal and the exercise of great care in appointments, for lack of which they had fallen so greatly in public estimation. Nothing was done, and in 1630 the fiscal of the Suprema called attention to the fact that but few tribunals 
had made the reports demanded in 1619. Meanwhile, the necessity for reform had increased and he asked that information be called for again so that, with full information, the Suprema might remedy the evils existing. The futility of the effort to limit the tribunals in the exercise of their patronage is visible in the statistics of 1746, where Valencia has 40 calificadores, Saragossa has 29, and even the little tribunal of Mallorca has 24. If Lerena has none and Logrono only two, this is explicable, as we learn from another source, by the absence in those places of men competent for the position. Yet not much attention was paid to the selection of suitable material if we may believe an official report presented to Carlos IV in 1798, which says that it is notorious that calificadores are mostly people of little learning, full of preconceptions and errors, who have had money enough to take out proofs of limpieza. In the medieval inquisition, all sentences were agreed upon in an assembly of experts summoned for the purpose by the inquisitors, prior to holding the auto de fe in which the sentences were executed. This custom was naturally followed in Spain, and these consultas de fe, as they were called, will be considered hereafter when treating of the conduct of trials. At present we have merely to consider the consultores who assisted the inquisitors in passing judgment. At first, they had no permanent connection to the Inquisition. The Inquisitors had an unlimited power of summoning all persons in whatever capacity, but sometimes it was not easy to obtain the services of competent men, especially when migratory tribunals were sitting in places where jurists were few, and the instructions of 1488 in response to complaints on this score tell Inquisitors in such cases to send the papers to the Suprema which will decide on them. At this time the inquisitors were theologians, and to supplement their lack of legal knowledge, it was customary to call in lawyers. The incongruity of laymen sitting in judgment on matters of faith was waived, and they were freely employed, the inquisitors summoning such doctors and maestros and licenciados and bachelares as they saw fit, who served without pay and might never be called in again. In 1502, the Barcelona Tribunal complained that it sometimes had difficulty in securing the services of the lawyers of the Audencia, whereupon Ferdinand wrote to his lieutenant general that, as it is a work of God and the service is required only two or three times a year, he must see that the inquisitors get them whenever they are wanted. In 1515, the same trouble showed itself at Villadolid, where the inquisitors were in the habit of calling in the judges of the high court who endeavored to evade the duty by alleging certain royal chedulas prohibiting their engaging in other functions than those of their office. Ferdinand was appealed to and promptly ordered them to serve when called upon, but they were not to be obliged to absent themselves from court during the hours of its sessions. Apparently there was no eagerness to perform gratuitous service which brought with it no privileges. When in time jurists were preferred in the tribunals, the inquisitors called in theologians, mostly from the regular orders, who to a great degree monopolized the learning of the church. Even with these there were sometimes difficulty, and in 1544 the Suprema asked the Dominican vicar to rebuke the prior of San Pedro Martir for forbidding his fries to serve. It had already been found that the chance selection made when a consulta de fe was to be held, was unsatisfactory. The permanent office of consultor was created, and was rendered attractive by attaching to it the privileges and immunities of the holy office. Formal commissions were issued by the inquisitor general, and the appointee swore to the faithful discharge of his duties. The earliest commission that I have met is one issued April 2nd, 1544, to Dr. Miguel de Nuedes, Archdeacon of Morvedro, as consultor in the Tribunal of Valencia. This continued for some twenty years when confusion and contradictions arose. January 16, 1565, the Suprema writes that neither it nor the Inquisitor General is accustomed to notify any one of his appointment as consultor. The Inquisitors can appoint properly qualified persons whenever they are needed. 
In 1566, this was followed by admonitions as to the care necessary in examining into the fitness of aspirants, and then, in 1567, inquisitors were scolded for making appointments without reporting them and awaiting orders. This was repeated in 1571, but in 1572, Rojas asserts positively that consultors are not selected by inquisitors, but are appointed by the Suprema. The Suprema continued to retain control, but ceased to issue regular commissions, for in 1645, a writer informs us that the consultor and calificador are received and sworn in on the strength of a letter from the Suprema. Finally, however, the matter was restored in the inquisitors. A formulary of about 1700 contains the form of a commission issued to the consultors. It is drawn in the name of the inquisitors who confer on the recipient the powers necessary for the discharge of his duties and order all secular officials to yield him all the honors, graces, franchises, exemptions, liberties, and prerogatives inherent in his office. He was obliged to furnish proofs of his purity of blood and, if he was married, of that of his wife, thus giving another example of the capacity of laymen to act in judgments of faith. With the progressive centralization of business in the Suprema, the consulta de fe gradually diminished in importance. As we shall see in the 18th century, it became virtually obsolete. The table of officials in 1746 shows that at that time there were only 18 consultores in all the tribunals, and of these, eight were in the little inquisition of Majorca. The office of commissioner was peculiar to the Spanish Inquisition, and although its powers were strictly limited, it was an important factor in keeping the authority of the Holy Office constantly before the people, and in detecting offenders in obscure places where they might otherwise have enjoyed security. It was not part of the original organization, and there is no reference to it in the instructions. It is true that in 1509, Ferdinand addresses a certain Beltran de la Sala of Perpignan as commissioner of the Inquisition, but he is also host de Sorios, or in charge of couriers on the important line between Spain and Italy. He was therefore not a commissioner in the latter sense, but probably was employed to look after the sequestrations which had been extensive in Perpignan. As the tribunals became sedentary in their extensive districts, the need of representatives scattered everywhere made itself felt, and the first suggestion seems to have come from Valencia. The Suprema represented December 4, 1537, to Cardinal Manrique, the size of the district of Valencia, where the difficulties of intercommunication were such that it never had been and never could be properly visited. It was therefore proposed that in the cathedral towns, commissioners should be appointed with power to publish the edicts and to take testimony and ratifications with notaries. The cathedral clergy would probably furnish proper appointees serving without pay as the duties would be only occasional. This corresponds so nearly with the plan adopted that it may safely be assumed to be its origin. Authority was given to inquisitors to appoint commissioners, but apparently at first the limitation on their powers was ill-defined. The visitation of Barcelona in 1549 showed that they undertook to arrest and prosecute, in fact to make themselves inquisitors in their little districts, and in 1550 the Suprema instructed the tribunal to grant faculties only to receive denunciations, collect evidence, and send it to the Inquisition for its action. This remained the rule until the end. In the cartillas, or detailed printed instructions, they were forbidden to make arrests unless three conditions coexisted, that the case clearly pertained to the holy office, that the evidence was ample, and that there was apprehension of flight. Even then they were warned to act only on mature deliberation, and they were forbidden to sequestrate property, though they were to keep an eye on it. If an arrest took place, the prisoner and the evidence were to be transmitted to the tribunal under guard of familiars without being allowed to communicate with anyone. In addition, the commissioner could hear the civil cases of familiars up to the value of twenty libras and execute his decisions. 
all this was concisely expressed in the commission issued to him as in everything else it was impossible to enforce compliance with wholesome regulations cervantes in the report of his barcelona visitation of fifteen sixty one says that commissioners paid no attention to the limitations of their powers they were thoroughly untrained and ignorant of their duties and had no hesitation in appointing other commissioners as they had authority to appoint a notary and an alguazil they set up little courts throughout the land armed with the awful authority of the holy office and it requires no stretch of the imagination to conceive the tyranny and extortation with which they afflicted the people not much was gained when in fifteen sixty one the suprema ordered that they should be appointed only in places where it was necessary that they must be quiet and peaceable persons or in fifteen sixty five when it prescribed great care in issuing commissions which must be so limited as to prevent them from appointing deputies salazar's report of his inspection of barcelona in fifteen sixty six shows that the evil continued unchecked commissioners were appointed in unnecessary numbers often by a single inquisitor during a visitation and sometimes they were ignorant laymen although the office inferred that it should be reserved exclusively to those in holy orders it is not strange that this new infliction which seemed to bring the terrors of the inquisition to every man's door should form the subject of vigorous remonstrances and the concordias of fifteen sixty eight by their enumeration of what was forbidden show the abuses under which the populations were suffering that of valencia provided that there should be such officials only in tortosa sogorbe teruel gandia castellon de la plana denia and Yativa, with two in the city of valencia and that they should be called deputized commissioners and not as heretofore lieutenant inquisitors that of aragon limited them to lerida huesca terezona daroca calatuyud Iaco, barbastro and towns on the french frontier both provided that in future they should not try cases or make arrest save to prevent flight nor should they grant licenses for the importation or exportation of provisions and other matters they might have an assessor and a notary enjoying all privileges and exemptions and if an alguazil was needed they could assign that post to a familiar without enlarging his exemptions all this is eloquent of the methods by which these would-be local inquisitors had magnified their office to the vexation of the people catalonia rejected the concordia of 1568 and in the cortes of 1599 it demanded that neither rectors of churches nor fries should be appointed as commissioners to this the suprema in its memorial to clement the eighth replied that the object was to prevent the inquisition from having proper commissioners as catalonia was too poor in the requisite material to exclude these classes and places where there were no cathedrals or collegiate churches in fifteen seventy two the suprema made an effort to check the multiplication of these officials by decreeing that they should be appointed only in the chief towns of archpriestly districts but it promptly receded from this and the next year authorized them wherever it seemed necessary which amounted to unlimited permission an order in fifteen seventy six that they were not to be defended in prosecutions for concubinage is suggestive as to the prevailing morality and in fifteen eighty four they were instructed to keep in constant correspondence with the tribunals reporting everything that occurred in their district which indicates how comprehensive a system of espionage was established the suprema in a carta acordada of march twenty fourth sixteen o four made a serious attempt to check existing evils it called attention to the abuses in appointing commissioners notaries and familiars whose multitude and general unworthiness resulted in greatly impairing the authority of the inquisition in future commissioners were to be appointed only in the chief towns of the partidos or local judicial districts or at least four leagues apart inquisitors should bear in mind that their duties embrace cases of the utmost importance 
requiring men of intelligence, virtue, and silence, they should have benefices or revenues sufficient to live with the dignity befitting their high office. The prescription as to number and location received scant obedience. We chanced to meet with them in obscure places like Cobena and Fuentalzas, and a list of them in little province of Guipuzacao, which has but four partidos amount to seventeen. An experienced writer in 1648, after reciting the limitations, states that there are places where there are three or four disguised by appointments nominally to neighboring hamlets. Although without salary, the office had become attractive, not only on account of the importance and immunities which it conferred, but also because a large part of the attendant labor brought in sac satisfactory fees. In the eagerness to prove limpieza, investigations into genealogies were perpetual. Nearly all these passed through the Inquisition and were confided to the commissioner nearest to the birthplace of the applicant. He was expected to pay roundly, and the commissioner was entitled to sixteen reals a day for his time, or to two ducats if he had to leave his residence. Moreover, the knowledge thus acquired of the genealogies of his neighbors gave him power to render them uncomfortable, as we may gather from a carta acordada of 1622 forbidding commissioners to make notes of the ancestry of those who were not officials of the Inquisition, and threatening dismissal for stigmatizing anyone as a Jew, Moor, Converso, or descendant of such. At seaports and frontier towns, also, the commissioners had a considerable source of revenue from fees for the examinations requisite to prevent the entrance of heretics and heretic books, fees which, as we shall see hereafter, were the abundant source of complaint. These positions the inquisitor-general reserved for his own appointment and finally all those in the cathedral towns and larger cities. In the effort at reform made by Philip V, investigation was made into the character of the commissioners, their notaries, and the familiars, and soon after this, in 1706, the Suprema asserted that in Castile there was not one-fourth of the number permitted by the Concordia of 1553, which attributed partly to the war of secession then raging and partly to the molestation to which they were exposed. Unquestionably, the number declined rapidly during the 18th century, as will be seen by the table in the appendix where, although Saragossa still has 38 and Barcelona 28, the other tribunals report only from 2 to 7, except the Canaries, where the scattered group of islands necessarily demanded a considerable number. This diminution may be explained by the growing habit of appointing temporary commissioners in any place where work was to be done. Moreover, the increasing facilities of communication favored local centralization in the tribunal, even as general centralization was stimulated in the Suprema. Denunciations were readily sent by mail, and temporary commissions were issued for their investigation. So, too, in the matter of limpieza, the tribunal could dispense its patronage more profitably by sending out from headquarters special commissioners who earned a larger per diem at the expense of the applicant. To accommodate this new development, when in 1816 a new cartilla of instructions for commissioners was printed, it provided at the end with a number of blank commissions, which could be detached and filled in for use. A hundred copies were supplied to each tribunal, twenty of them bound to be used as a whole, and eighty in sheets to be thus cut up. Within a month, one tribunal applied for a further stock, and fifty copies were sent. Little as the inquisitors of the time had to do, they were evidently devolving their duties upon others more generally than ever. In a previous chapter, it has been seen that of all the officials of the Inquisition, those who occasioned the most frequent trouble and who aroused the most strenuous animadversion were the familiars. They were the most numerous, they were largely drawn from the turbulent element, seeking the position for the protection afforded against secular justice, and they abused their privileges accordingly. For more than two centuries they were an object of dread to all peaceable folk, and no stronger evidence can be furnished of the subjection to which the Inquisition had reduced Spain than the tolerance of this dangerous class 
whose services were overpaid by the immunities which relieved the Inquisition from paying salaries. In the medieval Inquisition, the Inquisitor had the right to surround himself with armed guards, whether to protect his person or to execute his orders. They were reckoned as members of his family, thence obtaining the name of familiars, entitling them to immunity from justice. They were dreaded and hated, not without reason, for the position was attractive only to the ruffian and brawler, nor was anything gained when in 1213 the Council of Vienne warned inquisitors to be moderate and discreet in their use of the privilege. Of course, the old Aragonese Inquisition enjoyed this prerogative, and when the new Inquisition was organized, it inherited the right. This, moreover, was developed in an entirely novel manner, for the familiar was not attached to the person of the Inquisitor. Appointments were made all over the land, the Inquisition thus obtaining, without cost, a small army of servitors, scattered everywhere, sworn to obedience and ready at any moment to perform whatever duty they might be called upon to render. They served, moreover, as spies upon their neighbors, and were eager to manifest their zeal by volunteer action, for it was commonplace of the canon law that the heretic could be arrested by any one. It was impossible that such a class as this, released from the restraints of law, should not prove troublesome and even dangerous. Inquisitors appointed them at discretion, furnished them with licenses to bear arms, and turned them loose on the community. It would have been some slight protection if registers of these appointments had been kept, and the names of the appointees furnished to the magistrates so that it could be known whether those who claimed immunity were entitled to it. It was impossible, however, to induce the inquisitors to do this. Zemenes and the Suprema ordered the names to be entered in a book and copy to be furnished to the corregidors, and Ferdinand, in a general order of July 11, 1513, emphasized this, but to no purpose, and it was repeated endlessly with the same result. The inquisitors steadily refused obedience, for it would have imposed some check upon multitudinous and indiscriminate appointments which had a recognized money value. The result of all this appears in a letter of Ferdinand in 1514 to the inquisitors of Toledo, informing them that the royal and municipal authorities complained of the number of turbulent fellows, carrying licenses, signed by only one inquisitor, who went around in bands disturbing the peace, and if the civil magistrate endeavored to restrain them, the tribunal at once interposed, leading to dissensions between it and the ministers of justice to the great injury of the city and its vicinity. Zeminis had already endeavored to check these orders without success, and Ferdinand now insists that his orders must be obeyed, that all such licenses must be signed by the three inquisitors, a record of them must be kept, and a copy be furnished to the corregidor. End of Book 4, Chapter 3, Part 1 Recording by Salim Siddiqui, www.hotconflict.com Book 4, Chapter 3, Part 2 of The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2, by Henry Charles Lee, Book 4, Organization, Chapter 3, Part 2, Unsalaried Officials. The same troubles existed in the Aragonese kingdoms where, it will be remembered, the Cortes of Monzon in 1512, endeavored to remedy them in the Concordia by providing that for Aragon there might be twenty armed familiars in Saragossa, while in other towns, where the tribunal was in actual session, there might be temporary appointments not exceeding twenty for the whole kingdom. Notwithstanding the acceptance of this agreement by Ferdinand, its confirmation in 1516 by Leo X, and its solemn ratification in 1520, it never received the slightest respect from the Inquisition, 
and its only interest lies in its proof of the popular anxiety for relief and that a very moderate number of familiars sufficed at a period of great activity in the work of the holy office the complaint was renewed about fifteen thirty by the cortes of aragon that familiars were appointed in every place in the three kingdoms and that no lists were furnished so that the inquisition could set free any offender by declaring him to be a familiar to which cardinal manrique merely replied that no more were appointed than were necessary and that the instructions were observed again in fifteen forty seven the cortes of catalonia declared that the abuse had been carried to a point that seriously limited the royal and ecclesiastical jurisdictions and it requested that barcelona should be restricted to fifty with five each for the catalan districts subjected to valencia and zaragoza and also that lists be furnished but prince philip only answered that he would consult the suprema and do what was fitting of course nothing was done while thus the suprema defended the tribunals against the public it was constantly scolding them for their excesses and issuing orders to diminish the evil a carta acordada of fifteen forty three alludes to the excessive numbers of familiars their turbulence and evil lives they must be persons of good repute and the rest must be dismissed in fifteen forty six moderation in appointments was enjoined when the castile concordia of fifteen fifty three was framed instructions were issued for its strict observance all not registered and reported to the authorities were not to be held as familiars in fifteen sixty and again in fifteen seventy three they were ordered to be married men quiet peaceable limpios and not ecclesiastics all others were to be removed in fifteen sixty two the inquisitor of majorca was rebuked for unnecessary appointments of turbulent and unfit men and for not giving a list to the magistrates in fifteen sixty six lists were ordered to be given to the civil authorities and none not born on them were to enjoy exemption in fifteen seventy three instructions were issued requiring them to be householders and heads of families residents of the place for which the commission was given and none to be appointed for uninhabited places in fifteen seventy eight it was ordered that appointments should only be made to fill vacancies in fifteen eighty six a carta acordada commanded the number to be reduced to the provisions of the concordia the surplus must surrender their commissions and support themselves honestly new appointments were restricted to quiet and peaceful men of good life and habits and evidence of compliance with the order must be furnished this brief summary could be largely extended but its only interest lies in its showing that the suprema recognized the evil and sought to abate it while the tribunals paid no attention to its commands secure in the assurance that it would defend them through thick and thin whenever a question arose between them and the people or the authorities sometimes indeed continued pressure might induce temporary compliance but it was abandoned as soon as it appeared safe to do so a single instance will illustrate the tenacity and successful evasions of the inquisitors valdez wrote to the valencia tribunal march twelfth fifteen fifty one that the excessive number of familiars interfered with its proper functions in consequence of the time required for their cases they were to be reduced to a hundred in the city of valencia in towns of three thousand inhabitants the maximum was to be eight in smaller places if any were needed the number was not to exceed four without notifying the suprema to effect this all commissions were to be revoked and if necessary he revoked them instructions were given as to reappointments every commission was to be signed by both inquisitors and countersigned by one of the notaries the commissions were to be limited to two or three years so as to stimulate good behavior and lists were to be furnished to the suprema to this promising scheme of reform the inquisitors replied that they suspended its operation because the governors of valencia thought the number assigned to the city inadequate july ninth the suprema ordered them to learn from the governors their views as to numbers this was left unanswered and on november fifth the suprema ordered a report within thirty days of what had been agreed upon with the governors otherwise the provisions of march twelfth were to be put into execution and if this was not done a person armed with full powers would be sent to do it 
this looked like business and brought from inquisitor artiaga the reply that as soon as his colleague returned from visiting the district it would be complied with valdez waited till december twenty third and then wrote that there must be no further delay the king had repeatedly ordered a reduction of the familiars on account of the daily complaints received against them he therefore commanded peremptorily that without reply or further excuse the instructions be executed and a notarial attestation of the fact be furnished during january if both inquisitors were not in valencia the one in residence must do the work if it was not accomplished within the time named they must present themselves personally before him to give their reasons for disobedience this would seem to leave no opening for evasion but it received no attention and on march tenth fifteen fifty two valdez wrote again repeating the injunctions of the previous march but conceding that there might be two hundred familiars in the city public proclamation of the revocations was to be made and evidence of execution with lists of those retained was to be furnished during april again no attention was paid to this and it was repeated september tenth this in time brought a statement that the number in the city had been reduced to two hundred but there is no evidence as to reductions elsewhere or that the wholesome limitation of commissions to two or three years had been observed if it were it was but for a brief time and we have seen what were the familiars of valencia early in the next century it was the same in castile when the concordia of fifteen fifty three was agreed upon a royal cedula of march tenth prescribed the number of familiars to be allowed in cities and towns and ordered that all in excess should be deprived of their commissions while lists of those retained were to be given to the secular authorities the suprema seems to have honestly endeavored to enforce these provisions by letters issued under the same date but the inquisitors were sullen and refractory and the valencia experience was repeated july thirteenth fifteen fifty five another royal cedula and circular letter of the suprema repeated the command to reduce the number and furnish lists again in fifteen sixty five these orders were renewed which brought out the fact that the tribunals had not even kept registers of the appointments for in fifteen sixty six they were ordered to call in all commissions and compile lists from them with the warning that all who were not born on such lists would not be allowed enjoyment of the fuero and if the judges were inhibited in such cases when the competencia reached the councils it would be abandoned even this required to be supplemented with another order the next year it would be a weariness of the flesh to follow in detail these fruitless efforts of the suprema to force the tribunals to comply with the law but a carta acordada of sixteen o four affords a glimpse into some of the tricks and evasions resorted to it lays down salutary rules as to the observance of the concordia and the character of appointees and proceeds to forbid the granting of expectative appointments the admissions of applicants to prove limpieza unless there is a vacancy and then he must be a resident of the place where it occurs and not one with a supposititious domicile appointments in derogation of these rules will not render the individual an official of the inquisition and no competencias will be entertained for him it shows how slack was the observance of this that it had to be repeated in sixteen twenty and again in sixteen twenty six while thus the suprema was vainly busied in repressing the exuberance of its subordinates it fiercely resented any assistance offered by outsiders the concordia of fifteen fifty three was part of the law of the land and as such it was printed in the official nueva recopilacion libro cuatro titulo i ley veinte in sixteen thirty four the council of castile apparently wearied with the stubbornness of the tribunals undertook to enforce it by printing the articles concerning the numbers and qualifications of familiars and sending them to the magistrates of the towns and villages with instructions that if the number was in excess they were to strike off the surplus if a list had not been furnished they were not to regard any one as a familiar and entitled to exemptions and privileges when this practical method of enforcing obedience to law came to the knowledge of the suprema it was highly incensed on december twenty second it addressed an indignant consulta to the king the council of castile it said was
was meddling with concerns wholly beyond its competence it had no authority in matters concerning the inquisition if inquisitors transgressed the law specific complaints could be made and settled in a junta of the two bodies the council was leading the local magistrates to sit in judgment on inquisitors and get themselves into trouble besides the familiars are so molested when they seek to avail themselves of their privileges that they think it better to abandon them they are fewer already than the concordia permits are diminishing daily and in a few years the inquisition will not have ministers to attend to its business the consulta concludes by asking the king to order the council to erase the paper from its records and not to issue similar ones in future for once this arrogance overshot the mark there must have been a desperate contest waged over the matter for philip kept the consulta until october three sixteen thirty six when he returned it with the endorsement that the council of castile can issue the provision embodying the articles of the concordia and can order the local magistrates to observe and execute them the reasons inducing inquisitors to the perpetual and illegal multiplication of these officials are not far to seek the position was much coveted and the high value set upon it notwithstanding the assertions of the suprema as to diminishing numbers is shown in one of the expedients for raising money resorted to in sixteen forty one when an additional familiarship was created in each place to be sold for fifteen hundred ducats the offer was withdrawn in sixteen forty three possibly because as we have seen in sixteen forty two a block of three hundred was thrown upon the market thus breaking the price when such estimates were placed on the office the opportunity for illicit gains was tempting to those who had power to issue commissions and in addition to this were the profits of litigation and the abundant fees for officials in the investigation into the limpieza of aspirants and their wives the fines also arising from cases in which familiars were concerned were a not inconsiderable addition to the income of the tribunals thus in fifteen sixty four dr zurita in a four months visitation of the dioceses of herona and elne collected a hundred and six ducats for offences committed by or against familiars and in addition five culprits were sent to barcelona on more serious charges which doubtless yielded still larger returns it is easy then to understand the temptation to enlarge so profitable a jurisdiction and the steady opposition to revealing the number of appointees by furnishing lists it is true that the suprema drew up an excellent list of qualifications as requisites for eligibility no one was to be appointed who was not an old christian at least twenty-five years of age married or a widower head of a household virtuous quiet peaceable and fitted for the office as well as of legitimate and not of foreign birth yet there was no difficulty in obtaining dispensations for age for celibacy for illegitimacy and for foreign birth or parentage the considerable fees for which went to the secretary of the inquisitor-general there was no formal dispensation for the moral qualities but these were elusive and the general character ascribed to familiars as we have seen in valencia shows how little care was frequently taken as to these they are not even alluded to in the formalities required in the middle of the seventeenth century when we are told that the petition of the applicant must be accompanied with a certificate from the secretary of his place of residence setting forth the number of inhabitants the number of familiars evidence of baptism to show his age that he did not follow any mechanic or low occupation and that he had property sufficient for his decent support he was also of course required to furnish the genealogies of himself and his wife for investigation into limpieza to what extent precautions were taken to avoid improper appointments depended of course upon the temper of the tribunal and necessarily varied with time and place in fifteen sixty one inquisitor cervantes says that in cordova seville and saragossa where he had served aspirants for appointment were taken on probation for two or three months after which inquiry was made as to their limpieza and mode of life when if they were married and peaceable men they were appointed but that nothing of this was observed in barcelona it is not likely that such scrutiny was frequent 
for the appointments were treated as patronage by inquisitors who took them in turn until in sixteen thirty eight this was forbidden by the suprema which ordered that they should be decided by voting the fiscals were required to report whether this was observed which it doubtless was because it could be so easily eluded by a private understanding there was some effort made but without success to maintain the dignity of the office by excluding those engaged in trade or in pursuits regarded as degrading such as butchers shoemakers pastry cooks and the like on the other hand there was naturally welcome for personages of distinction and of this there was no lack the bluest blood of spain did not disdain to serve the inquisition in the office of familiar this excited apprehension in the aragonese kingdoms and in the concordes of 1568 it was provided that familiars should be plain men and not powerful ones such as gentlemen and barons at once the valencia tribunal inquired of the suprema whether these excluded gentlemen who were not barons and it was assured that barons only were excluded the tribunal disregarded even this limitation and appointed barons and gentlemen holding vassals turbulent men rendered reckless by the exemptions leading to quarrels with the audiencia in which philip the second interposed in fifteen ninety by ordering all such appointments made since the concordia to be revoked loud were the complaints of the inquisitors they denied that they had appointed barons if the gentlemen with vassals were deprived of their commissions the inquisition would be dishonoured and what made matters worse the audiencia had registered a decree where it could be read by every one and had sent it to the governors of provinces thus publishing it to the world how long this exclusion lasted under the crown of aragon it would be impossible to say but probably it was not permanent in castile there was no such distinction at the madrid auto de fe of july four sixteen thirty two the standard of the inquisition was borne by the admiral of castile assisted by the constable of castile and the duke of medina de las torres all familiars fernando the sixth however adopted the aragonese precaution and required all familiars to be pecheros or taxpayers when an indignant memorial apparently from inquisitor-general prado y cuesta called his attention to the fact that there was not in all castile aragon valencia and andalusia a grandee or gentleman of illustrious birth who did not find ancestors on the rolls of the holy office or count it among the glories of his house that they were enlisted in the militia of the faith by this time the number of familiars had greatly fallen though not to the extent that would be inferred from the table in the appendix for the tribunals had evidently not reported them in fact it is probable that few if any had kept registers enabling them to do so the diminishing influence of the inquisition the curtailment in the privileges of the office the new spirit vivifying spain under the bourbons all combined to render the position less sought for and thenceforth we hear comparatively little of the familiar as a disturbing element in the social order it was a matter of course that the officials of the tribunals should form organized bodies they did so under the name of the cofradia or congregacion or hermandad de san pedro martir which assumed to be the same as the cruces signati founded in italy by innocent the fourth after the murder of st peter martyr in twelve fifty two the bulk of the membership was naturally formed by the familiars who were the most numerous class of officials and there are occasional allusions to colegios de familiares which may have been a subdivision of the general body at what date the cofradia was organized it would be impossible to assert but as early as fifteen nineteen it was a formidable body with chiefs known as mayordomos for when in that year there were rumors of an attempt in saragossa to liberate juan prat by force charles v ordered the zelmedina of saragossa to assemble it and resist the movement and he wrote to the mayordomos to obey the zelmedina the hermandad became elaborately organized in the inquisitorial centers with the constitution which was printed in sixteen seventeen each branch had as officers a padre mayor a secretary a mayordomo mayor a mayordomo menor and a fiscal the entrance fees were considerable and the reception of new members was attended with a certain amount of ceremonial in which the candidate took a solemn oath 
in the hands of an inquisitor to imperil his life in executing the commands of the holy office and to denounce all heretics after which the inquisitor gave him a cross and imparted to him all the privileges and indulgences of the cruces signati the extension of the hermandad over spain was by no means simultaneous it was not established in seville until sixteen o four and then only after considerable opposition even as late as seventeen hundred in a formulary there is a formula of a grant by inquisitors to the commissioners and familiars of an archpriest district to found a cofradia the functions of the body may be assumed as purely ornamental giving lustre to the solemnities of the auto de fe and an occasion for the inquisition to exhibit its strength marching in procession under the standard of the holy office in the seville auto of november seventh sixteen o four they formed a body four hundred strong and at that of cordova in sixteen fifty five they were reckoned at over five hundred at the last of the great autos celebrated in madrid in sixteen eighty the suprema ordered all the familiars of the city to join the congregation under penalty of forfeiting the fuero and each member was required to carry in the procession a wax candle of two pounds weight with the insignia of the inquisition whereupon it ordered three hundred candles on this occasion it received a splendid standard which it continued to use in solemn celebrations the organization was not always as faithful as it might have been to its oaths of obedience in sixteen o three in sixteen seventy five and again in seventeen fifteen there was trouble over the right claimed by the members to wear habitually their crosses and habits as insignia of saint dominic though the suprema restricted this to occasions of solemnity and it finally required a threat of dismissal to enforce the rule there was still greater indiscipline in sixteen thirty four and sixteen thirty five at valencia where they excited the popular tumult and refused to obey the orders of the suprema in the matter of the celebration of the feast of the cruz nueva when under the restoration fernando the seventh endeavoured to revive the somewhat dilapidated glories of the inquisition it was suggested to him to elevate the hermandad into a royal order of knighthood he welcomed the idea and on march seventeenth eighteen fifteen he issued a decree in which he says that at the request of the mayordomos of the most illustrious congregation of san pedro composed of the suprema the inquisitors and the subordinates of all the tribunals and in order that they may be distinguished and honoured he commands that they wear daily on their outer garments like the other orders of knighthood the habit and badge of the inquisition to set the example on the feast of saint peter martyr april twenty ninth he presided over the congregation in person accompanied by the infantes don carlos and don antonio when he wore this insignia which was imitated by the members so that it became the fashion in the court april twenty sixth the royal council promulgated the decree in accordance it said with concessions from the holy see and it ordered that no individual or court should impede the members in the enjoyment of this right on may tenth the suprema communicated the decree to the tribunals with orders for its strict observance by all officials it was disheartening to find that all this was not taken seriously by the people for it was not long before the inquisitor of valladolid had occasion to complain to the suprema of the insults offered by the ecclesiastical authorities to the officials on account of the decoration of the royal order of knighthood of saint peter martyr End of Book Four, Chapter Three, Part Two. Recording by Shena Sear, Fresno, California. Book Four, Chapter Four, Part One of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 4, Organization, Chapter 4, Part 1, Limpieza. Repeated allusions have occurred above to the limpieza, or purity of blood, required in all officials of the Inquisition. 
This was so remarkable a development of the prevailing fanaticism, and exercised so much influence on the social condition of Spain, that it deserves a somewhat detailed investigation. The first indication of this exclusiveness is seen in the Setencia Estatuto of Toledo, in 1449, under which all conversos were stripped of their official positions as being suspect in the faith, volume 1, page 126. This, as we have seen, elicited the bull of Nicholas V, denouncing such legislation as unchristian, forbidding discrimination between old and new Christians, and confirming the laws to that effect of Alfonso X, Henry III, and Juan II. This was evaded in the founding of a confraternity, under the title of Christian Love, in Cordova, in 1473, from which all conversos were rigorously excluded, leading to the tumults and massacres described above. It may have been this which induced Archbishop Carrillo of Toledo, in a provincial synod held at Alcala, to denounce the growing practice of brotherhoods bound under oaths to exclude conversos and alleging these oaths in justification. All such statutes were declared invalid, and all who had taken such oaths were released from them. In 1473 also, Juan II of Aragon abrogated the statutes of a similar organization in Majorca, and ordered that conversos should have full enjoyment of all faculties in his dominions. A somewhat ludicrous aspect was given to this prejudice by a guild of stonemasons in Toledo, composed principally of mudejares, which, in 1481, adopted a rule forbidding members from teaching their art to conversos, and the next year a still more prescriptive statute was adopted in Guipuscoa, prohibiting conversos from settling or marrying in the province. The earliest official recognition of a distinction between old and new Christians was the bull of Sixtus IV in 1483, ordering that episcopal inquisitors should be old Christians. The next step was more portentous of the future when, in 1485, the temporary inquisition was established in the Geronimite monastery of Guadalupe, a Jew was found among the monks who had been living as one of them for forty years, and yet had never been baptized. His prompt burning in front of the convent gates did not allay the dread that other heretics might find similar refuge in the order, leading the general chapter to decree that no descendant of a Jew should be admitted. Those already entered, if they had not professed, were expelled, and those who had professed were incapacitated for any honor or dignity. Much discussion ensued. The decree was held as contravening the bull of Nicholas V in 1449, and there was prospect of trouble, leading Ferdinand and Isabella to apply to Innocent VIII for a remedy. He evaded a decision in the brief Deset Romanum, September 25, 1486, by clothing the Archbishop of Seville and all bishops of Cordova and Leon with authority to decide all questions under the decree, and to revoke, modify, and strengthen it at their discretion. This, of course, was held to be a practical confirmation of the new rule, and we are told that Our Lady of Guadalupe was so delighted that she coruscated in miracles, which Fray Francisco Sancho de la Fuente undertook to record, but they were so abundant that his zeal was exhausted, and he abandoned the pious task. The next instance was a special and limited one. After Torquemada had founded at Avila his convent of St. Thomas Aquinas, he grew apprehensive that the hatred which he had earned from the conversos might lead them to enter it with evil intent. In 1496, he therefore applied to Alexander the Sixth for a decree forbidding the reception of any one descended, directly or indirectly, from Jews, a request which the pontiff readily granted, subjecting to ipso facto excommunication any prior or other person contravening the rule. The tendency to discriminate against conversos was stimulated by the disabilities inflicted under the canon law on the children and grandchildren of impenitent heretics. This will be treated more fully hereafter, and it suffices to say here that it was construed as applying to the children and grandchildren of all condemned or reconciled by the Inquisition. It was the subject of some debate, 
and the instructions of 1488 required inquisitors to enforce by heavy penalties the incapacity of such descendants to hold any public office, or be admitted to holy orders. These disabilities were extended still further by the sovereigns, in two pragmaticas of 1501, forbidding the children and grandchildren by the male line, and the children by the female, to hold any office of honour, or to be notaries, scriveners, physicians, surgeons, or apothecaries. These pragmaticas were promptly sent by the Suprema to all tribunals, with orders for their strict enforcement, as the sovereigns did not permit exceptions to be made. In this rising tide of proscription, it is pleasant to find an exception. There was no more uncompromising defender of the faith than Jimenez, but, in organizing his University of Alcala, he made no discrimination against conversos. In his carefully elaborated details as to qualifications for professorships, fellowships, degrees, and the other objects of academic ambition, there is not a word indicating that the taint of Jewish or Moorish blood was an obstacle. It was doubtless this which accepted Alcala from the ominous decree of the Suprema, November 20, 1522, prohibiting Salamanca, Valladolid, and Toledo from conferring degrees upon any convert from Judaism, or on any son or grandsons of one condemned by the Inquisition. Where it found warrant for such assumption of authority, it might be difficult to say, but the effect of such proscription can scarce be exaggerated, in thus barring the way to all the learned professions, and consequently to public employment and ecclesiastical preferment. The next step was taken by the Observantine Franciscans, who, in 1525, procured from Clement the Seventh a brief providing that in Spain no fraile descended from Jews, or from one convicted by the Inquisition, should be promoted to any office or dignity, and that thereafter no one laboring under such defect should be admitted into that order. By this time the question of limpieza was ever present, and every one was popularly classed as an old Christian or a new, for genealogies seemed to have been public property. When, in 1528, Diego de Uceda was tried for Lutheranism, and claimed to be an old Christian, the Toledo Tribunal sought testimony in Cordova, where the witnesses unhesitatingly described his family, paternal and maternal, as perfectly pure from stain of converso blood, which they said was notorious throughout the city. The increasing importance of the matter led the Inquisition to amass evidence for itself, and, in 1530, the tribunals were ordered to summon before them the descendants of all who had been relaxed or reconciled, and ascertain whether they had changed their names. From this general inquest, each tribunal compiled for its own district a number of genealogies, comprising all the infected families, which, when duly kept up, preserved a mass of testimony infinitely disquieting to subsequent generations. The growing importance of the questions involved, to society at large, is indicated by a petition of the Cortes of Segovia in 1532, that those should be held as old Christians who could prove their descent from Christian parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents, or, if necessary, from great-great-grandparents, and that no imputation of lack of limpieza should be cast on them, unless there is evidence to prove their descent from Jews or Moors, or that an ancestor had been condemned by the Inquisition. The Dominicans were not as active as the Franciscans in obtaining papal protection of their limpieza. In a long list of briefs conceded to Spanish Dominican houses, there is no allusion to the exclusion of conversos between Torquemadas of 1496 and 1531, when the houses of Santa Maria Nieva and San Pedro Martir of Toledo were forbidden to receive any fraile suspected of Jewish or Moorish origin, while in the College of Santa Maria the professors and students of arts and theology were required to be free from all suspicion of such descent. The sentiment of the order was less proscriptive than that of the Franciscans. Its most conspicuous member of the period was Thomas de Vio, better known as Cardinal Caetano, 
who, when consulted in 1514 by the regent of Salamanca, as to the legality of excluding those of Jewish blood from the order, replied that it was not a mortal sin, but, seeing that the race had furnished Jesus Christ and the apostles, and the salvation of man, it was irrational and ungrateful to discriminate against them, as well as an obstacle to their conversion. Paul III agreed with him, for, in a motu proprio of 1535, addressed to the Dominican provincial, he forbade any impediment to the entrance in the order of those of Jewish or Moorish blood, and, on learning that this was disregarded in some houses, he repeated and confirmed it with censures by a brief of August 3, 1537. In this, as in so much else, any one seemed able to get from the Holy See whatever he wanted, and Paul reversed himself in 1538, when the convent of San Pablo of Cordova represented that, in most of the colleges of the order, descendants of conversos were not received, or, if admitted in error, were ejected, and it desired the same concession to its college, as necessary for its preservation and the peace of the house. Paul promptly acceded to this request, and ordered that the inquisitors and the dean of Cordova to defend the convent in these privileges, even to calling in the aid of the secular arm. This was followed by a more general measure in 1542, when, by command of Paul, Cardinal Juan de Toledo, Bishop of Burgos, prohibited the Dominicans of Aragon from receiving into the order descendants of Jews or of convicts of the Inquisition to the fourth generation. It is not likely that this was confined to Aragon, and in the next year we find the Suprema addressing the provincial and the definitors, urging that no conversos be allowed to enter. Charles V was as inconsistent as Paul III. In 1537 he issued a decree reciting that as, in some colleges of the universities, admittance was refused to new Christians, he ordered that the constitutions of the founders be observed. Yet when the chapter of Cordova, in 1530, adopted a statute of Limpieza applicable to all the ministrants of the cathedral, and was unable to obtain papal confirmation, he ordered its observance, and contributed by his influence to induce Paul IV, in 1555, to confirm it. The movement was one which was constantly gaining momentum. In 1548, Archbishop Silicio of Toledo enumerates, among the bodies refusing admission to all except old Christians, the three great military orders of Santiago, Calatrava, and Alcantara, membership in which was the object of ambition to almost every Spanish layman of gentle birth. In all the Spanish colleges, including that of Bologna, founded by Cardinal Albornoz, none but old Christians were received, and from these colleges were drawn the members of councils and chancelleries and other judicial officials. It was the same with the minims, by express statute of the founder of St. Francis de Paula, and in other orders and monasteries of both men and women. Cathedral chapters were beginning to adopt it, such as those of Cordova and Jaén. Numerous confraternities were based upon it, and many mayorascos, or entailed estates, were conditioned on it. Thus the mania for absolute purity of blood was spreading irresistibly, and, while it would be impossible now to enumerate accurately the bodies which made it a condition precedent of membership, it is safe to say that the avenues of distinction, and even of livelihood, in public life and in the church, were rapidly closing to all who bore the fatal mancha or stain. In time, even admission to holy orders required proof of limpieza. The conversos, however, were too able and energetic to yield without a struggle, and how the losing battle was waged is seen in the decisive case of the primatial church of Toledo. The Cardinal Archbishop Tavera attempted, in 1539, to procure the adoption of a statute of limpieza in the cathedral but the opposition was so strong that he was obliged to desist. His successor was Juan Martínez Pedernales, who adopted the classic appellation of Siliceo, a Salamanca professor who had the luck to be appointed tutor to Prince Philip, and was rewarded with the See of Murcia in 1541, 
whence he was translated to Toledo in 1546. He was roused to indignation when, in September of that year, papal letters were presented to the chapter granting a canonry to Dr. Hernán Jiménez, whose father had been reconciled by the Inquisition. Although the chapter had several converso members, it refused admission to Jiménez, and wrote a rambling and inconsequential letter to Paul III, justifying its disobedience. To prevent such contamination for the future, Siliceo drew up a statute forbidding that any but an old Christian should hold a position in the cathedral, even down to the choir boys. All aspirants were to present their genealogies and deposit a sum of money to defray the expense of an investigation. In July 1547 he came to Toledo with a large retinue of gentlemen, and secretly assured himself of the assent of a majority of the canons, who bound themselves with oaths to adopt it. A meeting of the chapter was called, and the measure was sprung upon it, in violation of its rules of order, as he frankly said, if notice had been given and discussion allowed, it could not have been passed, for the conversos would have intrigued successfully against it. The vote in its favor was twenty-five to ten, not including the dean, who opposed it but had no vote. The minority claimed that they were the wiser and better part of the chapter, and probably they were, for they included the archdeacons of Guadalajara and Talavera, both sons of the Duke del Infantado, and Juan de Vergara, one of the most illustrious men of letters of the day, who had had experience of the rigor of the Inquisition. This action aroused so much excitement in the city that the royal council sent an alcalde de corte, who reported that, for the sake of peace, the statute had better not be enforced, in consequence of which Prince Philip, then holding the cortes of Monson, sent orders to suspend it until the emperor's pleasure could be learned. The struggle was thus transferred to the imperial court and to Rome. The matter was argued publicly in the Rota, when the conclusion was against confirmation, and the Pope signed a brief to that effect, but the archbishop's envoy, Diego de Guzman, used such persuasive arguments that Paul secretly evoked the matter to himself, and signed another brief, May 28, 1548, confirming the statute, so that each side could boast of his support. Charles referred the question back to the royal council, to which both sides presented memorials. Their temper may be judged by the argument of the chapter that, after so many religious bodies had adopted the exclusion, if the opponents contend it to be unscriptural, they are manifest heretics and should be burnt to ashes. A memorial of Siliceo to Charles is in the same key. A strange medley of evils is attributed to Jews and conversos. Even the German Lutherans are descendants of Jews. On taking possession of his archbishopric, he had found that nearly all the beneficed priests and those having cure of souls were of Jewish extraction, and there was danger of conversos obtaining entire possession of the church, owing to the sale of preferment in Rome, where there were at the time five or six thousand Spaniards, most of them conversos, bargaining for benefices. It was the same in the other professions, where judges, lawyers, notaries, scriveners, farmers of the revenue, etc., were mostly of Jewish stock, and they alone were physicians, surgeons, and apothecaries, in spite of all that the Inquisition had burnt and was daily burning. They adopted these callings solely for the purpose of killing Christians. It was but the other day that, in a Toledo auto, there was reconciled a surgeon who always placed a poisonous powder in the wounds of his Christian patients. If Charles did not confirm the statute, the outlook was that the conversos would govern the church of Toledo. Wild as all this may seem to us, it gives us a valuable insight into the impulses which govern Spain in its dealings with the alien races within her borders. It was a humiliating admission that they were regarded as men of superior intelligence and ability, whose wrongs for generations had converted them into irreconcilable enemies, the object of mingled dread and detestation. As they could not be matched in intellect, the only policy was brute repression and extermination. Of course, Siliceo carried the day. The confirmation of his statute by Paul III 
was conclusive and was regarded as establishing on irrefragable grounds the necessity of limpieza as a qualification for all who aspired to a position in church or state. Toledo maintained it even against the Pope. In 1573, the Venetian envoy, Leonardo Donato, reports that he had seen all the authority of the stern Pius V vainly exerted to secure the archdiaconate of Toledo for a servant of his who was not limpio, and who finally had to content himself with transferring the dignity to another, and retaining a heavy pension on the revenues. It was not only in Toledo that the capacity of the conversos was filling the minds of the faithful with dire apprehensions of their ultimate triumph over their oppressors. While Siliceo was at work, the Inquisition was endeavouring to enforce the brief by which, in 1525, Clement the Seventh had excluded them from the observantine Franciscans. To the Suprema its fiscal represented that the unbridled license of frailes of Jewish descent had prevailed to such an extent that they were elected as general and provincial ministers, guardians, vicars, procurators, visitors, and other officials, to the opposition of the old Christians of the order, who were thus excluded from office, causing daily scandals and threatening worse. Valdez consequently ordered the brief to be published anew, and observed everywhere under heavy penalties. Thereupon the general of the order, Andreas de Insula, was incensed, and, on the assumption that this had been instigated by old Christian frailes, threatened to punish them severely. The Suprema therefore appealed to Julius III, reciting all this, and pointing out the crafty and unscrupulous ways in which that unquiet race disturbed the peace of all bodies to which it found entrance, forming factions, and aspiring to rule, with the object of ruining the old Christians, thus opening the way to a return of Judaism and the destruction of Christianity. Julius responded favorably, in a brief of September 21, 1550, instructing Valdez to summon the general Andreas and all concerned to obey the decree of Clement, and granting him full powers to decide summarily the prosecutions proposed with a view to protect the old Christians from molestation, using for the purpose whatever censures might be necessary. It shows how indomitable were the conversos that confirmatory briefs had to be procured from Gregory the Thirteenth and Sixtus the Fifth. Yet again the Holy See manifested its inconsistency, for when the chapter of Seville, in 1565, petitioned Pius IV to confirm a statute of limpieza, he refused and condemned the Spanish practice as contrary to law and as upsetting the churches. Cardinal Pacheco defended it and described the evils wrought by the Jews when Pius turned fiercely on him, saying that he would do as he thought best and that the Spaniards all tried to be popes. When those who had a slightest taint of Jewish or Moorish blood were thus regarded as not only implacable enemies of the Christian faith, but as gifted with preeminent intelligence and craft, it became impossible for the Inquisition to consider them as fitted for its service. One would have expected it to take the initiative, and the only subject of surprise is that it should have been so late in adopting for itself the rule which it was enforcing on other bodies. Discrimination may have been exercised in special cases, but, till the middle of the sixteenth century, there is no trace of any systematic adoption of limpieza as a test. A carta acordada of July 20, 1543, and a decree of Prince Philip in 1545, respecting the numbers and character of familiars, are silent as to this as a qualification. The first allusion to it that I have met occurs in a commission issued to Francisco Romeo as scrivener of confiscations in Saragossa, signed April 16, 1546, by the Inquisitor-General, but not countersigned by members of the Suprema until July 9th, quote, after the inquisitors of Aragon had ascertained the limpieza of the said Francisco Romeo. End quote. A step forward is seen in the instructions issued by the Suprema, October 10th of this same year, in which it ordered that no familiar be received until it is ascertained that he is an old Christian. Still, this was rejected as a general principle, 
for when the cortes of monzon in 1547 complained that moriscos were appointed as familiars the answer of the suprema was a formal declaration that the inquisition regarded as capable of holding office all who had been baptized and who lived as christians except heretics or apostates or fautors of heretics this vacillation continued a number of appointments subsequent to that of romeo have no allusion to limpieza until fifteen forty nine when on april ninth valdes inquires of the inquisitors of barcelona whether jeronimo de tombos candidate for the receivership possesses the qualifications of limpieza and habits required in officials and whether there is anything connected with his wife to prevent his appointment so on april eighth when moya de contreras inquisitor of saragossa proposed to employ commissioners of the cruzada valdes emphatically negatived the suggestion giving among other reasons the fact that the officials of the cruzada were not tan limpios de sangre yet in an order of october eighth of the same year to the tribunal of cuenca remodeling its familiars there is no allusion to the necessity of limpieza this uncertainty continued yet for a while of which further instances could be cited but a decisive step seemed to be taken when philip in instructions of march ten fifteen fifty three concerning the concordia of castile prescribed that all familiars must be old christians and yet a carta acordada of march twentieth on the same subject makes no allusion to such a condition the tribunals appear to have been somewhat slack in conforming their patronage to the new regulation december twenty three fifteen sixty the suprema felt it necessary to order that all familiars must be married men and limpios when the inquisitor-general made an appointment and required the inquisitors to certify to the limpieza of the nominee they would do so as appears from the commission of bernaldo mancipi as assistant notary of sequestrations in barcelona in fifteen sixty one but in this same year inspector cervantes reported that they paid no attention to it in their appointments of commissioners consultores and familiars a negligence which continued for in fifteen sixty eight the suprema was obliged to rebuke them for it this is scarce surprising when philip the second himself in fifteen sixty five had issued a series of conciliatory instructions regarding the moriscos of valencia in which he ordered that their leading men should be made familiars end of book four chapter four part one Book Four, Chapter Four, Part Two of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two by Henry Charles Lee. Book Four, Organization, Chapter Four, Part Two, Limpieza. Thus far, there does not seem to have been any definite system adopted as to verifying limpieza. The statute of Toledo required aspirants to furnish genealogies and deposit money for expenses, and this was probably the common plan. In 1557, we are told of Beltran Ibáñez de Arzamendi, appointed alguacil in the tribunal of Sardinia, that the examination of his paternal genealogy was made in Valencia, and of his maternal in Calahora, the birthplaces of his respective parents, but doubtless much of this was perfunctory. It is evidently felt that the highest authority must be invoked to prescribe a settled system, and Philip II was called upon for this. In 1562 he accordingly issued a decree, in which, according to custom, antiquity was claimed for innovation, for it recited that, since the Inquisition had been founded in Castile and Aragon, all inquisitors and officials appointed by the Inquisitor-General had been required to furnish genealogies to prove that there was no trace of descent from Jews or Moors, or from those condemned or penanced by the Inquisition. The King therefore ordered that all appointees, in tribunals of the kingdoms of the Crown of Aragon and of Navarre, and of Logroño, should furnish satisfactory proofs of limpieza, 
even though they might hold canonries or churches or be members of orders which required limpieza. Moreover, married men were obliged to furnish proofs of the limpieza of their wives, and those already in office were to be dismissed if there was defect of limpieza in the wife. These rules were to be embodied in the instructions, and were to be inviolably observed. Undoubtedly a similar order was issued for Castile, and the utterance is important as embodying the first absolute demand for proofs of limpieza, and as marking the extravagant extension of the rule to wives. This royal cedula was interpreted as applicable to existing incumbents, and investigations as to their genealogies were set on foot, with the intention of weeding out at least the familiars who were not limpios. Several efforts had already been made to this effect under the Castile Concordia of 1553, without apparent result, and it was now undertaken again, with instructions that, if any were found to be conversos, they were to be dismissed without assigning a reason. It was a work ungrateful both to the investigators and investigated, and dragged along in the most perfunctory fashion. Cartas Acordadas, in 1567 and 1575, called for lists of those who had been investigated, and those who had not, and, when it came to taking action, the habitual tenderness manifested toward officials was displayed in orders issued in 1572, and again in 1582, that if any officials, commissioners, or familiars were found lacking in the requisite qualifications, they were to be reported to the Suprema without dismissing them. As a matter of course, the test was applied to all new appointments, and no one was admitted to office in any capacity in the Inquisition who was not free from the mancha of Jewish or Moorish blood, or of ancestral punishment. Even for temporary employment, Limpieza was essential. In his visitation of the Canaries in 1574, the inspector Bravo de Zayas brought an accusation against the inquisitor Ortiz de Funes, of appointing officials without preliminary investigation, the cases being two emergency appointments to fill temporary vacancies, and the appointees being montañeses, or highlanders from the northern provinces of Spain, where purity of blood was presumable, to say nothing of the fact that an investigation would probably have consumed a year or two. Yet this was but the natural expression of the infatuation which had taken possession of Spain." In 1595, Philip II, in his instructions to Manrique de Lara, lays a special stress on the importance of limpieza. Investigation as to this and as to habits must be made with the utmost rigor, and no dispensations must be granted. No examinations are to be made before the party is selected, because otherwise, if he is not appointed owing to other reasons, it may be ascribed to a mancha, and thus undeserved infamy be cast upon an entire kindred. Strangely enough, however, the Inquisitor-General himself was never required to furnish proofs of purity of blood. Unfortunately, in the craze for absolute limpieza, no limit was set to the number of generations through which the taint could be carried. The canon law, as we have seen, limited disabilities to grandchildren, and in 1573, Leonardo Donato describes the rule as extending to what were called the four quarters, that is, the parents and the four grandparents, and in this moderate shape he says it was the cause of constant strife and of preserving the old Judaizing memories. In this, however, he greatly understated Spanish craving for purity of blood. We have seen the Cortes of Castile, in 1532, petition that it should be satisfied with great-grandparents, indicating that it was carried beyond this, and Silesios Toledo statute affixed no limit. Each body, it is true, could prescribe its own rules, but the more important ones discarded all limitations, and refused admission to those against whom a stain could be found, however remote. In 1633 Escobar informs us that among these were included the Inquisition, the Orders of Santiago, Alcantara, Calatrava, and St. John, the Church of Toledo, and all the greater colleges and universities, including that of Alcala. These also required the most rigorous investigation to trace out the slightest mancha in the remotest grade of parentage. 
There were two sources of descent which caused impurity of blood, from an ancestor of either of the proscribed races, or from one who had ever been penanced by the Inquisition. As regards the former, the line was drawn at the massacres of 1391 for Jews, and at the enforced baptisms of the early sixteenth century for Moors. Voluntary converts, prior to these periods, were accepted as old Christians, the subsequent ones were considered as unwilling converts, and were regarded as new Christians, together with their descendants, no matter how zealously they had embraced the Christian faith. The prevalence of intermarriage with conversos throughout the fifteenth century had led to infinite ramifications throughout the land in the course of generations, and, about 1560, Cardinal Mendoza y Bobadilla, apparently moved by some discussion on limpieza, drew up and presented to Philip II a memorial in which he showed that virtually the whole nobility of Castile and Aragon had a strain of Jewish blood. There was no lack of material for tracing the dissemination of this blood through the land. In Aragon, Juan de Anchias, the zealous secretary of the first Saragossa tribunal, compiled what was known as the Libro Verde de Aragon, giving the affiliations of all the leading conversos who had suffered, so as to serve as a beacon for all who desired to avoid contamination. In Castile there was no such authoritative publication, but the records of the tribunals had accumulated ample material, and the sanbenitos of the relaxed and reconciled, hung in the parish churches, kept the memory of the sufferers green to the discomfiture of their descendants. Many individuals, moved by zeal or by malignity, from these and other sources, with greater or less exactness, and including much that was mere idle hearsay, compiled books which were circulated under the name of Libros Verde, or Del Becerro. No one of the upper or middle class, except in the remote mountainous districts of the north and east, could feel secure that an investigation might not reveal some unfortunate misalliance of a distant ancestor. In fact, only those could feel safe, whose obscurity precluded any prolonged search into their ancestry. As a writer remarks, in 1627, if it were not for limpieza, the Inquisition could select the best men for familiars, in place of appointing the low-born, whose ignorance enables them to pass the examinations successfully. The second source of impurity, descent from one penanced by the Inquisition, originally applied only to those who had incurred the heavier penalties of relaxation or reconciliation, but there was nothing to check the scrupulosity of the examiners, who worked in secret, and they came to regard any penance inflicted by the holy office as affixing an indelible stigma on the descendants. The results of this were forcibly described in a memorial presented, in 1631, to Philip IV by Dr. Diego de Silva, a member of the Suprema. After alluding to the greatly increased rigor of investigation, dating from the later years of Philip II, he proceeds to state a farther source of wrong only appreciable by one who has handled the records of the Inquisition, and not to be openly mentioned. In contrast to the exquisite justice and benignity which he ascribes to the existing tribunals, the proceedings in the former period were hurried and violent. Many to save their lives made confessions which may have been groundless. Whole districts were reconciled rather as a spiritual than a judicial process. In that dangerous period, careless words and propositions created suspicion, and people were tried and dismissed with some trivial penance, a few masses, some almsgiving, or a light fast, for offenses belonging really to the exterior forum. Yet all these were sentences, and as there has since grown up the rule requiring immemorial limpieza, whole families were branded with infamy. As, in fact, since the Reformation, the Inquisition had grown more and more exacting, and had inflicted on old Christians innumerable penances for careless words, it is easy to conceive how this rigorous definition of limpieza spread infection throughout the land, even outside of those who had a drop of Jewish or Moorish blood. These evils were aggravated by the looseness with which adverse testimony was admitted in the investigations. Anonymous communications were received and acted upon, for, although this was prohibited by law and by papal briefs, 
these were commonly disregarded. In a decree by Philip IV, in 1623, designed to curb some of the evils, it was ordered that no weight be attributed to idle talk, but the diffuseness with which Escobar, in his commentary on this section, dwells upon the worthless character of scandal and idle gossip and angry words uttered in quarrels, shows how largely such evidence entered into the conclusions reached. Common fame or reputation, he tells us, suffices, even if the grounds for it be unknown, and purity or impurity of blood is for the most part a matter of common fame and belief. That this is so is seen in the elaborate series of instructions for the conduct of such investigations, where the fiscal is warned that great weight is to be given to such expressions of opinion, even though the witness can offer no proof except that he has heard it from his elders. The avenue thus opened to the malignant to gratify hatred is dwelt upon by the writer with too much insistence for us to question the frequency with which it was utilized. This was facilitated by the secrecy which shrouded these investigations. The applicant put in his genealogy, named his witnesses, and awaited the event. The process at best was a deliberate one, and, if the result was unfavorable, the answer never came, though the failure to secure an appointment might arise from any other cause. As Dr. Silva says, the silence and mysterious authority of the Inquisition will not give the slightest glimmer of light to the applicant, even through twenty years of suspense, though meanwhile the opinion gains ground that his family is impure, without his being able to rebut or investigate it, and thus a whole lineage suffers with all its kindred. A glimpse into the anxieties thus caused is afforded by a consulta of February 26, 1634, from the Inquisitor-General to the King, respecting a memorial from the Marquis of Navarres, asking for a speedy decision for his son, Don Francisco Gurea y Borja, who had put in his proofs for an appointment as familiar, as the delay is damaging to his reputation. The Inquisitor-General reports to the King that no conclusion had been reached. Perhaps the King may please to decide it, for the Marquis has been in court for a long time pressing the matter, and the delay has brought upon him suffering and stigma. The suspense endured by all the kindred, when one of its members decided to undergo the ordeal, is visible in a letter of 1636 from Fernando, Archbishop of Cusco, to his nephew, the Coronel Jacinto de Vera, on learning that he was about to apply for admission to one of the military orders. He gives him advice and information, and so important did he consider it that he had seven copies made, to be forwarded by different routes and vessels, and another member of the family wrote to Jacinto, earnestly cautioning him not to let any eye but his own fall upon the archbishop's letter. In the routine adopted by the Inquisition for these investigations, the applicant handed in his genealogy, and, if married, that of his wife, giving the names and residences of parents and grandparents. If thorough search through the registers, by names and districts, revealed a fatal blot, that, of course, was sufficient. If not, commissioners or secretaries with notaries were sent from the tribunal, or the nearest commissioners were ordered to go to the places of residence, where from eight to twelve of the most aged old Christians of good repute were summoned as witnesses, with precautions to prevent the interested parties from knowing who was called upon. The witnesses were examined under oath, on a series of printed interrogatories, as to their knowledge of the parties, whether they were descended from conversos or from penitents, what were the sources of information, and whether it was public fame and report. The replies were duly taken down and attested. If salaried officials or familiars were concerned, the results of the information were transmitted to the Suprema, to which were also referred doubtful questions and votes in discordia. In a more perfected form, known as the Nueva Orden, in use in the seventeenth century, stringent additional precautions were taken to prevent the insufficient secrecy observed by officials which was supposed to deter witnesses from giving adverse evidence. A carta acordada of January 22, 1628, threatened excommunication and deprivation of office for this, and, under subsequent regulations, all concerned were forbidden, under rigorous penalties, 
to reveal to any one, even to a minister of the Inquisition, any evidence taken, or papers, or records, or even the name of a witness, so that the applicant should be kept in perfect ignorance of the progress of his affair. The commissioners were invested with full power to cite witnesses, to examine into San Benitos suspended in churches, and to demand any papers bearing upon questions that might arise, whether these were in private hands or public archives, and at their discretion to make copies or carry away the originals, the owners of which were told that if they wanted them back, they might apply to the tribunal. If a witness absented himself, a summons to appear before the tribunal was left with the parish priest to be served on him when he should return. Evidently no family records were too sacred to escape these searching investigations. All this, of course, involved expense, and the fees earned in the work by the officials formed a welcome source of revenue. In 1625 the pay of notaries or secretaries was fixed at a per diem of sixteen reales. This was subsequently raised, for in 1665 a statement of expenses in the case of Dr. Martin Roig, applicant for the position of consultor in Valencia, shows that the secretary was paid thirty sueldos a day, and a local commissioner twenty. This was only part of the cost, for every act and every blank filled in, every piece of writing bore its separate charge. The bill rolled up for him and his wife, in Barcelona, for this unsalaried position, amounted to nine hundred fifty-five and two-thirds sueldos, and this was only the beginning." Similar researches were required in the tribunals of Valencia and Cuenca, which must have been still more costly, for the Barcelona report only occupied twenty-three folios, while that of Valencia was in ninety, and one against his son Vicente was in a hundred and eight. Two years later, in 1667, the affair was still dragging on. It was a large price for the honor of an unpaid position, even if he proved successful. These extortions were multiplied as often as possible. In 1661, Juan Temprado Munoz made his proofs as receiver of the Tribunal of Murcia, and of course this included his wife, but when, in 1667, their son Juan Temprado de Serena desired an office in the Tribunal of Barcelona, he had to go through the same process afresh, when the examination of the Barcelona registers alone cost him 546 sueldos. In addition to this, the registers of Cuenca and Valencia had to be examined, and evidence had to be taken in the home of his ancestors. This chanced to be in Roussillon, which was now French territory. There was a war between the nations, and, even in peace, France refused entrance to officials of the Inquisition, so the ingenious formality was devised of sending a commissioner to the border and examining there the requisite number of old men as witnesses. The evidence, of course, was valueless, but it gathered in the per diem all the same. In time this per diem for the secretary was increased to fifty reales, and from one or two cases in 1815 it appears that it was a perquisite which the secretaries took in turns, and, when the commissioner nearest to the place of examination was employed, it was without prejudice to the secretary, that is, the commissioner who did the work received thirty reales a day, while the secretary took the other twenty. In order to secure the payment of these fees, the applicant was required, when he presented his genealogy, to make a deposit, originally of three hundred reales. As the business increased, it became evident that a separate fund and separate accounts of these monies must be kept, and in 1600 it was ordered that a special chest be provided, with two keys, one entrusted to the fiscal and the other to a secretary. Abuses crept in, effectively described in the memorial of 1623 to the Suprema, as a remedy for which a new official was created, known as the Depositario de los Pretendientes, who received and accounted for the deposits, charging two per cent on the sums passing through his hands. This he remitted to the Suprema, for his office was salaried, and he was relieved of the temptation to perquisites. The office was one of those put up for sale, for three or four lives, under Sotomayor. 
The whole business was provocative of fraud and perjury and bribery. Despite the well-meant efforts of the Inquisition to preserve the profoundest secrecy, the writers of the period are too unanimous in deploring the success of enemies in casting infamy on those they hated, for us to doubt that means were found to ascertain what was on hand, and to abuse the opportunity. To the applicants the stake was too great for them to shrink from any means that promised success. Cases became not infrequent in the records of prosecutions for false witness in matters of limpieza, showing that aspirants were not remiss in furnishing testimony to prove fraudulent claims. Although, in 1560, Valdés humanely ordered that descendants of penitents, who committed perjury in getting up statements of limpieza, should not be prosecuted, this policy changed in 1577, when they were subjected to prosecution, and in 1582 the thrifty plan was adopted of inflicting pecuniary penance. This proved profitable, for the culprits were many, not only among aspirants to office, but because limpieza was requisite in many careers, and the Inquisition took cognizance of all cases of perjury in this matter, whether it was concerned or not in the investigation. Thus, in 1585, Bernardino de Torres, a prominent citizen of Toledo, had occasion in a suit to prove his nobility and purity of blood, which he did with a number of witnesses. The tribunal had evidence in its records that, on both father's and mother's side, he was descended from conversos who had been penanced, and it promptly prosecuted both him and his witnesses. Among them was the regidor of Toledo, Diego de Paredes, who had likewise sworn to his own limpieza, although the records showed his descent from reconciliados in a time of grace. Altogether there were sixteen witnesses, the advanced age of most of them showing that old men found profitable occupation in testifying to their recollections. Bernardino himself was penanced in fifty thousand maravedis. Many of the witnesses were let off with perpetual disability to testify in such cases, but a hundred and thirty-six thousand maravedis were collected from the rest. A few other Toledo cases at the same time may be mentioned to show the various motives impelling men to these frauds. Jerónimo de Villarreal desired to place his daughter in a convent where limpieza was required. The licenciado Antonio de Olvera was about to emigrate to the colonies and wished to protect himself from insult. Hernando de Villarreal had a son who proposed to take orders, and another who aspired to an appointment as familiar. The records showed them to be descended from grandparents or great-grandparents who had been burnt or reconciled, and they were duly punished. The taint spread with every new generation, and a large part of the population was heavily handicapped in life. If there were frequent perjury and subordination of testimony, it is not to be supposed that the seekers for limpieza hesitated to corrupt the officials who controlled their destinies, nor is it unreasonable to assume that many of the latter were accessible to bribery. The opportunities were tempting, and they were freely exploited. An experienced writer, in 1648, describes this as the most troublesome business in the tribunals, leading to quarrels, which he hints arose between those honestly endeavouring to discharge their duty, and those who had been bribed. The fiscal is reminded that he must set his face like flint against all efforts to pass a genealogy in which there is a flaw, for the aspirants tempt the officials, there is collusion between them, and forged documents are to be expected. The chief reason, he says, why commissionerships are sought, is because of the opportunities thus afforded, and, writing in Toledo, he declares that all the commissioners and notaries attached to that tribunal are untrustworthy and venial. It was natural that the evils with which this absurd cult of limpieza afflicted the land should arouse opposition and call forth suggestions to mitigate its hardships. The earliest writer who ventured publicly to urge a reform seems to have been Fray Agustin Saludo, a distinguished Dominican theologian. In 1599 he issued a brief tract, pointing out that practically all Spaniards in the course of ages had contracted some more or less infinitesimal impurity of blood, 
and that, unless investigations were limited to some moderate period, such as a hundred years, only the lower orders, whose genealogies were untraceable, could escape the consequences. He tells us that both Pius V and Gregory the Thirteenth drew up briefs prescribing narrow limits to these investigations, but that, on communicating their designs to Philip the Second, discussions arose as to the term, which proved so protracted that the briefs were never published. Philip himself became convinced of the necessity of some limitation, and, towards the close of his reign, he assembled a junta, including Inquisitor-General Porto Carrero, 1596-99, which unanimously agreed to a term of a hundred years, but Philip's death caused the project to be dropped. Salucio's tract was promptly suppressed by Philip III, but it was reprinted in 1637 by Fray Jerónimo de la Cruz with a verbose confutation. Yet, while he indignantly denied the aspersion on the limpieza of the nation, he was fully alive to the misery caused by the current practice, and he urged a limitation of time, placing it at 1492, the year of the expulsion of the Jews. End of Book 4, Chapter 4, Part 2book four chapter four part three of the history of the inquisition of spain volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org this recording by hear his dot com the history of the inquisition of spain volume two by henry charles lear book four organization chapter four Part Three, Limpieza. At length, Philip the Fourth was induced in a pragmatica of February tenth, sixteen twenty-three, to attempt some amelioration of existing conditions. Anonymous communications were to receive no attention, and precision as to dates and persons was required in alleging punishment inflicted by the Inquisition. Witnesses were prohibited to testify as to common rumor, unless they could allege reasons and details. Some tribunals, especially colleges, were so rigorous that they required not only proof of limpieza, but also that no doubts had been expressed, whereby many families had been unjustly defamed through the malice so frequent in these matters, all of which was forbidden for the future." A significant clause pointed out that, in the early days, persons sometimes confessed to matters about which there was no other evidence, and such confessions, unsupported by external proofs, were not to be prejudicial to their descendants. The practice of many persons in compiling books called Libros Verdes, or Del Bercero, fabricated with no greater authority than their own malignity, was condemned because they caused irreparable injury and injustice and disturbance of the public peace, seeing that many persons gave evidence based only on having read such books. Anyone possessing books or papers calling in question the limpieza or nobility of others was therefore commanded to burn them under pain of five hundred ducats and two years of exile. Then, to place some limit on the multiplication of investigations, it was decreed that when there had been tres actos positivos, three positive decisions affirming limpieza or nobility, it should be deemed a proved and settled matter for the party involved and his lineal descendants, not thereafter to be called in question, provided always that the decisions were made with full knowledge of the case by proper tribunals, which were defined to be the Inquisition, the Council of Military Orders, the Order of St. John, the four principal colleges of Salamanca, the two principal ones of Valladolid and Alcala, and the Church of Toledo. Considering the acute perception of existing evils displayed in the preamble to the law, the slender restrictions imposed manifest the strength of the prejudices to be overcome. Slight as they were, the Inquisition and the Council of Military Orders, after nominally accepting the law, 
proceeded vigorously to nullify the provision of the tres actos positivos. A writer in 1629 tells us that they had succeeded in requiring regular investigations in spite of the production of the three acts. They also held that these only related to parents and grandparents, and that they were conclusive only as to the articles covered by them, and not as to the new points that would require fresh examinations, and thus the fees of the officials and the anxieties of the applicants remained undiminished. As regards the character of the testimony received, the secrecy of the procedure renders credible the assertion of Escobar, in his commentary on the law, that there was little, if any, improvement. There was some mitigation of rigor in an order of the Suprema about 1645, that when an applicant could prove the tres actos positivos, it was not necessary to push investigations as to his great-grandparents. Somewhat halting was another rule promulgated in 1639, requiring submissions to the Suprema of matters more than a hundred years old, before rejecting the applicant, but this was withdrawn in 1654. The futility of the system and its unfortunate influence are forcibly set forth by the writer of 1629, who tells us that those who succeed best in their proofs are the poor peasants, whose grandparents have been forgotten, and the great nobles against whom no one dares to testify. The chief sufferers are the lesser nobility and gentlemen, too conspicuous for their ancestry not to be known, and too powerless to exclude adverse witnesses. Everybody knows that he who has friends succeeds, and that he who has enemies fails, irrespective of the truth, and thus the statutes wholly fail of their object. This is facilitated by the secrecy enabling the enemy to produce false witnesses, and the accomplice to bribe and bring forward perjured testimony, so that it is notorious that in no other class of cases are the results so fallacious. In this way, there has been created a sort of factitious nobility, that of limpieza, the processors of which look down with contempt on the old nobility of the land. Another evil of magnitude is the fearful waste of money. He who succeeds, after paying his agents for things too scandalous to be described, finds himself penniless, and he who fails has not enough money left to make another attempt. His proofs are destroyed, and he hangs around the court, wasting his life, and perhaps that of his father and sons, and all this under the ban of being infamous, he and his latest posterity. The damage to men's honors is incredible, and also to the kingdom, for strangers call us all Maranos. Moreover, those whose talents would be of great servants to the state and church are lost to us, for they have not confidence to seek to enter a college, and, what a base cobbler can risk and gain, those who are noble and ambitious fail in, because there may be a single drop of tainted blood in their veins. It is also one of the causes of depopulation, for women enter nunneries and men remain celibates rather than inflict infamy on descendants, while large numbers immigrate. Besides all this are the hatreds arising from adverse testimony and the infinite bribery and collusions and perjury, so that Satan has no greater source of winning souls. It is not required for an archbishop of Toledo, but it is insisted on for the battle of his cathedral. It is not demanded for an inquisitor general, but for the messenger of a tribunal, not for the president of Castile, but for a familiar or purveyor of a college. This is not exaggeration, for it is merely an amplification in detail of the preamble of the Pragmatica of 1623, and is fully borne out by Escobar in his commentary on the law. That, in fact, 
it was the conviction of all sober-minded and thinking men of the period may be gathered from the emphatic testimony of fray benito de peñuelosa though he does not venture to suggest a remedy more radical than restricting the effect of impurity of blood to five generations the effects of this proscription were manifold as early as fifteen seventy five lorenzo peruli the venetian envoy describes the descendants of the conversos as living like other good christians and being among the richest and noblest of the land yet perpetually incapacitated from the honors and employments which were the ambition of every spaniard an evil which was increasing every day thus spain being full of discontented persons and divided in itself some rising would be feared but for the severe execution of justice and the presence of the king in fifteen ninety eight augustino nani repeats the assertion the descendants of all who have at any time been punished by the inquisition live in a state of despair for to the third and fourth generation they are regarded as infamous and incapable of any office in church or state navarrete does not hesitate to suggest that but for the exclusion from public life of all but old christians of purest lineage the fatal necessity of the expulsion of the moriscos might have been averted they might have been christianized had they not been driven to desperation and hatred of religion by the indelible mark of infamy to which they were subjected in fact the statutes of limpieza created a caste of pariahs who infected all with whom they might form alliances but the caste was not recognizable by exterior signs and no one could tell what corruption of blood he might entail upon his family by any marriage that he might contract as fray salucio says no one entering into wedlock could make the investigations required by the colleges and the military orders thus the infection was constantly spreading every man stood upon a mine which might explode at any moment when some distant kinsman of his own or of his wife might provoke an investigation during which a taint might be discovered in the common line of ancestry when we recall the history of the conversos anterior to the sixteenth century and the enormous operations of the early inquisition we can conceive how this indelible stain must have spread throughout society to be revealed at any moment in the most unexpected places a writer in sixteen sixty eight reflects the popular prejudice when he compares a marriage with a man whose father has been penanced by the inquisition to sleeping in a bed full of lice or in sheets that have been used by one who has had the itch another result was greatly to increase the authority of the inquisition and the terror which it shed around it by the fact that at a word it could inflict its undying infamy upon a lineage to be arrested and cast into the secret prison even without cause was sufficient in 1601 philip the third when instructing the inquisition to furnish to the council of military orders full information as to any one when called upon required the report to include not only the imprisonment of an ancestor subsequently acquitted but even the fact of an accusation never acted upon it can readily be understood that even a summons to appear in a matter not of faith was felt acutely through the whole kindred in the long struggle at bilbao over the visites de navios the corregidor mendienta took an active part against the commissioner linguina who to silence him caused him to be cited by the tribunal of logorno this caused intense excitement and the senoria of bisque had him accompanied by two caballeros when he demanded to know the charges against him there were none forthcoming and he was dismissed the affair was regarded as so serious that the council of state presented a consulta 
to the Queen Regent in October 1668, setting forth that the citation might lead to the disgrace of his family and posterity, and suggesting that some relief should be found for him. All this is of supreme importance in estimating the benignity and mercy of which the Inquisition was constantly boasting. The sentences rendered may frequently appear to us as trivial, but the penance was the smallest part of the penalty. Villa Nueva, as we have seen, was condemned merely to abjure for light suspicion of heresy, and to a few years' absence from Madrid, but that cast disgrace upon his whole kindred. He and his descendants fell into a class of pariahs, and could form no alliance outside of that caste. Through generations they were branded with an ineffable stigma. To Spanish Pundador, the scaffold, were merciful in comparison. The mercy of the Inquisition was more to be dreaded than the severity of other tribunals and men might well beware of incurring the enmity of those who could at discretion consign them and their prosperity to infamy. The Limpiesa test survived the revolution, and purity of blood was as essential under the restoration as under the old monarchy, but there was some relaxation of rigidity. Thus, if a man and wife proved their Limpieza, it sufficed for their children, only a legal certificate of baptism being required. And in the same way the proofs presented by one brother answered for another, on his furnishing evidence of their common paternity. A couple of years was also allowed to appointees in which to put in their proofs, and there was even a case of secretaries admitted without proofs, but with a warning that it would not be allowed again. In the extreme penury of the time, the Suprema imposed a fee for its own benefit of sixty reals on every investigation, which the receivers were required to collect and to remit yearly. It was also in receipt of the two per cent, levied by the Disposterios de los Pendientes, and one of its last acts was the acknowledgment, February 10, 1820, of 360 reals remitted by the Diposterio of Sevilla, which would show that 18,000 reals had passed through its hands. The part of the business which fell to the Suprema was not large. Its first certificate is dated January 3, 1816, and the last one, January 4, 1820 the whole number being one hundred and eight. From these investigations, it would appear that the investigation was scarce more than a formality. The demand for limpieza survived the Inquisition, though with its closure it is not easy to conjecture where any serious proofs could be found. Up to 1859 it was still requisite for entrance into the Corps of Cadets, but in 1860 the Cortes unanimously abolished this survival of prejudice and intolerance. Yet there is still a corner of Spain where that prejudice has proved superior to law. We shall have occasion hereafter to refer to the terrible persecution of the Judaizing new Christians of Majorca in 1679 and 1691. Padre Francisco Garau, S.J., who promptly printed an exulting account of the four autos de fe celebrated in the latter year, tells us that the descendants of conversos formed a community of some two hundred families, living huddled together in the calle and apart from the rest of the population, for there never was intermarriage between them and the old Christians. The people called them Jews, and, on their complaining of this, an offensive nickname was speedily invented, and they were termed chulas, an allusion to their avoidance of pork. They were not allowed to hold public office, although great efforts supported by the government were made by the wealthy and influential among them. The same proscription was exercised by the guilds and brotherhoods, especially by the surgeons, confectioners, candle makers, grocers, and silk weavers, so that they were virtually all traders. Thus, 
There was a solid foundation of inveterate prejudice which was stimulated in 1755 by the malicious reprint of Father Garau's book, followed by the circulation of lists furnished by the secretary of the tribunal of all conversos punished by the Inquisition, comprising all the families of Jewish extraction. This caused a recrudience of ill-feeling, and compliment was made to Carlos III, who responded in sedulous of December 10th, 1782, October 9th, 1785, and April 18th, 1788, ordering that they should not be impeded from residing in any part of Palma or of the islands, that the entrance gate of the calle should be destroyed, and that insults or calling them Jews or chulas should be punished with four years of presidio. They were declared fit for service in army or navy or any other department, and free to exercise all arts and trades, and all this was extended to the descendants of conversos throughout Spain. Yet even an autocratic monarch could not overcome prejudices so deep-rooted. Church and state in Majorca had bitterly opposed the appeal to the throne and had succeeded in postponing action for ten years. The university, in 1776, had revived its statute of limpieza and had closed its doors to the proscribed class. When the royal decrees came, they provoked warm opposition on the part of the municipal authorities who resolved not to yield obedience. It was the force of events, rather than the growth of tolerance, that gradually brought relief. In 1808, when the nation rose against the French, they were admitted to military service. But when the local levies were ordered to the mainland, there was a mutiny in which the barrio de Seguel was sacked. After the reaction of the Restoration, under the Revolution of 1820, they were enrolled in the National Guard, but when came the Counter-Revolution of 1823, they were disarmed, and the rabble promptly sacked their houses and made bonfires of what was too cumbrous to steal. After the death of Fernando VII, the enforced constitutionalism of Cristina government restored them practically to citizenship and military service, and gradually their exclusion from civil office disappeared. Popular aversion, however, was not to be overcome by statute. It was rekindled in 1856 by a suit brought to establish their right to membership in the Circulo Bilar, or Bilaric Club, which led to republication of the essential portions of Father Garau's book. This was answered in 1858 by Tomás Beltrán Solier, from whom we learn that the new Christians were still excluded from Christian society and continued to dwell in the calle. They were refused all public offices and admission to guilds and brotherhoods, so that they were confined to trading. They were compelled to marry among themselves, for no one would contract alliance with them nor would the ecclesiastical authorities grant licenses for mixed marriages. Since then, there has been some abatement of popular prejudice, but the latest accessible view of the situation in 1877 by Padre Taroni, a priest of the proscribed class, represents the clergy as still obstinately impervious to all ideas of extending fellowship to their fellow believers and as busily fanning the dying embers of class hatred, based on events two centuries old. Wise statesmanship in Spain would have sought the unification of the races within its borders. In place of this, race hatred was stimulated in the name of religion, with the deplorable results recorded in Spanish history. End of Book 4 Chapter 4 Part 3 this recording by hearhis.com Book 5, Chapter 1, Part 1 of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Guero. 
The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2, by Henry Charles Lee, Book 5, Resources, Chapter 1, Part 1, Confiscation. When the Inquisition was established, it was expected to be not only a self-sustaining institution, but a source of profit. To what extent the anticipation of gain, by seizing the substance of their subjects, may have influenced Ferdinand and Isabella in adopting this method of vindicating the faith, it would be useless now to inquire, but they refused to permit any division of the spoils as in the older papal inquisition of Italy. These were reserved to the crown, and, when the first inquisitors were sent to Seville in 1480, they were accompanied by a receiver of confiscations, a royal official whose appointment shows what were the expectations entertained. Yet the support of the Inquisition had to come out of the product of its labors. The basis of its finances was confiscation, and the use which it made of its powers in this respect, whether for its own benefit or for that of the sovereign exercise so large an influence on the prosperity of spain that it demands a somewhat careful examination spoliation on such a scale continued unremittingly for nearly three centuries was a tremendous burden on the productivity of the most industrious class of the population at the commencement a very large portion of the accessible wealth of spain was in the hands of the jews and conversos by the expulsion of the former and the prosecution of the latter they were stripped of it the marvelous persistence of the new Christians, their tireless activity and business aptitude, kept them incessantly at work making acquisitions which continued to render persecution profitable and contributed to maintain the institution which was laboring with equal persistence for their destruction. It would not be wholly true to assert that the exhaustion of confiscations caused the inertia of the later decades of the Inquisition, but it unquestionably was a contributing factor. The cruelty of confiscation was equal to its effectiveness. To strip a man, perhaps advanced in years, of the results of the labors of a lifetime, and to turn his wife and children penniless on the street, was a severity of infliction which rendered the sparing of his life a doubtful mercy, and it was not without reason that the legis deemed it equivalent to capital punishment. To the persecutor this was a recommendation, in addition to its financial advantages, and we can readily understand why it was enforced with such remorseless perseverance. Confiscation as a punishment for crime was too settled a principle of the imperial jurisprudence for any jurist to call in question its propriety. As heresy was held to be treason to God, more detestable than treason to an earthly prince, the church naturally adopted it as soon as, in the twelfth century, persecution became systematized. In 1163, Alexander the Third, at the Council of Tours, commanded all potentates to seize heretics and confiscate their possessions, and Lucius the Third, in his Verona decree of 1184, sought to divert this to the benefit of the church. Under the Roman law of treason, the property of a traitor was forfeited from the time when he first conceived his crime, and this was applied to the heretic, whose earliest act of heresy was the date from which the fisc claimed his estate, a provision of much importance in the settlement of debts. In Aragon, the introduction of the Inquisition in the 13th century rendered confiscation for heresy a matter of course. In Castile, a more tolerant spirit, as expressed in the laws of Alfonso X, forbade it, so long as there were Catholic heirs or kindred. If there were none, the king inherited, subject to the right of the church, if the culprit were a cleric, to claim it within a year. This code, however, was not confirmed until 1348, by which time scruple had diminished, for Alfonso XI, followed by Henry III, confiscated to the royal treasury one half of the possessions of the convicted heretic it was reserved for ferdinand and isabella tacitly to accept the canon law in all its rigor while diverting to the royal treasury all the proceeds a contemporary asserts that they divided it into thirds one for the war with the moors one for the support of the inquisition and the third for pious uses but there is no trace of such allotment and we shall see that the crown made such use as it pleased of its acquisitions Strictly speaking, the Inquisition did not confiscate, but merely pronounced the culprit guilty of that which implied confiscation, and it seems to have felt some hesitation as to assuming the responsibility. In the earliest trials that have reached us there is no settled formula, either in the demand of the fiscal for punishment or in the sentences, confiscation being sometimes expressed, 
and sometimes inferred, and left for the alcalde to pronounce. The instructions of 1484 are silent as to confiscation in the cases of the living, but in treating of prosecution of the dead they order the heirs to be heard, so that the property may be confiscated and applied to the fisc of the sovereigns, and it is noteworthy that in sentences on the dead, immediately after this the instructions are referred to as though to shield the inquisitor from responsibility. There evidently was popular repugnance to this spoliation, and no one wished to be responsible for it. Ferdinand, in the proclamation of October twenty ninth, fourteen eighty five, declared that the confiscations were made by order of the Pope, in discharge of his conscience and by virtue of his obedience to Holy Mother Church. It was probably owing to his instructions that the tribunals finally assumed the responsibility, as is seen in a sentence of July eighth, fourteen ninety one, in Zaragoza on the deceased juan de la caballeria where the king is ordered in virtue of holy obedience to take the property and hold it as his own apparently all did not acquiesce promptly for we find him in fifteen ten ordering the inquisitor of majorca when pronouncing any one to be a heretic to add at the end of the sentence that he declares the property confiscated and applied to the royal fisc and orders the receiver to take it when the receiver is to do so in virtue of the sentence in accordance with this the official formula adopted bore that the tribunal found the culprit guilty of heresy and as such to have incurred excommunication and the confiscation and loss of all his property which it applied to the royal treasury and to the receiver in the name of the king from the time when he commenced to commit the crime of heresy or if the offender was an ecclesiastic it was applied to whom it lawfully belonged this rather evaded the question whether confiscation was self-acting, but the fe de confiscacion, given by the notary to the judge of confiscations, formally asserts that the inquisitors in ordinary had confiscated the property to the king's treasury, and by the sentence had applied it to his receiver in his name. If any uncertainty remained, it was removed by a carta acordada of 1626, which ordered that, in all cases of formal heresy, the sentence should include confiscation for, if there was to be any mitigation, the granting of such grace belonged to the inquisitor-general. The anterior date to which the confiscation operated was determined under the instructions of 1561 by the consulta de fe when voting on the sentence. The phrase, in the case of ecclesiastics, of adjudging the property to whom it legally belonged was a recognition of the claims of the Church. What these were seems to have been open to question. Under the partidas the Church had the right, if it put forward the demand within a year, but Ferdinand, in a letter of March eleventh, 1498, says he is told that he has a right to a third in such cases. Whence this was derived we are not told but he established the rule and it remained in force as late as fifteen fifty nine when two-thirds of the estate of dr agustin casalla passed to the bishop of palencia who however transferred it back to the inquisition this was probably a compromise for the inquisition had asserted its right to the whole and bishop simancas in fifteen fifty two had said that many hold that the property of clerics goes to the bishop but the truer opinion which had always been followed in spain was that it belongs to the fisc for the use of the inquisition the question however was not definitely settled for in fifteen sixty eight the suprema called upon all the tribunals to report without delay what was their practice and what was their formula of sentence it was inevitable that any doubts should eventually be construed in favor of the holy office and in the seventeenth century the authorities assume as a matter of course that the confiscations of clerics inure to the tribunals although the sentence still attributed them to whom they lawfully pertained forfeited benefices of heretics however were a papal perquisite by decree of paul the fourth june eighteenth fifteen fifty six and this is cited about sixteen forty as still in force in spain for a while the confiscations were subject to another diversion the feudal lords who saw the property of their vassals swept into the royal maelstrom grew restless and although they do not seem to have put forth any legal claim ferdinand in many cases deemed it wise to pacify them with a grant of one-third of the confiscations made in their estates the earliest grant of the kind that i have happened to meet is to the infante enrique duke of segorbe april twentieth fourteen ninety one 
these grants were subject to a deduction for the expenses of the trials which led to a good deal of friction as none of the parties concerned were over scrupulous if the grantee quarrelled with the receiver over the question of expenses he had a fashion when the customary auction of the property was held of announcing that he desired to bid and that nobody should bid against him by this device the duke of bejar enforced a settlement in fifteen fourteen and again in fifteen seventeen the experience of the duke del infantado shows how skilful were the officials in neutralizing these grants in fifteen fifteen he obtained a grant of one half of confiscations up to that time and one third for the future subject to expenses disputes arose as a matter of course and in fifteen nineteen he prevented auction sales till he should be paid and in fifteen twenty he compromised for two hundred ducats in settlement of claims up to that time and ten per cent for the future free of expenses it is safe to say that jimenez was exposed to no such trouble in his settlements but with his enormous revenues and his position as inquisitor-general it would have better comported with his dignity to have abstained from procuring in fifteen fifteen a grant of one-third of the confiscations made in his estates and in the casorla lands assigned for the expenses of his table with the gradual weeding out of the wealthier conversos and the increasing expenses of the tribunals the share of the feudal lords doubtless diminished until it was not worth contesting for shortly after this period we cease to hear of this division of the proceeds confiscation as we have seen was one of the invariable penalties of heresy under the canon law the heretic was outside of the church if persistent he was relaxed and burnt if he repented and professed conversion he was reconciled to the church but though he thus escaped death the forfeiture of his property remained reconciliation as a rule inferred confiscation an exception to this was when a term of grace was published usually of thirty or forty days during which those who made full confession of their sins and gave full information about others were received to reconciliation under promise of release from imprisonment and confiscation but subject to public penance and giving as alms such portion of their property as the inquisitors should designate this was an abandonment by the king of the property which had become forfeit through heresy and was confirmed by a formal grant by him to them of what was lawfully his empowering them to sell and convey a good title which otherwise they could not do this did not apply to what the penitent suffered from the crimes of others and thus children so reconciled could not claim estates forfeited by their parents outside of the term of grace there was no escape espontaneados those coming forward spontaneously after its expiration had already forfeited all their possessions and as it was explained it was not the intention of the sovereigns to remit the penalty to them save when in special cases they might exercise clemency this covetous policy which discouraged the repentant sinner was continued until in fifteen ninety seven the suprema ordered that espontaneados should be reconciled without confiscation yet in spite of this when in sixteen seventy seven alvaro nunez de velasco came forward voluntarily to denounce himself and was reconciled his sentence included confiscation occasional instances are met in which confiscation was spared on account of the extreme youth of the penitent but i have been unable to find any formal rule to that effect and it seems to have been discretional with the tribunal in fifteen o one at barcelona when florencia daughter of manuel de puigrinija was condemned to perpetual prison it is said that her property was spared in view of her tender age in the reconciliation at toledo april twentieth sixteen fifty nine of Ana Pereira, age ten, confiscation was included, and that of Beatriz Jorge, of the same age, December eighth, sixteen fifty nine, there is no allusion to confiscation, and in that of Diego de Castro, age ten, December eighth, sixteen eighty one, it is stated that confiscation is omitted in view of his age. The enforcement of confiscation was a business matter, reduced to a thorough and pitiless system. The sufferers naturally sought to elude it, and every possible means that experience could suggest were adopted to prevent the loss of the minutest fragment. When the accused was arrested, all his visible possessions were simultaneously sequestrated and inventoried. His papers and books of account were examined to ascertain what debts were owing to him. 
and he was at once subjected to an audiencia de hacienda in which he was interrogated under oath in the most searching manner as to all his property his debts and credits his marriage settlement dowries or gifts to his children their estates if they were dead whether he had secreted anything in apprehension of arrest and every detail that the circumstances suggested any failure to answer fully and truly was perjury for which he could be punished as occurred in the case of luis de perlas tried in valencia for lutheranism in fifteen fifty two the most repulsive incident in this perquisition was the advantage taken of the terrors of approaching death when the confessors of those who were to be executed in an auto de fe were employed during the preceding night in exhorting them to reveal any portion of property that might have escaped previous investigations thus june twenty ninth fifteen twenty six fray castel reported that pedro pomar whom he had confessed during the night of the auto de fe estando en el suplicio de la muerte had revealed where certain account books could be found and also some debts due to him so december twenty first fifteen twenty nine anton ruiz under the same circumstances confessed to debts due to him which had eluded previous search this prostitution of religion to the service of greed was exploited to the utmost excommunication was so habitually abused for temporal purposes that it was naturally resorted to and all who concealed or held any property of a convicted heretic were subjected to it in fourteen eighty six ferdinand writes that certain notaries refused to give copies of contracts passed before them relative to obligations due to heretics to which they must be constrained by censures and the invocation if necessary of the secular arm and the same course must be taken with debtors refusing to pay what they owe october seventeenth fifteen hundred he scolds some inquisitors for their negligence those who know that they are suspected commonly hide their property or place it in the hands of third parties and in this way those who hold such property become excommunicated to the great damage of their souls for they continue under the censure and my fisc suffers for the property escapes confiscation in sixteen forty five a writer gives us the form adopted in such cases if the fiscal thought that there was property of a confiscated estate concealed or debts due to it unrevealed the tribunal issued an edict to be read from the pulpits ordering under pain of excommunication every one holding such property or cognizant of facts concerning it to make it known to the commissioner or to the parish priest within three days on the expiration of this term the priests were required to denounce from their pulpits all such persons as excommunicated and to be avoided by all christians then after three days more followed the anathema in its awful solemnities of bell book and candle with the impractory psalm and invoking the wrath of almighty god and the glorious virgin his mother and of the apostles peter and paul and all the saints of heaven and all the plagues of egypt on the wicked ones who were withholding its own from the holy office the spiritual punishment did not exclude temporal in sixteen seventy one manuel fernandez chavez tried in toledo for the occupation of confiscated effects was fined in five hundred ducats and was banished for two years from toledo pastrana and madrid when the concealment was for the benefit of a culprit there was the additional charge of foutership as in the case of gabriel de la sola and joseph lopez de sosa whose secreted property of the latter's sister beatriz and whose trial in sixteen ninety seven in valladolid lasted for two years more effective at least in the earlier period when the press of business rendered minute investigation difficult was the offer of heavy commissions to those who would furnish information as to confiscated property that had escaped the search of the receivers this resulted in creating a gang of professional detectives and informers of whom a certain pedro de madrid the later may be taken as the type under a provision of fourteen ninety he was entitled to one-third of all the hidden property that he might discover whether alienated or conveyed under other names or otherwise concealed in fourteen ninety four he complained that this was not enough in view of his heavy expenses travelling to france sharing with other informers etc whereupon ferdinand agreed to give him one half and moreover to those who should furnish information he pardoned the offence committed by their knowing without revealing the inquisitors were to remove the excommunication and all receivers were to comply with these instructions under penalty of a thousand florins ferdinand however did not always play fair with these gentry under the stimulus of his fifty per cent 
Pedro worked hard and successfully, but when in 1499 the account of a receiver who had settled with him came in for audit, Ferdinand ordered the payments to be disallowed for the present. Pedro ought not to have such large sums. His success was attributable to the negligence of the receiver rather than to his own activity, and in fact it was a voluntary gift to him. A year later we find Ferdinand agreeing to let him have one half of thirty libras that he had discovered, and promising to determine what share he should have when other properties unearthed by him should be settled. The frequent allusions to these transactions in Ferdinand's correspondence show what an active business it was, both with professionals and volunteers, and Ferdinand was sometimes liberal in rewarding the zeal of the latter, as when, in 1501, he made a gift to Don Antonio Cortes, his sacristan mayor, of a house and an oil warehouse in Seville, which Cortes had discovered to be the property of Beatriz Fernández, condemned to perpetual imprisonment which had escaped the receiver. This indicates that men of standing did not disdain to engage in this disreputable business, and it would seem that Juan de Anchias, the secretary of the Saragossa Tribunal, to whom we owe the Libro Verde, gave up his office to speculate in it, for in 1509 we find him complaining that the receiver refused to pay him the one-third which he had been promised on certain discoveries, and Ferdinand ordering the bargain to be carried out. There was no settled rate of commissions. About this same time, Clement Roderes of Barcelona was only allowed one-seventh of the property recovered through his investigations, while the Mallorca tribunal was authorized to offer twenty-five per cent., and when the case seemed desperate in 1514, Juan Martinez was encouraged by a promise of 50% to devote himself to looking up the concealments of Teruel and Albarracin, which were understood to be large. While doubtless the fisc, by thus stimulating detectives, recovered property which might otherwise have escaped, the system was one which invited collusion between them and the officials. Frauds of this kind were probably not uncommon, for in 1525 the Suprema complained of the abuses that had sprung up through the disregard by the receivers of their instructions. These were to be strictly observed, and in future commissions must be paid only on property of which nothing had been known to the officials, and the informer must not be an official whose knowledge had been acquired in the discharge of his duties. Moreover, the compensation was strictly limited to 20% of the amount realized through the information furnished. This is the latest allusion that I have met with to this phase of the business. It evidently diminished with the falling off in the confiscations, though doubtless special transactions continued to occur, for it was inevitable that the victims should exhaust their ingenuity in the effort to save for their children some fragments of their possessions. Cruel as was confiscation in principle, its enforcement by the older papal inquisition was iniquitous to a degree which multiplied to the utmost its cruelty and power of evil the forfeiture of property from the time when the first act of heresy had been committed was construed to invalidate all subsequent acts of the heretic for he had lost his dominion over all his possessions all alienations thus were void all debts contracted and all obligations given were invalid and the prescription of time against the church had to be at least forty years possession by undoubted catholics ignorant of the former owner's heresy prosecutions of the dead moreover for which there was no limit carried back to previous generations the claim of the inquisition to upset titles thus in practice when a man was adjudged a heretic all debts due to him were rigorously collected while all due by him were cancelled and all real estate that he had sold was reclaimed the only mitigation of this was a declaration by Innocent the Fourth in 1247, giving to a Catholic wife, under certain conditions, a life interest in her dowry, expiring at her death for her children were incapable of inheritance. It is pleasant to be able to say that, in time, some of the worst features of this all-grasping rapacity were softened in the Spanish Inquisition. Its early operations were so extensive, and the commerce of the land was so largely in the hands of the new Christians, that we can readily imagine the general consternation aroused by the strict enforcement of the canon laws, which vitiated all alienations and stripped all creditors of their claims. It could lead only to widespread ruin and general paralysis of trade, and there doubtless arose a cry for relief which the sovereigns could not disregard. With a wise liberality, therefore, 
they consented to a partial abandonment of their claims which is set forth in the instructions of fourteen eighty four in a manner showing how fully they knew what were their rights the clause recites that they could recover all alienations and refuse to pay all debts unless the proceeds could be identified among the effects of the confiscated estate whether of those condemned or of those reconciled outside of the term of grace but out of clemency and to avoid oppression of vassals who had dealt with heretics they ordered that all sales donations exchanges and contracts prior to the year fourteen seventy nine should be valid if duly proved to be genuine attempts to take fraudulent advantage of this were declared punishable and reconciled heretics with a hundred lashes and branding in the face with a hot iron in christians with confiscation deprivation of office and penalties at the royal discretion while there was substantial relief in this abandonment of the right to upset all transactions prior to the introduction of the inquisition yet it was retained with regard to all subsequent dealings and no man could know whether the banker or merchant or tradesman with whom he dealt might not soon fall into the hands of the holy office it thus can readily be conceived how fatally credit was affected and what risks were encountered in the daily transactions of business that there was difficulty in making the tribunals respect even this concession is visible in its promulgation anew by the suprema in fourteen ninety one and again in fifteen o two cases in fact occur which show that the officials paid slender attention to it thus in fourteen ninety nine costanza ramirez appealed to ferdinand for property comprised in the dowry given to her mother in fourteen seventy five by her grandfather juan lopez beltran whose estate had been recently declared confiscated and the king ordered its restoration if the statement was true so in fifteen o nine the widow and wards of johan perez de oliva petitioned him for the release of certain houses which oliva had bought in fourteen seventy four and which were now claimed as having been purchased from a condemned heretic here was a perfectly legitimate transaction thirty-five years old which the inquisition was endeavoring to set aside in the instructions of fourteen eighty four prosecutions against the dead including confiscation were ordered even if they had died forty or fifty years before as it stands in the printed collections this virtually postponed indefinitely the prescription against the inquisition as the transactions of the deceased might have extended anteriorly through forty or fifty years and in fact it was quoted about sixteen forty as a proof that there was no prescription this however was a later additional severity for in a manuscript copy of the instructions of fourteen eighty four there is a clause omitted by the official compilers to the effect that if the heretic had died more than fifty years before the accusation was brought and if the heirs or owners of the property had been good catholics and had held it in good faith they were not to be disturbed there is significance in the suppression and under such a system it is conceivable what a cloud hung over the titles of all property that had ever passed through the hands of a new christian and how poignant was the feeling of insecurity of its possessors end of book five chapter one part one recording by guero book five chapter one part two of the history of the inquisition of spain volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by guero the history of the inquisition of spain volume two by henry charles lee book five resources chapter one part two confiscation in the struggle made by the kingdoms of aragon against the oppression of the inquisition the iniquities of confiscation were prominent they were illustrated in the cortes of monzon in fifteen twelve by a special grievance which illustrates the working of the system the local government had borrowed money and secured it by a censo or obligation given to maestro miro and juan bertran who were condemned for heresy, and the censo was demanded. The authorities showed that the censo had been paid off, and the debt cancelled twenty-nine years before, but the receiver insisted on their paying it again, because the heretical acts of Miro and Bertrand were anterior, 
and their release of the censo was therefore invalid. They petitioned Ferdinand for relief, but he contented himself with ordering that they should not be unduly oppressed, which left the matter open. Still, one of the concessions granted in 1512 was that prescription of time should be reduced to thirty years. This was confirmed in Mercader's instructions of 1514, and when, in 1515, the Catalans complained of its inobservance, Ferdinand ordered it to be maintained. Leo X went even further in his bull of 1516, confirming the Concordia of 1512, and, in that of 1520, this was defined as protecting from confiscation all property acquired in good faith from those not publicly noted for heresy, even though they should subsequently be condemned, and the prescription of thirty years had not expired. This was declared applicable to all pending cases, and, to render it more emphatic, Charles V made a formal grant of all such property to the holders. We have seen, however, how completely the Inquisition ignored this settlement, denying its authority and even its existence. Castile was no more successful, for when the Cortes of 1534 petitioned that possession for three years in the hands of Catholics should confer immunity from confiscation, and that dowries of Catholic wives should be exempt, Charles flatly refused both requests. Finally the question settled itself in the canonical prescription of forty years undisturbed possession by Orthodox Catholics, for this is what Simancas informs us was the rule. The old instructions requiring longer possession, he says, had been abrogated, and although some authorities argued that five years sufficed, or at most twenty, these were not recognized by the tribunals. How business adjusted itself to the risks attending all transactions with new Christians, we can only conjecture. In one important respect, the Inquisition mitigated the iniquitous harshness of the older institution by recognizing the claims of the creditors of the condemned heretic. This, however, was not the case at first, and it would not be easy to exaggerate the general confusion and distress when it came to be understood that confiscation included the debits as well as the credits of the victims. The early extensive arrests were followed by the wholesale flight of those who felt themselves under suspicion. Flight was regarded as confession, and the fugitives were condemned in absentia as soon as the necessary formalities could be dispatched. The losses of the consequent confiscation of debits fell not only on individuals connected with their extensive transactions, but on the public bodies and ecclesiastical establishments, the collection of whose revenues was largely in their hands. The conditions thus created are impressively reflected in the records of Jerez de la Frontera, where the municipal taxes were largely farmed to conversos, who had fled. The public funds had been in their hands, and they were naturally in debt to the town as well as to churches and private persons. It would appear that all these obligations were calmly ignored by the Inquisition, and the municipality appealed to the sovereigns who replied, December 6, 1481, that the matter had been referred to the licenciado Ferran Janes de Lobon, the very commissioner who, for about a year, had been busy in enforcing the collections of the confiscations. This boded ill for relief. The documents do not reveal the outcome, but as all the efforts of the authorities only brought them in contact with the officials engaged in gathering the spoils, it is evident that the sovereigns did not propose to abandon their rights. We have seen that the instructions of 1484-5, to five, when recognizing the validity of transactions anterior to 1479, asserted absolutely the right of the fisc to refuse payment of debts, and made no concessions as to those contracted subsequently to that period. At the same time, a clause concerning claims made by nobles who had received fugitives in their lands shows that the Inquisition felt the matter to be within its discretion. The earliest positive admission that I have met of an obligation to pay debts due by a confiscated estate is an order by Ferdinand, May 12, 1486, to Alfonso de Mesa, receiver at Teruel, that wages due in good faith by heretics to their Moorish servants are to be paid. But this may perhaps be attributable to the special preference allowed to servants' wages by the laws of Aragon. Various contradictory decisions illustrate the uncertainty hanging over the matter at this time, 
and it is clearly manifested by two letters of Ferdinand, evidently drawn up for him by his unscrupulous secretary Calcena. The first of these, March 6, 1498, relates to the Castillo de Calaña, which Calcena had obtained from the confiscated estate of Johann Benete, and against which certain parties held censos, ground rents, and other claims. The king is made to order the receiver to suspend action, because the debts had been contracted after Benete had committed acts of heresy. The other letter, March 11, 1498, reiterates an order of August 29, 1497, to a receiver to pay out of the sequestrated property of Antonicones a hundred ducats, which Calcena had lent him, and to pay him before any other creditors. By this time, however, the claims of creditors were beginning to be officially recognized. The instructions of 1498 give detailed orders as to surrendering property belonging to others, and promptly paying debts clearly due out of sequestrated estates, and, when confiscation was pronounced, a proclamation was to be made to all claimants to present their claims within a designated time, which in 1499 was fixed at thirty days, while no property was to be sold until the claims against it had been determined. Yet in spite of this, the rights of creditors were admitted with difficulty by the receivers, and numerous instances occur in which they were obliged to appeal to Ferdinand. As late as 1515, Margarita D'Artes, wife of Dr. Francisco D'Artes, assessor of the Valencia Tribunal, complained that in 1499 she had bought a censo, secured on a house of Aldonza Cocarredes. Aldonza had now been relaxed, and Aliaga, the receiver, refused to recognize the censo, because it had been created after she had committed heresy. Ferdinand admitted the validity of this argument, and said that, in the rigor of justice, she had lost her claim, but in view of the fact that her husband had been in the service of the Inquisition since its foundation, he ordered it paid as a favor. An examination of the records of the Valencia Court of Confiscations, in 1531 and 1532, evinces on the whole an evident desire to administer the law rigidly, whether in favor of or against the fisc. Among the claimants were a number of serving women for wages, which were always allowed, although the court exercised somewhat arbitrary discretion in cutting down the amounts. Gradually the honest policy prevailed, and in 1543 the Suprema instructed the tribunals that the first thing to be paid were the debts that were properly proved, a rule which apparently was difficult to enforce, for the order had to be repeated in 1546 and again in 1547. Yet it was no easy matter for creditors to obtain payment against the resistance offered by receivers and their advocates. In 1565, after Fierre and Gilles de Bonville were burnt for Protestantism in Toledo, the fiscal reported to the inquisitors that numerous creditors had come forward whose claims were pending before the juez de los bienes, wherefore he asked for a certificate as to the date of the culprit's heresies, in order to use it before the court. The inquisitors duly certified that the date was about 1550, the object being to plead the obsolete canonical rule that subsequent obligations were invalid that chicanery of all kinds was employed to exhaust the patience of creditors and accumulate costs is plainly admitted in the memorial of sixteen twenty three to the suprema which states that in the suits of creditors there is much that brings discredit on the inquisition for confiscations are managed solely for the benefit of those who administer them the appointees of the juez de los bienes and ordinarily his kinsmen or friends for whose advantage the suits are prolonged until they become immortal abuses such as these were inevitable in a system which confined everything within the circle of the inquisition permitting no outside interference or supervision while dealing so tenderly with official malfeasance it would be difficult to overestimate the widespread damage resulting when the accused were merchants with extensive and complicated transactions, as in the immense confiscations in Mexico and Peru from 1630 to 1650, and those of Mallorca in 1678, when funds and merchandise of correspondence were tied up for an indefinite time to the destruction of their credit. The hazards to which business was thus exposed was a factor 
and by no means the least important in the decay of Spanish commerce, for no one could foresee at what moment the blow might fall. Sequestration accompanied arrest, and in 1635 it was ordered that, during the pending of a trial, no payments or delivery of property should be made to creditors, no matter what evidence they presented, without awaiting the decision of the Suprema, the only exception being claims of the king, which were to be paid without delay. In 1721 this prohibition to pay debts was made absolute, excepting a few trivial matters such as servants' wages and house rent. That foreigners dealing with Spain had ample cause to dread the decisions of the juez de los bienes is shown by a remarkable clause in the English treaty of 1665, which provided that, in case of sequestration of property by any tribunal of either nation, the effects or debts belonging to a subject of the other should not suffer confiscation, but should be restored to the owner. On the whole, however, the Spanish Inquisition is entitled to the credit of mitigating, in favor of creditors, the abhorrent harshness of the inquisitorial law of confiscation, although in practice its officials were guilty of minimizing, as far as they could, the benefits of this moderation. In the matter of dowries there was also a partial mitigation of the old severity. The dowry was forfeited by the wife's heresy, but not by that of the husband, and in the latter case it descended to her children. There was one provision, however, which worked infinite hardship, for if the parents of the wife had been guilty of heresy at the time of her marriage, it was forfeited on the ground that all their property then belonged to the fisc, and they had no power of alienation. The cases are numerous in which the parties, after prolonged married life, thus suddenly found themselves despoiled by the condemnation of parents who had enjoyed the reputation of faithful Christians, and, in the intermarriages so frequent in the earlier period, the blow thus often fell upon old Christians. We hear of these cases through despairing appeals to Ferdinand for mercy, appeals to which he not infrequently responded by abandoning his claims or surrendering a part. A typical case illustrative of many others, is that of Juan Quirat, a Belche, whose petition to the king, in 1513, represents that, twenty-five years before, he had married Violante Propinan, receiving ten thousand sueldos as her dowry from her parents, Luis and Blanca. Eight years ago they were condemned, and now the receiver claims the dowry. He is a poor escudero, or squire, and the enforcement of the claim would send him with his wife and children to the hospital, in view of all which Ferdinand charitably waived his right. More peculiar was the case of Juan Castellón of Mallorca, who, when trading in Tunis, was enslaved by a brother of Barbarossa. After forty-two months of captivity, he was ransomed for four hundred ducats, and returned home in 1520, to find that his wife's mother, Isabel Luna, had been condemned, and the dowry received from her was claimed by the receiver. He petitioned Cardinal Adrian. The matter was referred to Charles V, who humanely ordered that, if his story was true, and he was unable to pay, the confiscation should be remitted. The hardship was sometimes aggravated by an ostentatious custom of inserting in the marriage contract a larger sum than was actually paid. Thus, in 1531, the magnifico Diego de Montemayor, baile of the Grau of Valencia, swore that he received only three thousand sueldos of the six thousand specified in his marriage contract with Beatriz Scrivana in 1510, and that the larger sum had been inserted honoris causa. The dowries of nuns were subject to the same merciless absorption. In 1510, the convent of Santa Ines of Cordova appealed to Ferdinand, stating that, some twenty years previous, Pedro Sigero had placed his niece there as a nun, giving as her dowry certain houses which it had peacefully enjoyed until her grandfather had recently been condemned for heresy, and the property was seized as part of his confiscated estate. This was strictly legal, and it was a pure act of grace when the king ordered the houses to be released. Still, the dowry of an orthodox wife was exempt from the confiscation of a heretic husband's estate, 
but it was imperiled by the possibility that the estate might be exhausted in the maintenance of the husband in prison during a prolonged trial and by the sacrifice of values in the realization of assets at auction which was imperative in the proceedings of the juzgado de bienes of valencia in 1531 there are numerous cases which show that this claim of the wife was fully recognized and a fair adjudication made in the complicated questions which frequently arose correlative to this was the liability of the husband to pay the fisc the dowry of a wife condemned or reconciled for heresy how pitilessly in time this was exacted is manifested in 1549 by a petitioned Valdés from Don Pedro Gascón, who represents himself as an Hidalgo, whose ancestors had served the king faithfully. The judge of confiscations at Cuenca had condemned him in a hundred and fifty ducats for the dowry of his wife, and the receiver had cast him in prison to enforce payment. While there he had sold a large part of his property, and had paid fifty ducats, but the rest of his estate would not produce the remaining hundred. Ferdinand would have forgiven him the balance, but Valdés only looked to obtaining assurance of ultimate payment, when he empowered the receiver to grant him six years' time on his furnishing good security. Another feature, which frequently complicated these settlements, was the question of the conquest, the ganancias or cres the gains made during married life in which both spouses had an equal share the laws of toro in 1505 provide that neither husband nor wife could forfeit claim to half the ganancias for the crime of the other even if the crime were heresy and the ganancia is defined to be the whole increase during wedlock until the decree of confiscation no matter when the crime was committed a rule which remained in force the complexity introduced by these various interests in the settlement of confiscations is illustrated in the case of Diego Lopez, a merchant of Zamora, reconciled in the Auto de Fe of Valladolid, in June 1520. He kept no books, and the number of debits and credits rendered his affairs exceedingly complicated. Moreover, the paternal estate had never been divided between him and his brothers, while his wife put in claims for her dowry and share of the ganancias. In this perplexity, the only solution was a compromise, which was reached by the wife and brothers agreeing to pay 450,000 maravedis in installments, giving adequate security. The Valencia Court of Confiscations, however, invented a method of evading the wifely claim to the accretions, for, in 1532, when Ángela Pérez, widow of Luis Gilabert, burnt for heresy, demanded her dowry of three thousand sueldos, and the cres, the court ordered the receiver to pay the dowry, but refused the cres, on the ground that the date of his committing heresy showed that he could not lawfully make any gains. The exemption from confiscation of those who came in under the Edicts of Grace, confessed and were reconciled, gave rise to an impressive illustration of the passionate greed aroused among all classes by the legalized spoliation of the new Christians and the corollary that they had no rights. Prelates and chapters of churches, abbots and priors of convents, rectors of hospitals and pious institutions, and other ecclesiastics and laymen, who had mortgaged their properties to the heretics, or had sold ground rents to them, or otherwise hypothecated them, repudiated their engagements, and would render no satisfaction, whereby we are told, many were deterred from seeking reconciliation. A more practical objection was that those who were thus despoiled were hindered in paying the heavy fines laid upon them by the inquisitors. Ferdinand and Isabella, therefore, applied to Innocent the Eighth for a remedy which he furnished in 1486 by a brief in which, after reciting the above, he granted to those thus reconciled the mortgages and censos and other liens which they held on properties, forbidding the debtors from claiming release and pronouncing invalid any judgments which they might obtain. While thus the Spanish Inquisition, in some respects, dealt more liberally than its medieval predecessor with the unfortunates subjected to its operations, it was ruthlessly systematic in its absorption of everything that was not covered by the above exceptions. 
It was in vain that, in 1486, Innocent the Eighth, probably induced by the gold of the conversos, represented to the sovereigns that, as the confiscations had been conceded to them, it would stimulate the penitents to be firm in the faith if their property was restored to those who were reconciled. It was much more profitable for greed to disguise itself as zeal for religion, as when in 1533, at the Cortes of Monzon, Valencia petitioned that an exemption from confiscation granted to the forcibly converted moriscos should be extended to their children, and the Suprema replied that confiscation was the penalty most dreaded, and that which most deterred from heresy, as for relying on the terror of burning as a preventive, the fact was that the church received to reconciliation all who repented, and if they were not punished with confiscation, they would enjoy immunity. In the same spirit, Bishop Simancas argued that it was for the public benefit that the children of heretics should be beggared, and therefore the old laws which allowed Catholic children to inherit had justly been abrogated. This heartless remark indicates that, by the middle of the sixteenth century, there was no compassion for the helpless offspring, that at first there was some responsibility felt for them, possibly through a reminiscence of the old laws. The instructions of 1484 provide that, when the children of those condemned to the stake or to perpetual prison are under age and unmarried, they were to be given to respectable Catholics or to religious, to be brought up in the faith, and a record of such cases was to be kept, for it was the intention of the sovereigns that if they proved to be good Christians, they should have alms, especially the girls, to enable them to marry or to enter religion. There is no trace of any systematic attempt to carry out this humane provision, but when cases of special hardship were called to Ferdinand's attention, he occasionally was moved to make liberal concessions. When, however, in 1486, the inquisitors of Saragossa asked for authority to grant relief to some poor culprits, not very guilty, who were encumbered with daughters likely to be forced to evil courses, the canny monarch evidently distrusted this sudden access of benevolence, and, while approving the kindliness of the suggestion, he said that he was better acquainted than they with the people of Saragossa, and less likely to be deceived, so they could send him the names of the parties, their properties, and the number of their daughters, when he would determine what should be done. It was evidently a question only of kindly impulses. There was no obligation, moral or legal, and as the wants of the holy office grew more urgent in the shrinkage of the stream of confiscations, inquisitors like Simancas argued that the service of God required the sacrifice of the innocents. In practice, everything on which the officials could lay their hands under any pretext was swept remorselessly into the fisc. Even the bedding and clothes of those led out to execution at the autos de fe were seized as appears from occasional donations of them to officials. When in 1495 Charles the Eighth occupied Naples, it became a place of refuge for fugitives from Spain. But the pious skippers of the vessels carrying them not infrequently served God by stripping their defenseless passengers and carrying home the spoils. This was an invasion of the rights of the crown, which vindicated itself by sending to Biscay and Guipuzcoa Anton Sanchez de Aguirre to search for the jewels and merchandise thus taken from heretics and sell them for the benefit of the fisc. In 1513, when Jaime de Marrana, scrivener of the court of Segorbe, was condemned, all his subordinates were called upon to surrender the fees which they had received during his term of office. A dying man could not make even a pious bequest if his natural heir was a heretic, for when, in 1514, Nicolas de Medina, a merchant of Seville, returning from France, died at Bayonne in the Hôpital du Saint-Esprit, and bequeathed to it a bill of exchange for a hundred and twenty-six ducats, the procurator of the hospital came to Seville to collect it. Vijasis, the receiver there, promptly sequestrated it on the ground that Medina's heir, Rodrigo de Córdoba, had been condemned for heresy, and although the Suprema finally released it, this was done as an act of charity to the hospital. 
The same rule applied when there was heresy in the ascendants. Juan Francisco Vitalis, a native of Majorca, was settled in Rome as a merchant. He desired to trade with Spain, but feared to do so, for his father and grandfather had been condemned for heresy, and any merchandise or funds that he might send would be liable to confiscation as constructively derived from them. He therefore, in 1511, applied for a safe conduct for his goods, which Ferdinand issued, exempting them from seizure by the Inquisition. It was good, however, only during the royal pleasure, and for six months after its withdrawal should be notified to Vitalis, or be publicly proclaimed in Valencia. Heresy shed around it an infection which contaminated everything with which it came in contact. Not only was a ship carrying heretics forfeited, but also its cargo. In 1501, Vicencio de Landera, a merchant of Gaeta, shipped some cotton by a Biscayan vessel for Alicante. On her arrival, the receiver seized the cargo, because she carried two persons condemned by the Inquisition. But the Bishop of Gaeta, head chaplain to Ferdinand's sister, the Queen of Naples, brought influence to bear and the king ordered Landera to be paid the proceeds of his cotton. Apparently the other owners of the cargo had no redress. Ferdinand was more obdurate. In 1511, when a ship and its cargo were condemned in Seville for carrying heretics, this included a quantity of pepper belonging to a Portuguese merchant named Juan Francisco. King Manuel interposed to protect his subject. When Ferdinand replied that he had ordered justice done, but that the Inquisition had represented that Francisco had bought the pepper from King Manuel, and had paid for it with bills of exchange drawn by heretics, and thus with heretic money, which was held to forfeit the pepper. This policy was not merely transient. In 1634 the Inquisition seized the goods and credits of Portuguese merchants, residents of Holland, Hamburg, and France, trading with Spain. Agents had been sent abroad to secure evidence of their Judaism. They naturally sought to defend their property and presented certificates of their orthodoxy. The affair dragged on, and, in 1636, Dr. Juan de Goza presented an elaborate opinion in justification of this, proving that the property must be confiscated, although the owners were not Spaniards, nor domiciled in Spain, nor had committed heresy in Spain. His argument was based on the principle of the canon law that the heretic had no rights, and that any Catholic could seize and despoil him. Heresy is a crime all-pervading, and not limited to the spot where it is committed, for it is an injury to the whole Christian republic. No evidence was required, for it was notorious that the Portuguese absented themselves in order to indulge their heretical proclivities, and that they frequented the synagogues in Amsterdam and elsewhere. The Inquisition was to hold the property, and for greater justification, to summon by edict the owners to appear and defend it within a fixed term, or it could appoint defenders to act for them. But in no case was it to raise the sequestration, or surrender the property. It is superfluous to point out the effect of all this on Spanish commerce. As regards property alienated subsequently to the commission of heresy, the only limitation on its confiscation is found in the provision prohibiting interference with transactions anterior to 1479. All later ones were subject to forfeiture without compensation to the purchaser, unless, indeed, he had made improvements, the value of which was reimbursed to him. The frequency of these cases, and the hardship to which they exposed innocent third parties, are amply illustrated by the numerous appeals to Ferdinand for relief, which, be it said to his credit, he often granted. The cloud thus thrown on the title to all property that had passed through the hands of new Christians, at any time subsequent to 1479, continued to hang over it, and the Inquisition grew stricter in the interpretation of its rights. A letter of May 6, 1539, from the Suprema to the Inquisitor of Saragossa, says that he is reported to have decided that when a person is condemned or reconciled with confiscation, 
and has alienated real property subsequently to the commission of heresy, if the purchaser is required to surrender it to the fisc, he is entitled to reimbursement of the purchase money. The inquisitor is therefore summoned to state his authority for this decision, as law and custom are to the contrary, and it is so practiced. This was peremptory, and it is not likely that the question was raised again, although it took no count of the rule, which Simancas soon afterwards tells us was still in vigor, that if the purchase money, or what represents it, is found in the confiscated estate, restitution should be made to the purchaser. The Spanish Inquisition preferred to both keep the money and take the property. Ferdinand and Isabella manifested liberality in setting free the Christian slaves of confiscated estates, and this was extended by the instructions of 1484 at the cost of those reconciled under Edicts of Grace, for though they were not subject to confiscation, their Christian slaves were manumitted. It was, perhaps, a kindly care that kept these freedmen in a species of serfdom, for instructions about 1500 direct the inquisitors to place them with proper persons under agreements as to wages, and if they are not reasonably treated, to transfer them to other masters. Embarrassing cases sometimes arose, such as that in which a slave was owned jointly by a good Catholic and a condemned heretic, but it would seem, from a decision in 1531, that the manumitted half carried with it into freedom the enslaved half, and the Catholic owner had no redress. The inquisitors did not always respond to the humane intentions of the instructions. They seemed to have sometimes kept slaves for themselves, in place of setting them free, for which in 1516 they were rebuked, and were also ordered that, during the trials of the owners, the slaves should be hired out and their wages be strictly accounted for, all of which points to current abuses. These did not cease, for in 1525 Dr. Mercader, in a visitation of Sicily, found similar ones flourishing. While thus considerate of the slaves of culprits, confiscation seems sometimes to have extended to the persons of the culprits themselves. One of the few letters concerning the Inquisition, in which Isabella joins with Ferdinand, is of December 28, 1498, addressed to the Count of Cifuentes, Governor of Seville, ordering him, for the service of God and good execution of justice, to take all the Jews condemned for heresy, now held as prisoners by the abbot of San Pedro, and sell them as slaves at such prices as he deems fit the proceeds to be handed over to the receiver, and be applied to the debts and necessities of the tribunal. An intimation of a similar kind is made, November 6, 1500, respecting Maestre Luis Carpano of Antequera and his wife, who are described as confiscated to the royal fisc with all their property, real and personal. End of Book 5, Chapter 1, Part 2 Recording by Guero Book Five, Chapter One, Part Three of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Guero. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two, by Henry Charles Lee. Book Five, Resources. Chapter 1, Part 3, Confiscation In the rigor of collection, debtors to the confiscated estates, who were unable to pay, were imprisoned without mercy. Thus, in 1490, the judge of confiscations at Segovia orders the alguacil to seize the lands and goods and money of Don Mose de Cuellar, who was indebted in the sum of 393,000 maravedis to the late Gonzalo de Cuellar, regidor of Buitrago, burnt for heresy. If he cannot find property enough to satisfy the debt, he is to seize the person of Don Mose and confine him in the public prison of Segovia. It was the same with husbands who were liable for the dowries of their wives, 
as we have seen in the case of Don Pedro Gascon, page 334. Forbearance, however, was sometimes found to be better policy. In 1509, Sancho Martinez of Egin was sentenced to pay 50,000 maravedis for the dowry of his wife, whose parents had been reconciled. He pleaded poverty to the Suprema, which ordered that, if his property was insufficient, he should not be imprisoned, and that, at the auction of his effects, he should be allowed to purchase to the amount of 10,000 or 12,000 maravedis on a year's credit. The event showed the wisdom of the arrangement. The auction realized 17,000. He was the purchaser, and paid for it at the expiration of the year. He accumulated, as the years went by, 100,000 maravedis, and the judge ordered execution on him for the 33,000 still due on the dowry. Again he appealed to the Suprema, some members of which doubted whether his subsequent acquisitions were liable, and the matter was compromised, July 5th, 1519, by ordering him to pay half the deficiency. These instances are not without interest as illustrations of the matter in which this gigantic spoliation was effected through more than a couple of centuries. The elaborate system adopted is revealed to us in the records of the Valencia Court of Confiscations in 1530 and 1531. When an arrest was made with sequestration, the receiver opened an account in his Libro de Manifestaciones, in which the notary of sequestrations entered all the items of the inventory. Then followed the Audiencia de Hacienda and the summons to debtors, to declare their obligations which were likewise entered. If the prisoner was engaged in trade, his books were examined and all debts were duly placed in the same record. Information of all kinds was diligently sought, and no matter how vague and worthless, was similarly recorded. Much of this was obtained from prisoners, who testified to gossip heard from cell companions in the dreary hours of prolonged confinement. Thus, July ninth, fifteen twenty seven, Violante Salvador testified that Leonor Bonin told her that Angela Parda, when arrested, had entrusted certain small coins to Leonor Mandresa. Angela Parda and Leonor Bonin were both burnt, and Violante Salvador was reconciled. Leonor Mandresa, when summoned to account for the deposit, denied it under oath and as there was no other witness, the claim for a few pennies was abandoned. The persistence with which these shadowy claims were pursued is illustrated in the case of Rafael Moneada, arrested in 1524. A certain Sor Catalina testified that she had heard say, by someone whose name she could not recall, that Moneada had said that, during the revolt of the Germania, 1520-1522, he had hidden a large amount of goods. His wife, or widow, Violante, when summoned, declared that during the troubles he had hidden some silks in the dye-house. When peace was restored, he had taken them out, and when, two years later, he was arrested, they were among the effects sequestrated. She was brought forward again and again, always adhering to the same story and it was not until 1531 that she was discharged. This persistence is explained by the fact that the receiver was responsible for every item entered by the notary of sequestrations unless he could show that it was not collectible, to the satisfaction of the judge, who would then relieve him by a sentencia de diligencias, signifying that he had made due exertion. The care thus induced in following up the minutest fragments of property is manifested in a petition presented by the receiver, March 4, 1531, to the effect that he had made every effort to recover fourteen sueldos, the dowry given by Pere Barbera and Graviel Barbera, to their sister, Leonor Barbera, on her marriage to Graviel Mas. More than twenty years ago, Pere Barbera was burnt in effigy. Moss went to the Canaries covered with debts and died there poor. Leonor died eighteen years ago, leaving her property to Pere's son, Anrich, 
and he too had been reconciled with confiscation. Andrich was called, and duly interrogated, and then the judge allowed the entry to be cancelled. Besides the excommunication incurred by all who did not voluntarily reveal their indebtedness to a confiscated estate, the receiver was clothed with ample powers enabling him to perform his duties thoroughly. When the first appointments were made for Aragon in 1484, all officials, secular and ecclesiastic, were required to assist him when called upon, under pain of the royal wrath and three thousand gold florins. Apparently this was found insufficient, for the formula in a commission issued, September 5, 1519, to Alonso de Gumiel, receiver of Ciudad Rodrigo, sets forth that, if any one refused or delayed to deliver up confiscated property, the receiver could impose penalties at discretion, and these penalties were confirmed in advance, while every one, of whatever station, was required to obey his orders under the same discretional penalties. It is easy to imagine the wrong and oppression which an unprincipled official could inflict, under powers so vague and arbitrary, and the terror which the office shed around it is exemplified in a Valencia case decided in 1532. September 2, 1528, Nofre Catalayut mustered courage to present to the court of confiscations a petition setting forth that, in 1507, as heir to his father, he became liable for a violario, a sort of annuity, of fifty sueldos a year, redeemable at fifteen libras, due to Luis Alcanis, which he paid sometimes to Jaime Alcanis, and sometimes to a daughter of Joan Alcanis. Jaime was condemned, and the receiver seized the violario. Through fear of the consequences, Nofre continued to pay it up to the present time, although it did not belong to Jaime, and the parties on whose lives it was based, Guillem Rancón de Belvis and Johan Boluda, had been dead for twenty years. The case must have been bitterly contested, for it was not until April 17, 1532, that a decision was rendered in his favor, to the effect that the violario had not belonged to Jaime Alcanis, and that the lives had ended a quarter of a century before, wherefore the receiver was ordered to refund all the payments that he had received. It was fortunate that a court was sometimes found to check the lawless rapacity of the receivers. It would not be easy to exaggerate the confusion and the hardships caused by the enforcement of confiscation, especially in the early period. The new Christians had filled so many positions of public and private trust, and the trade of Spain was so largely in their hands, that the long procession of arrests accompanied with sequestration and followed by confiscation could not but be paralyzing, and affect interests far wider than those of the victims and their kindred. Even after the first wild torrent of prosecution, the industry of the tribunals was constantly involving men hitherto unsuspected, bringing ruin or inextricable perplexities on the innocent who had chanced to have dealings with them. The backward search, moreover, into the heresies of those long since dead, vitiated old transactions and invalidated titles to property that had long been held by innocent owners. During Ferdinand's life we hear of many of these cases brought before him on appeal, and for the most part not in vain, for when the injustice of his receivers was clear, he was prompt to revoke their action, and when there was doubt he would often kindly waive a portion or the whole of his claim. A few typical instances will illustrate some of the various aspects of the troubles which pervaded the land and crippled the development of Spanish prosperity. Early in 1498, Ferdinand was startled to learn that the Barcelona Tribunal had arrested Jaime de Casafranca and had sequestrated his property. Casafranca was deputy of the Royal Treasurer General of Catalonia. He had served long and faithfully, without suspicion of his orthodoxy, and possessed the king's fullest confidence. In his hands were the monies of the crown, 
and also sums sent thither for the repairs of the castles of Rousselon, and the embargo laid on these funds threatened serious complications. Had private interests only been concerned, the embarrassment would have been irremediable. But Ferdinand set aside the established routine by ordering all the sequestrations to be placed in the hands of his advocate fiscal, who was directed to employ the monies as instructions should be sent to him, and to furnish an inventory so that public and private property could be separated. Then a messenger to Italy had just been dispatched, in hot haste, with orders to Casafranca, to provide immediate passage for him to Genoa, and, as delay would be most injurious, this must be seen to at once. Besides this, there were two chests of silk, in the name of Gabriel Sanchez, but belonging to the king, and two chests of paper for the royal secretary, and some horse covers and tools, the property of the treasurer general, and some books belonging to the heirs of González Ruiz, all of which had to be looked after. Moreover, Ferdinand recommended Casafranca to the kindly consideration of the tribunal, as the accusation might be malicious, and he charged the conscience of the inquisitors to observe justice. Casafranca, however, in the end was convicted, and Ferdinand consoled his children with some fragments of the confiscation. The arbitrary comprehensiveness of inquisitorial procedure and the difficulties thrown in the way of the new Christians are exemplified in the case of Gilabert de Santa Cruz, the younger. When his father, of the same name, was penanced, the son made a compromise with the receiver, under which he received a portion of his father's property in settlement of his mother's dowry and some other claims. Then he married Maria Sive and pledged this property in the nuptial contract. In 1500 the father was again arrested when the property was at once sequestrated again. He was living with a son, under which pretext all the latter's household effects, even to the clothes and trinkets of the wife, were included in the inventory. Moreover, the son was a member of a firm who employed the father as a factor, on which account all their goods and books were sequestrated, threatening the ruin of their business. In this emergency the only recourse was to Ferdinand, who responded with instructions to the tribunal that his will was that injustice should be done to no one. It was to examine the papers, and at once to act according to the facts, without oppressing or injuring the parties in interest, and without awaiting the result of the father's trial. The insecurity which overshadowed all transactions is illustrated by the case of Diego de Salinas of Avila, who had received as a marriage portion with the daughter of González Gómez, since deceased, a rent of forty-five fanegas of wheat which the latter, in 1499, had bought, for the purpose, from Rodrigo del Barco, for 30,000 maravedis. In 1501, it was found that Rodrigo had inherited this rent from his grandfather, Pedro Alvarez, whose fame and memory were condemned, and it was legally claimed by the fisc. Luckily for Diego, he had rendered services to the sovereigns, in consideration of which they granted him twenty-five thousand maravedis of the rent. It was to be valued, and he was to pay whatever it was worth, over and above that sum. Ferdinand's kindly interposition was sought by Pascual de Bellido, who had sold to Pedro de Santa Cruz a house for one thousand sueldos, reserving the right of redemption at the same price. Pedro was reconciled with confiscation, and Pascual applied to the receiver to allow him to redeem the house, but, as he had mislaid his carta de gracia, he was denied, and the house was sold for sixteen hundred sueldos. In 1502 he found the document and claimed the excess of six hundred sueldos, which the receiver refused to pay, until Ferdinand ordered him to do so, because Pascual was poor and had a daughter to marry. It was by no means the conversos only who suffered in this way. 
for old Christians were constantly finding themselves embarrassed by the cloud thrown on titles. In 1514, Don Pedro Núñez de Guzmán, Clavero, or treasurer of the Order of Galatrava, and major-domo of the Infante Ferdinand, represented to the king that his uncle, Luis Osorio, bishop of Jaén, had a major-domo named Rodríguez Jabalín, who fell in debt to him, and settled with certain properties, renting for forty-five hundred maravedis. The bishop died in 1496, and Guzmán, who inherited the properties, gave them to the dean and chapter of Jaén, to found a perpetual mass for his uncle's soul. The chapter sold them, and in 1514 the Inquisition seized them because Javelin had inherited them from an ancestor whose fame and memory were condemned. Guzman represented that, if the present possessors were ejected, the chapter would have to make it good. The mass thus would be discontinued, and, at his prayer, Ferdinand ordered the seizure to be withdrawn. As an insurance against such losses, sellers and purchasers sometimes sought to procure, from the king or the tribunals, licenses to convey property, real and personal. This was probably rare, as I have met with but a single case, that of Johann Carriga, whose wife and children, who, in 1510, from Majorca, petitioned Ferdinand for license to sell his property and faculties for others to purchase. Ferdinand referred the matter to the Majorcan inquisitor, saying that he did not know whether the property was in any way liable to the fisc, but if the inquisitor thought the license ought to be granted, he was empowered to issue it with a royal confirmation. If Garriga obtained his license, he probably had to pay roundly for it, for the officials were often by no means nice in the abuse of their unlimited power. In this same year, 1510, Antonio Mingot of Alicante complained to Ferdinand that he had been sentenced to pay 294 libras as a debt due to Gonzalo Ruiz, condemned for heresy. He had appealed to the Inquisitor-General, who referred the matter back to the Inquisitors, but, before they had decided the case, the receiver put up at auction property of his worth more than four thousand ducats, and then, for a payment of one hundred ducats, postponed the sale to St. John's Day. Mingot sought to appeal to the king, but could not get copies of the necessary papers, delays being interposed to carry the matter over the postponement. Ferdinand warmly expressed his displeasure, in a letter of May 21st, ordering copies of all papers to be furnished, and proceedings to be suspended for seventy days thereafter. But the peccant officials were not punished. Old claims, long since satisfied, were constantly turning up and prosecuted, from which the only recourse would seem to be the king. A few months later than the last case, he had a petition from the people of the hamlets of Scavieja and La Mata, stating that on November 3rd, 1487, they had paid off a censo of four hundred sueldos to Leonard de Sant Angel, and now, after nearly a quarter of a century, the receiver demands it of them, on the ground that Sant Angel at the time was in prison and incapable of receiving the money. Ferdinand ordered the receiver not to trouble them, as they were ignorant peasants, and the payment was made with the assent of their lord, the Bishop of Huesca. Similarly, in 1511, Domingo Just of Saragossa represented that, in 1484, he had given an obligation for three thousand sueldos as security for the issue to him of a bill of exchange on Rome. On his return, he had been unable to secure the surrender of the paper, in consequence of the flight of the holder, but it had turned up and was now demanded of him. Ferdinand ordered him to be relieved on his taking an oath, guaranteed by excommunication. Old and forgotten heresies were exploited with equal rigor. In 1510, Pedro de Espinosa of Baza 
represented to Ferdinand that when Bassa was recovered from the Moors, December 4th, 1489, he married Aldonza Rodriguez, niece and adopted daughter of the esquire Lázaro de Avila, and Catalina Jiménez, and, on Lázaro's death, they went to live with Catalina. Now Catalina has been condemned for an act of heresy committed when a child in her father's house, probably a fast or eating unleavened bread, and her property, worth some eighteen thousand ducats, has been confiscated. In view of his services in the war with Granada, Espinosa begged that the confiscation be remitted and Ferdinand liberally assented to the amount of eighteen thousand ducats. With the death of Ferdinand, these frequent appeals to the crown become fewer and are met with less kindliness, though the call for relief from the rigor of the law was undiminished, as will be seen from the case of the monastery of Bonifasa. In 1452, Pedro Roy, priest of Tortosa, sold to Dalvido Tolosa of Salset for four hundred libras a rent of twenty libras per annum secured on certain property. And this property Roy subsequently sold to the monastery. In 1475, Talvido died, leaving the rent to his son, Luis Tolosa, from whom the monastery redeemed it, March 1, 1488. Luis, or his memory, was condemned, and about 1519, the receiver demanded of the monastery the four hundred libras and all arrearages of rent, claiming that the redemption had been in fraud of the fisc, as Luis's heresy antedated it. The case was clear, and judgment against the monastery was rendered, June seventh, 1519. Pleading poverty, it applied for relief to Charles V, who instructed the receiver that, if it would pay one hundred libras during July, and fifty more within a year, he should release the claim. The avidity of the Inquisition did not diminish with time, nor its disastrous influence on all exposed to its claims. In 1615, a German Protestant, known as Juan Cote, was condemned by the Toledo Tribunal to perpetual prison and confiscation. He was then twenty-four years old, and had been taken, in early youth, by his uncle, Juan Aventrot, to the Canaries, where the uncle married Maria Vandala, a widow with four children, who died in 1609, leaving one-fifth of her estate to Cote. In 1613, Aventrot sent him to Spain with a letter to the Duke of Lerma, which led to the discovery of his heresy. Proceedings for the confiscation of his share in the widow's estate dragged on interminably. September 7, 1634, the Suprema ordered the Toledo Tribunal to furnish papers in the case, including a certificate of the date of Cote's heresy, which, in view of his having been brought up as a Protestant, it fixed at the age of fourteen, when he could be considered responsible. In this the Inquisition overreached itself, for in 1635 the Canary Tribunal reported that the heirs alleged Cote to have been incapable of inheritance, seeing that he was brought up as a Protestant, and both he and his uncle had pretended to be Catholics, and they called for a copy of the sentence to demonstrate this. The unabashed Suprema then shifted its ground and procured September 10th, 1640, from the Toledo Tribunal, a certificate that Cote had commenced his heretical acts in 1613, when he brought the letter to Lerma and delivered it to Philip III in August 1614. How the affair terminated, and how much longer it was protracted, we have no means of knowing, but the Inquisition had at least succeeded in tying up the estate for twenty-five years. The hardship of this system on innocent third parties was intensified by the fact that in this, as in all else, the Inquisition claimed and exercised exclusive jurisdiction. 
there was no appeal to a disinterested tribunal, but only from the judge of confiscations to the Suprema, which was as much interested as its subordinates in obtaining as large returns as possible from all sources. As these fell off, the liberality, so often displayed by Ferdinand, was no longer in place, and it became inexorable. Confiscations were specially assigned to the payment of salaries, and the judges were thus directly interested in their productiveness. The danger and the humiliation of this were fully recognized. In his futile plan of reform in 1518, Charles V proposed to assign to the officials definite salaries, and relieve them from dependence on the sentences which they pronounced. In 1523 he received from his privy council a memorial in which, among other matters, he was urged to see that proper appointments were made in the Inquisition, and that they had fitting salaries from other sources, so that they should live neither by beggary nor on the blood of their victims, and that their labors should tend to instruction rather than to destruction, and to rendering Christianity odious to the infidel. The Cortes of Castile remonstrated repeatedly to the same effect. Those of 1537 complained of the salaries being thus defrayed. Those of 1548 asked Charles to provide fixed salaries so as to put an end to the notorious evil of the judges paying themselves by fining and confiscating. And again, in 1555, they pointed out that, Besides the danger of judges deriving their pay from the condemnations which they decree, it diminished the respect due to the holy office. To this the answer was merely that the matter has been considered and will be fittingly decided. Spanish finances, however, were never in a position to assure the Inquisition that if it paid over its receipts to the crown, it would get them back in appropriations for salaries and expenses. As we have seen, it kept them under its own control, and it jealously repelled all intrusion, even by the crown, on its exclusive jurisdiction over confiscations. This position had not been won without a struggle. January twentieth, 1486, Ferdinand empowered the inquisitors of Saragossa to act as judges in the complicated litigation which was growing, and he commissioned them to decide all questions thence arising. On March 31st he reiterated the injunction. If the secular judges were allowed to intervene, everything would be lost. They were to be restrained by censures, as had already been done, and if royal letters or ejecutorias were required, they would be promptly furnished. There evidently was active resistance to this, for on May 5th he wrote that all questions must be settled by ecclesiastical law, for, if the fueros were admitted, he would never get justice. The inquisitors must therefore act, the receiver and fiscal must try the cases before them alone, and they must be speedy. When persecution was active, this threw upon the inquisitors too heavy a burden, and one, moreover, for which they were unprepared, for they were theologians, and not canon lawyers. The assessors, it is true, assisted them, but a special tribunal evidently was a necessity, and this was furnished by the erection of courts of confiscation, presided over by the jueces de los bienes. In Castile, where the fueros were not an impediment, this had already been tried. As early as 1484 there is an allusion to such an official, and a commission as such was issued, April 10, 1485, to the bachiller Juan Antonio Serrano of Córdoba. For some time, however, such appointments continued to be unusual. In 1490, we hear of Juan Pérez de Nieva as juez de los bienes in Segovia, but for the most part the inquisitors and their assessors continued to perform the functions, and, when a juez existed, his position was subordinate, as appears by a letter of Ferdinand, August 27, 1500, to an assessor, telling him, 
that the juez was only to relieve him in ordinary cases, and not to tie his hands in important ones. Inquisitors also continued to act, for in 1509 we hear of Nino de Villalobos as inquisitor and juez in Cartagena, and a certain Dembredo as filling both positions in Seville, while as late as 1514 Toribio de Saldaña is spoken of as inquisitor and juez. With the gradual disappearance of the assessors, however, the necessity of a separate functionary became apparent, and the courts of confiscations grew to be an established feature of the tribunals, so long as confiscations continued to be numerous and profitable. Towards the end, when they had become infrequent, the senior inquisitor performed the duties of the juez. Ferdinand, meanwhile, persisted in asserting the exclusive jurisdiction of the Inquisition over all matters connected with confiscation, recognizing that his interests would suffer if the secular courts were allowed to intervene. The establishment of this as a rule of practice is attributable to the year 1508. The receiver of Jaén had sold a confiscated house to Diego Garcia Errico, for forty two thousand maravedis on a year's credit when the term expired garcia instead of paying exhibited a grant made to him of the house by philip of austria after philip's brief career was over his acts were not treated with much respect and the juez de los bienes refused to recognize the grant on the ground that it was not countersigned by the suprema garcia appealed to the chancellery of granada which ordered the grant to be recognized but ferdinand interposed january eighteenth fifteen o eight commanding the judges to keep their hands off and not to interfere with the inquisition in any way either in its civil or criminal jurisdiction the chancellery did not take this kindly and invited in fifteen ten another rebuke for meddling in suits concerning sequestrations and confiscations. If any cases of the kind were pending, they must be forthwith remitted to the tribunals to which they belonged, and in future nothing of the kind was to be entertained. It was impossible that this monstrous policy of making it the judge in its own cases should be submitted to without resistance, but it was stoutly maintained by the crown the tribunal of jaen invested some of its funds in a censo created by a cleric of alcala he died in fifteen twenty four when his mother and brothers attacked the censo as being secured on a property in which they held undivided interests and another party came forward with an encumbrance on the same property the inquisition seized it and also collected some debts due to the deceased which reduced its claim to seven or eight thousand maravedis. The other parties appealed to the Chancellery of Granada, which entertained the case, but the Inquisition invoked Charles V, who, in letters of May 19 and July 7, 1525, repeated the commands of Ferdinand to abstain from all interference. The Inquisition was the sole judge, and parties thinking themselves aggrieved must appeal to the Suprema. Still, those who smarted under injustice sought relief in the secular courts, which were nothing loath to aid them. Complaints were loud on both sides, and competencias were frequent, until, as we have seen, they led to the settlement of 1553, in which Prince Philip emphatically forbade cognizance of such matters to all courts and ministers of justice, and confined appellate jurisdiction strictly to the Suprema. End of Book 5, Chapter 1, Part 3 Recording by Guero Book 5, Chapter 1, Part 4 of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Guero. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 5, Resources, Chapter 1, Part 4, Confiscation. As has been seen in other matters, the great high court of Granada was recalcitrant and persisted in asserting its jurisdiction. In 1571 and 1573 it entertained cases relating to confiscations, in both of which it was told by Philip the Second to hold its hand and not to meddle with such affairs. Despite this, in 1575, it intervened in a case which suggests the reasonable objection felt to rendering the Inquisition a judge in its own cause. The creditors of Don Diego de Castilla had embargoed his property, and the court had placed it in the hands of an administrator for their benefit. But the tribunal of Murcia chanced to hold a censo of his for a thousand ducats. The juez de los bienes stepped in, seized the property, sold it, and kept the money. The chancellery was seeking to obtain justice for the other creditors. It arrested the juez and threw him into prison, when Philip again intervened, ordering his liberation and the abandonment of the case. It illustrates the independence of the kingdoms of the crown of Aragon, that when the tax collectors of Valencia levied taxes and imposts on confiscated property and its sale, Charles V was obliged to appeal to the Holy See for its prevention. Clement VII obligingly granted a bull, July 7, 1525, forbidding this under pain of excommunication, and a fine of a thousand ducats to the papal camera the inquisitor-general was named as conservator and judge to enforce it by censures and interdict and invocation of the secular arm which doubtless put an end to the practice as the operations of the inquisition developed an additional source of gain was found in speculating upon the terror pervading the new christian communities whether the idea originated in their mercantile instincts or in the desire of the sovereigns for prompt realization cannot be determined but it was in essence a kind of rude and imperfect insurance against certain contingencies of confiscation for which those in danger were willing to pay a heavy premium as early as september sixth fourteen eighty two in a letter of ferdinand to luis cabaniges governor of valencia there occurs an allusion to an arrangement of this kind made with the conversos of that city under which apparently they had agreed to pay a certain sum in lieu of the confiscations and had appointed assessors to apportion the share of each individual some of those thus assessed refused to pay and ferdinand ordered them to be coerced by imprisonment what were the exact terms of this we have no means of knowing but on june sixth fourteen eighty eight he made another bargain with the Valencia conversos, who were reconciled under an edict of grace, by which they paid him for exemption from confiscation, apparently rather a fresh impost, for this reconciliation substituted fines for confiscation. Then April 6, 1491, he confirmed this, and, for a further payment of five thousand ducats, he added exemption for heretical acts subsequently committed, if they did not amount to relapse, and for imperfect confessions made under the Edict of Grace, for as we shall see hereafter, such confessions were frequently a source of danger arising from trifling omissions, construed by the Inquisitors as rendering them fictitious and entailing relaxation. It is an indelible disgrace to Ferdinand that in these compositions he did not keep faith with those whose money he took. In 1499, the Suprema took exception to this arrangement, probably in consequence of complaints that it was violated by the seizure and sale of properties comprehended under it. Then Ferdinand declared that it had not been his intention to relieve from confiscation those whose confessions had been imperfect, whereupon the Suprema ordered the inquisitors and receiver to prosecute and confiscate the property of all such penitents, in spite of the agreement. Even the hardened receiver Aliaga seems to have hesitated to obey these orders, for Ferdinand was obliged to write him, September 27th, that they were to be executed notwithstanding the privilege and its confirmation. 
the hardships inflicted on the innocent by this breach of faith are illustrated in a petition presented in fifteen nineteen to charles v by juan and beatriz quimera children of bernat and violante quimera who after the composition of fourteen eighty eight had been condemned for imperfect confession and their property confiscated juan and beatriz with other children in the same position appealed to ferdinand who under the provision of april sixth fourteen ninety one ordered the receiver to restore all such property they received and enjoyed possession for twelve years after which under the orders of fourteen ninety nine the inquisitors took it from them from this they appealed but were too poor to follow it up and the suprema declared the appeal abandoned now they prayed charles for the restoration of their property and showed that after the execution of their parents they had paid all the installments remaining of the composition in view of this charles as a special grace and in the exercise of the royal clemency ordered not that the property of which they had been robbed should be restored but that the receiver should repay them what the inquisitors might find that they had paid of the composition after the death of their parents without deducting therefrom the claim of the fisc for the income of the property during their twelve years possession even worse if possible was ferdinand's course in a composition made september tenth fourteen ninety five with the heirs and successors of all who in aragon had died up to that time and whose memories had been or might in future be condemned for the sum of five thousand ducats he abandoned to those who contributed all the confiscations of their inheritances and also the inheritances of those who refused to contribute to be distributed among them in proportion to their contributions inferentially this was confirmed when in fourteen ninety nine in view of trouble with the receiver at the prayer of the contributors he appointed vicente de bordalba administrator of the property to claim and hold it and distribute it to the owners after seven years had passed in fifteen o two he was seized with qualms of conscience at thus violating the canon law which incapacitated the children of heretics as inheritors it is true that he might have assumed the property and then made a free gift of it as was frequently done in special cases but his scruples were too delicate for such a subterfuge by letters of december thirteenth fifteen o two to the inquisitors and assessor he ordered the seizure and confiscation of all the property thus devolved and the return to the contributors in all cases where they were sufferers of the money which they had paid thus retaining the contributions of those who had not profited by the composition this breach of faith made an immense sensation in saragossa and even his son the archbishop ventured to remonstrate when he replied sanctimoniously that he was acting by the advice of learned and god-fearing men who had demonstrated to him that he could not with a clear conscience and without peril to his soul grant a privilege contrary to the canon law the sufferers must have patience for it was in accordance with the canons of holy mother church which were obligatory on him the inquisitors and receiver were not over nice in utilizing their opportunity and complaints speedily came pouring in that besides the inheritances they seized all the property belonging to the heirs including their acquisitions and the dowries of their wives and that moreover they did not repay the contributions thus before the month of december fifteen o two was out the brothers buendia appealed to him they had paid fifteen thousand sueldos to the composition and now the receiver had seized what they had inherited from their father much of this they had sold they had acquired other properties by their labor they had inherited from their mother who was an old christian and had received dowries with their wives all of which was included in the seizure ferdinand merely reported this to the inquisitor with a vague order to do justice so as not to afford grounds for complaint it is easy to conceive the confusion of titles the multiplicity of suits and the amount of misery resulting from this arbitrary abrogation of a contract 
Resistance was prolonged, but it was unavailing, for Ferdinand held good and repeated his peremptory orders January 4 and March 8, 1503, July 8 and November 7, 1504, and October 7, 1508. It would appear, moreover, that many of the contributors who suffered never obtained a return of their money, for this formed the subject of one of the articles of the Aragonese Concordia of 1512, confirmed in the 1516 bull of Leo X, providing that whoever had joined in a composition for the property of the dead, and had paid his money, if the deceased was subsequently convicted and the fisc seized his inheritance, he should recover from the estate what he had paid, provided the payment had not been made out of the effects of the deceased it was thus admitted that the contracts were no bar to the inquisition there were various forms of these compositions insuring against the different risks and disabilities to which the property of the conversos was exposed but they all had this in common that the contributor threw his money into a pool from which his chance of deriving advantage was in the highest degree problematical it is therefore a striking evidence of the desperation to which the new Christians were reduced, that they were eager to grasp at these forlorn chances, and to pour their money into the ever-gaping royal treasury, while Ferdinand, in spite of his conscientious scruples, was always ready to speculate on their despair. It is impossible now to say how many compositions were made, from first to last, but they probably covered nearly the whole of Spain, at one time or another. We have seen that there was one in Cordova prior to 1500, which was highly profitable to the inquisitor who managed it, and another of uncertain date in Andalusia, volume 1, pages 190-220. There was one in Orihuela in 1492, and a second in Valencia in 1498, and in 1515 there were others in Biscayan provinces and in Cuenca. Occasionally, moreover, inquisitors were authorized to enter into such bargains with individuals as in Majorca in 1498 and in Catalonia in 1512. A specimen of these individual compositions is revealed to us in an investigation made in 1487 by Dr. Alfonso Ramírez, juez de los bienes of Toledo, into the accounts of Juan de Urria, the late receiver who was reported to have defrauded the fisc of more than a million and a half maravedis. Pedro de Toledo had fled to Portugal to escape trial, and his wife, Isabel Díaz, arranged with Urria for a royal letter of security and pardon for him, his property and his paternal inheritance, for which the price agreed upon was half a million maravedis, in addition to which Urria was promised a hundred florins for his services. Pedro returned and paid for the letter, when Isabel gave Urria thirteen gold cruzados and fourteen pieces of cloth, which he sold and claimed that he was five hundred maravedis short. This was productive, but still more so was one, in 1514, by which Francisco Sanchez of Talavera ransomed the estate of his deceased father for a million maravedis. These transactions justify the conclusion that persecution was largely a matter of finance as well as of faith. Such conviction is strengthened by the history of the greatest of the general compositions, a most prolonged and involved transaction, of which space will permit only the barest outline. It commenced with a composition, signed December 7, 1508, with Seville and Cadiz, by which, in consideration of twenty thousand ducats, there was made over to the penanced and condemned, or to their heirs, all confiscated property in suit or that had not been discovered and seized from the commencement of the Inquisition up to November 30th, except what was included in the Auto de Fe of October 29th. The property of those who did not join in the agreement, and paid their assessments, was liable to seizure, and all amounts thus realized were to be deducted from the payment. There was also granted the valued privilege of going to and trading with the Indies, forbidden to all reconciliados. This was extended, October 10, 1509, in the name of Queen Juana, covering the archbishopric of Seville. The bishopric of Cadiz and the towns of Lepe, Ajamonte, and La Redondilla, 
and providing for the payment of forty thousand ducats for which the queen made to the contributors a donation of all real and personal property forfeit to her from persons reconciled and guilty of imperfect confessions or other offences prior to reconciliation also all the property of those who had died reconciled or to be reconciled and forfeitable by reason of prior offences together with all property confiscated on those who refused to contribute all alienations made by contributors were confirmed to the purchasers and contributors were relieved from all penalties incurred for disregarding the disabilities inflicted on those reconciled and their descendants on the other hand it was expressly stated that the grant did not exempt the property of those who relapsed or committed offences subsequent to reconciliation nor did it relieve them from prosecution in person or fame after this for some cause the total payment was increased to eighty thousand ducats of which sixty thousand were for the composition and twenty thousand for rehabilitation or removal of disabilities the first obstacle lay in the assembling of the enormous mass of papers relating to the old confiscations the tribunal of leon which held some of them refused to deliver them and the same occurred with papers concerning Ecija, requiring repeated peremptory orders from ferdinand to procure their deposit in the castle of triana for inspection at last the unwieldy business was got under way assessors were appointed to make the assessments on contributors but troubles arose and the whole affair was put in the hands of pedro de villasis the experienced receiver of seville who had been instrumental in getting up the agreement of fifteen o eight the work went on and large collections were made although delays in payment incurred penalties which by fifteen fifteen amounted to seven hundred and fifty thousand maravedis to be paid to the tribunal of seville but it never got the money encouraged by this initial success the scheme was extended over the kingdom of granada the bishoprics of cordova jaen badajoz coria and plasencia and the province of leon the sum agreed upon for them being fifty thousand ducats complaints however arose about injustice in the assessments payments were not forthcoming in time difficulties apparently insuperable accumulated and ferdinand after consultation with jimenez and the suprema revoked the composition then it was revived and ferdinand january eighteen fifteen fifteen placed it in the hands of vijasis whose instructions justify the assumption that under the guise of an act of mercy the whole scheme was merely the pretext for fresh exactions on the defenceless he was ordered to proclaim the composition in all places within the district's concern to order all persons obligated to pay their contributions those proposing to join were to appear before him by their procurators at a specified time and arrange the assessments to be paid by each place or person such assessments being binding on the absent as for those who refused to join vijasis was empowered to levy on their property as being jointly liable and to sell it at auction giving to the purchasers good and sufficient title guaranteed by the crown while all secular officials were required to give him whatever aid he required inquisitors were to do the same and were to commission as alguaciles such persons as he might name letters were sent to the corregidors of the towns telling them that some contributors refused to pay and they were empowered to decide all such questions summarily and finally that the matter was really an unauthorized impost enforced by the authority of the inquisition would appear not only from this admittance of secular jurisdiction but also from what we know as to the methods pursued in the original composition of seville each town was assessed at a certain sum which it divided at discretion among the contributors when alcazar was assessed at a thousand ducats it remonstrated to ferdinand who kindly ordered execution suspended other places were not so fortunate and the pitiless exaction of the assessment provoked resistance thus in march fifteen fourteen when by order of the tribunal and as representative vijasis fernando royce went to san lucar de barrameda 
he seized some slaves and other property and placed them in prison for safe keeping the duchess of medina sidonia ordered the alcalde to return them to their masters and would allow no further levies to be made ferdinand forthwith rebuked her ordering her to assist the officials and never again to interfere in matters concerning the inquisition he also wrote to the inquisitors to inflict due punishment on the person and property of the alcalde and all connected with the affair the levies and executions must proceed and the money be collected for the last installment of the composition was to be paid by the end of may this indicates that the seville composition had been fairly productive but the other had continued to drag with the death of ferdinand in january fifteen sixteen pressure was removed and resistance became general a cedula issued in the name of queen juana february twenty fourth states that those who were assessed were refusing to pay and were supported by nobles and magnates wherefore the inquisitors of seville cordova jaen and leon were instructed to enforce the payments by levy and execution and to prosecute with all rigor those who impeded the collection irrespective of their rank and dignity this was ineffective in cordova the count of cabra and the marquis of priego forced the agents of vijasis to abandon work among their vassals and the latter compelled them to deposit sixty thousand maravedis which they had collected it was in vain that the governors of castile ordered them to desist and when in september the count of cabra justified his persistence by stating that his people had paid their composition to rodrigo de madrid who had organized the scheme and he would not allow them to be coerced into duplicate payments he and the marquis were told that rodrigo had no authority and that his receipts were worthless which suggests the impositions practised on the victims in the lands of the duke of medina sidonia the same opposition was offered and the high court of granada took advantage of the opportunity by issuing mandates restraining the collection nor is it likely that it respected a royal cedula of july fourth commanding it to abstain from interference this resistance was fully justified even before ferdinand's death the proceedings of vijasis and his underlings had aroused general indignation at the cortes of burgos in fifteen fifteen the procurators of seville had called the attention of the nation to their extortions in a petition which set forth their misdeeds doubtless with exaggeration but which coming from those not personally interested must have had substantial foundation in fact vijasis was accused of arbitrary assessments and of making up deficiencies by assessing again those who had already paid of cruelty extortion and fraud of selling at auction property taken in execution at unusual places and times so that he and his friends could buy it in of using the machinery of the composition to collect his private debts of defrauding the fisc by false returns of charging to the contributors the exorbitant fees and expenses of his collectors although the agreement provided that the fisc should bear them of rendering to the contributors only a partial account of his collections and refusing to complete it and in this charging himself with only forty ducats as collected in the canaries when there was evidence that the amount was more than a thousand in short he was accused of abusing his arbitrary powers in almost every conceivable way to oppress the people and enrich himself and numerous specific cases were cited in support of the allegations the magistrates of seville had endeavored to restrain him but he scorned their jurisdiction and therefore in the name of the whole community the king was supplicated to send to seville some one empowered to investigate and punish and make restitution to those wrongfully despoiled it was impossible to ignore such an appeal made in the face of the nation and the licenciado giron one of the judges of the high court of granada was dispatched to seville but only with power to investigate and report to the Suprema within sixty days. The time proved too short, and after exceeding it, he begged to be relieved on making a partial report. In December 1516, the licenciado Mateo Vasquez, a resident of Seville, 
was commissioned, with the same powers, to complete the investigation, and also to inquire into many complaints coming from various places that, prior to the appointment of Vijasis, Pedro de la Alcazar and Francisco de Santa Cruz and their employees had made large collections, of which they had rendered no account, that they had retained more than a million of maravedis, while those who had paid them were subjected to levy and execution to enforce duplicate payments. Altogether the whole business would seem to have been a saturnalia of spoliation and embezzlement. Vasquez undertook the task, and on September 17, 1517, he was ordered to furnish to Vijasis a copy of the evidence to enable him to put in a defense, after which all the papers were to be submitted to the Suprema for its action. If anything resulted from this, it has left no trace in the documents. The influence of Vijasis carried him through, for he was continued in office and went on with the work. August 13, 1518, Charles V ordered an audit of his accounts and payment of balances due, which he skillfully parried. A new assessment was ordered to make good any part of the 80,000 ducats that might still be uncollected, and this was given to him to enforce. The old methods were still pursued, for in March 1519, Charles was obliged to write vigorously to the Count of Cabra, the Marquis of Priego, and the alcalde major of the marquis of gomares who had again interfered with his collectors and stopped all proceedings in their lands charles's flemish favorites were growing impatient to share in the elusive spoils he had granted to his chamberlain monsieur de bourrin the rest of his composition but it was not forthcoming nor were the accounts of vijasis in january fifteen nineteen he wrote to Torquemada, one of the Seville inquisitors, to enforce on Vijasis, with the utmost rigor of the law, the payment to Bourrain, of any amounts collected and not paid over, while if there was a balance uncollected, Vijasis was to assess it afresh and account for it to Bourrain. This produced nothing, and on March 24th, Charles emphatically repeated the order, granting full power to enforce it with penalties at discretion. Vijasis, however, had experience in eluding such demands, and Ferdinand had not left much to glean. In 1515 he had divided up the Cordova composition, giving 20,000 to the Inquisition and reserving 30,000 for himself. Of this he had received 20,000, and the remaining ten he granted to the Marquis of Denia, but when the latter presented this order to Vijasis, he was told that eight thousand was covered by previous grants, and he could only have two thousand. Denia complained to Ferdinand, by that time mortally sick, who on December 4th assented to the transfer to him of the previous grants, but Jimenez, in transmitting this order to Vijasis, made a condition that the twenty thousand for the inquisition must first be paid and he subsequently suspended denia's grant altogether the marquis complained of this to charles who from ghent may twenty two fifteen seventeen ordered jimenez to lift the suspension but again jimenez insisted with bijasis that the inquisition must first be paid the funds seem to evaporate and vanish into thin air. It is probable that Dania got little or nothing, and that Bourrain fared no better, for Charles's prime favorite, Adrian de Croix, received as his share of the spoils only the seven hundred and fifty thousand maravedis, the penalties for delay, which had been assigned to the tribunal of Seville. The insatiable Calcena and Aguirre, however, secured a thousand ducats, which in 1515 Ferdinand granted them in recompense for their labors on the composition. Thus for ten years the new Christians of a large part of Spain had been harried and impoverished under delusive promises of exemption, and of the monies thus extorted, but little reached either the crown or the inquisition. The tribunal of Seville, indeed, can have received virtually nothing, for as we have seen in 1556, its Archbishop Valdez asserted that, since the beginning of the century, it was so impoverished that it could support but a single inquisitor and pay only one-third of the ordinary salaries. 
it would be impossible now to conjecture what was the amount of which the industrious and producing classes of spain were thus despoiled or what was the sum of misery thus inflicted although we may estimate the retribution which followed in the disorganization of spanish industries and the retardation of economic development what reached the royal treasury and the money chests of the inquisition was but a portion of the values of which the owners were deprived the assets taken melted in the hands of the spoilers the expenses of the trials which became inordinately prolonged and the maintenance of the prisoners consumed a considerable part dilapidation and peculation which even ferdinand's incessant vigilance could not prevent were the source of constant loss even without these the necessity for immediate realization to supply the peremptory demands of the treasury and the tribunals threw an enormous amount of property and goods of all kinds on the market enforced sales which were inevitably sacrifices it was the established rule perpetually enunciated that everything except money and securities was to be sold at auction the real estate on the thirteenth day after condemnation in presence of the receiver and notary of sequestrations notwithstanding all precautions collusion and fraud were perpetual it was doubtless as an effort to check them that valdes in fifteen forty seven ordered that real estate or censos or government securities should not be sold without consulting the suprema together with an attested statement of past income and probable proceeds and this was followed in fifteen fifty three with an order that property in litigation was not to be sold precautions however were unavailing the memorial of sixteen twenty three to the suprema remarks that there are many opportunities for human wickedness in the sequestration valuation and sale of sequestrated property the valuations are habitually too low and the sales are made at the lowest prices whenever possible property should be brought to the city of the tribunal be properly valued and the receiver be forbidden to sell it for less when sales have to be made at the place of arrest they should be by public auction in the presence of the commissioner and of a familiar to see that just prices are obtained the suprema seems to have mooned over this until sixteen thirty five when it called for reports as to the manner in which the auctions were held and whether just prices were obtained if the property was in some small place it must be brought to a larger town to prevent fraud End of Book 5, Chapter 1, Part 4 Recording by Guero Book 5, Chapter 1, Part 5 of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Guero The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 5, Resources, Chapter 1, Part 5, Confiscation. During the period of active confiscation, moreover, when the moneyed classes were either ruined or anticipating ruin, it was sometimes impossible to effect sales, and in the pressure and confusion, property was allowed to go to waste. A letter of March 20, 1512, to the receiver of Huesca and Lerida, speaks of the uninhabited houses and lands which had not been sold, because fair prices could not be had, and which were perishing in consequence, and he was told to see whether he could not sell them on ground rent redeemable or irredeemable. It is impossible not to see in this the commencement of the despoblados, which were the despair of Spanish statesmen for more than two centuries. So in 1531, the dwelling of Jativa of Juan Sanz, on whom it was confiscated, was allowed to fall into such disrepair that no one would take it subject to the encumbrances, and the rentals did not meet the ground rents so it was abandoned to the encumbrancers. The manner in which property melted away is seen in the settlement made in 1519 
of the estate of Major de Monzon, burnt for heresy. It was appraised at 110,197 maravedis, but against this were the expenses of the woman and her children while in prison, amounting to 41,100, and the widower Diego de Adrade finally agreed to take the estate for 17,000 maravedis, subject to whatever claims there might be against it. Everybody concerned grasped at what he could. In 1532, the Valencia Tribunal sent Rafael Diego de Mallorca to arrest and fetch Leonor Juan, wife of Ramon Martin, who was blind. She was reconciled with confiscation, and Charles V made a grant to the husband of a hundred libras from the estate. But when the account was made up, the expenses did not leave enough to pay him. One item against which he protested was twenty-five ducats to Diego for twenty days' work, when his salary was only eighty ducats a year. The Suprema consequently suspended the item, but in 1545 Inquisitor General Tavera ordered it to be paid. It is perhaps superfluous to insist upon what was inevitable in an age when integrity was exceptional in public affairs, and in a business affording peculiar temptations to malversation, through the fluctuating uncertainty of receipts, and the difficulty of effecting competent supervision. Ferdinand did his best to establish accountability, and his incessant activity exhibits itself in his minute criticisms on his auditor's reports of the accounts of receivers, but even his vigilance could not prevent frauds and peculation nor was it possible for him to penetrate the mysteries lurking behind statements of receipts and expenditures, when the receivers were apt to use the funds as their own. When Juan Denbin, the receiver of Zaragoza, died and his accounts were balanced, after all possible allowance were made, he was found in 1500 to owe 9,367 sueldos, which Ferdinand vainly endeavored to collect from his heir, the abbot of Veruela. Then Bean's deputy at Calatayud improved on his example, and was found, in 1499, to be short twenty-four thousand sueldos, of which he paid eight thousand, and promised the rest at the rate of four thousand a year. The installment of fifteen hundred was obtained after some delay, and when we last hear of him, Ferdinand was endeavoring to secure that of 1501. It is easy to understand the chronic reluctance of such officials to render statements, and Ferdinand's correspondence shows how difficult it was to force them to do so. There is much suggestiveness in a letter of October 15, 1498, to the Maestre Racional, or Auditor General, of Catalonia, telling him that, as Jaime de la Ram, the former receiver, and Pedro de Badilla, the present one, refuse under various pretexts to hand over their books so that their accounts can be settled. He is to take legal steps to compel it. They can have until March 1st, 1499, to obey, and if they still refuse, their salaries are to be stopped. When the books are obtained, no time is to be lost in striking a balance, and especial care is to be taken that they do not give themselves fraudulent credits. Juan de Montaña, receiver of Huesca and Lerida, was another whose accounts were chronically in arrear. This continued to the end of Ferdinand's reign. In 1515 we find him writing to a receiver who had flatly refused to obey an order of Jiménez to go to Valencia with his books and papers and render an account of his collections for persistence in which the king threatened him with prosecution. After his death, Jimenez labored energetically to evoke order out of disorder. He appointed a receiver-general, with power to collect by levy, execution, and sale, all monies due by the receivers, and all fines, penances, commutations, and rehabilitations. Moreover, to a new auditor-general, Hernando de Villa, he addressed a cedula, February 21st, 1517, reciting that the receivers had collected from the confiscations and other sources 
large sums of which for a long time they had rendered no account, wherefore he was instructed to visit every tribunal, to demand an accounting from the receiver, to examine all papers and vouchers, and ascertain the balances due, while all notaries were instructed to furnish whatever documents he might call for, and he was empowered to enforce his orders with punishment at discretion. Possibly this may have produced improvement, but if so, it was but temporary. We have just seen how recalcitrant about his accounts was Pedro de Badilla, the receiver of Barcelona. He did not improve, and when he died in 1513, he left his office in bad condition. He was replaced by Martín de Marrano, transferred from Majorca, who proved to be no better. In 1520, Cardinal Adrián, to punish him, reduced his salary to 2,880 sueldos, and then, April 16, 1521, wrote a long and indignant letter to the inquisitors, principally devoted to Marrano's misdeeds, among which was refusal to settle his accounts and alleging claims for which he had no vouchers. Yet, to all appearances, with the inexplicable tenderness shown to official culprits, he was retained in office. The tribunal of Sicily, where the confiscations were large, was in even worse hands. Diego de Obregón, who served as receiver from 1500 to 1514, left its affairs in lamentable confusion. He was succeeded by Garci Cid, who was sent to reduce it to order. How he accomplished this is seen in a report of Benito Mercader, sent as inspector, describing the financial management as characterized by every vice, while peculation was rife among all the officials. Garci Cid returned to Spain in 1520, and it was not until 1542 that the Suprema ordered him to pay the 1,420 ducats, which he was found to owe, as well as what he had collected of 9,300 more, which were charged against him. Things did not mend, for, as we have seen, Surita, who became auditor-general for Aragon in 1548, describes his untangling of the Sicilian accounts, which had not been received for twenty years, and were in the utmost disorder. It is evident that the receipts of the royal treasury formed but a portion of the amount wrung from the victims. What those receipts were we have no means of knowing, but in 1524 the licenciado Tristán de León, in an elaborate memorial addressed to Charles V, asserted that Ferdinand and Isabella obtained from this source the enormous amount of ten million ducats, which greatly assisted them in their war with the Moors. Occasionally we have scattering indications of the productiveness of inquisitorial labors. Thus in the little temporary Geronimite Inquisition of Guadalupe in 1485, the sovereigns appropriated the proceeds to the erection of a royal residence for their frequent devotional visits to the shrine. It was a magnificent palace, the cost of which, 2,732,333 maravedis, was almost wholly defrayed from this source. In 1486, the Valencia Tribunal must have been productive, for Ferdinand wrote from Galicia to the receiver Juan Ram to supply all that was needful for a fleet, as he had not the money in hand at the court. The impression produced on contemporaries is conveyed in Hernando de Pulgar's grim remark when describing the violent expulsion from Toledo of the Count of Fuensalida. He adds that the populace, like rigid inquisitors of the faith, found heresies in the properties of the Count's peasants, which they plundered and burnt. The large sums which were raised in the various compositions, in return for the very slender exemptions offered, are an index of the magnitude of the confiscations, and so is a proposition, made to Ferdinand and declined, of a loan of six hundred thousand ducats if he would transfer the adjudication of such matters to the secular courts. Although receipts were perhaps diminished, with the weeding out of the Judaizing new Christians, we have seen, volume 1, page 220, 
the offer made in 1519 to Charles V, to provide an endowment which would meet all the salaries and expenses of the Inquisition, and in addition to pay him 400,000 ducats in compensation for the abandonment of the confiscations. Soon after this, another offer was made of 700,000 ducats, which seems to have been held under consideration for a year or two. During the remainder of the sixteenth century, the constant drafts by the Suprema on the several tribunals shows that they were, as a rule, supporting themselves, with a surplus for the central organization, although occasionally a tribunal in bad luck had to be helped by some more fortunate brother. The grant, in 1559, of a prebend in each cathedral and collegiate church, supplied the growing deficiency of confiscations but the latter received a notable augmentation after the annexation of Portugal in 1580. This was followed by a large influx of new Christians from the poorer to the richer kingdom, where their business ability speedily led to the acquisition of wealth, while their attachment to the ancient faith gave to the Inquisition a new and lucrative field of operations. We shall see hereafter the curious transaction by which, in 1604, they purchased a brief immunity, and this led soon afterwards to an offer, by the new Christians of Seville and the western provinces, of 1,600,000 ducats for a forty-year suspension of confiscation, coupled with the release of descendants from disabilities and infamy, the rating of testimony as its true worth, and papal intervention with the king in the rendering of sentences. The offer was seriously considered, but an investigation of the treasury accounts showed that, in its financial aspect, it would be a losing bargain for the crown, which would have to support the Inquisition, and it was rejected. The persecutions in Peru and Mexico furnished evidence against wealthy merchants at home, which was profitably utilized. In 1635, the Pereiras, who were large contractors in Madrid, were implicated, and also, quote, the Pasariños and all the rich merchants of Seville, end quote. Then, too, Francisco Ulan of Madrid, rated at 300,000 ducats, was accused, and we hear of the arrest of Juan Rodriguez Musa, described as a wealthy merchant of Seville, it is true that when in 1633 Juan Núñez Sarabia was arrested, and his book showed a fortune of 600,000 ducats, hope was dashed by Gabriel Ortiz de Sotomayor, a member of the Suprema, who claimed the major part of it as a deposit by him as curador of Doña María Ortiz, and as executor of Don Bernabé de Vivanco. Still, a class of culprits such as these, composed of rich bankers and merchants, gave ample opportunity of swelling the assets of the Holy Office. In 1654, in an auto de fe at Cuenca, there were fifty-five Judaizers, many of them evidently in easy circumstances, one of whom said, on the way to the Brasero, that his chances of heaven were costing him two hundred thousand ducats. Yet these were uncertain resources, and we have seen that the Suprema, in its budget for 1657, only reckoned on receiving from the tribunals 755,520 marbedis, or about 2,000 ducats. But, on the other hand, in a consulta of May 11, 1676, it boasted that, within a few years, it had contributed to the royal treasury confiscations amounting to 772,748 ducats vejon, and 884,979 pesos in silver. In addition to this, the confiscations were not only defraying any deficiencies in its income, but it was gradually becoming richer, for in the years 1661 to 1668, the surplus of the Suprema and tribunals invested in government securities amounted to 21,064 ducats. Towards the end of the 17th century, the persecution of the Judaizing new Christians became sharper, 
and we have seen the large results obtained in 1679 by the Majorca Tribunal from its wholesale prosecution of the Conversos of Palma. This persecution lasted till near the middle of the 18th century, with a large number of victims, and, as they belonged in great part to the commercial class, the receipts must have been substantial. In 66 autos de fe, celebrated between 1721 and 1727, there were 776 sentences of confiscation. Many of these were unproductive, for confiscation was included in the sentence whether the culprit had property or not, and the formula, confiscación de los bienes que no tiene, of the property which he has not got, is one of frequent occurrence, but there were doubtless enough possessed of wealth to make a fair average. Then there were occasional windfalls from others than Judaizers, as in the case of Melchor Macanas in 1716. The financial management seems to not have improved since the days of Ferdinand. No account of the estate was rendered until December 31, 1723. This shows that his real estate brought in a revenue of 1,269 libras, indicating a value of about 25,000 libras. There had been collected 9,320 libras, seven sueldos, ten ducats, and expended 5,838 libras, one sueldo, leaving a balance of 3,482 libras, six sueldos, ten ducats. If the results were not greater, it was not owing to any scruples. Melchor's brother Luis had an interest of 770 doubloons on the books of the glass factory of Tortosa. It was guessed that he had not sufficient capital to justify such an investment, so the Madrid Tribunal, October 21, 1716, ordered Valencia to sequestrate it. Another piece of good fortune was the discovery, in 1727, of an organization of Moriscos who had preserved their faith and whose confiscations were so profitable that the principal informer, Diego Diaz, received as reward a perpetual pension of 100 ducats a year. As the 18th century advanced, confiscation gradually grew obsolete. Heresy had been so successfully extirpated that relaxation and reconciliation grew rarer and rarer. In the records of the Toledo Tribunal, extending to 1794, there is no sentence of confiscation later than 1738. In the census of all the tribunals, about the year 1745, there is but a single juez de los bienes, though occasionally we find that office tacked on to an inquisitorship as in Valencia in 1795, where an addition of 52 libras ten sueldos is made to the salary in consequence, but that it was sinecure is apparent from the fact that, in a record of the sentences of the tribunal, from 1780 to 1820, there is not a case of confiscation. It is not without interest to examine what was the use made of the large receipts during the early period when they were controlled by Ferdinand and Charles V, and before the Suprema monopolized them for the support of the tribunals, save on occasional concession extorted by the crown. Bulgar and Zurita loyally assure us that large as they were, the sovereigns employed them solely for the advancement of the faith, the war with Granada, the maintenance of the Inquisition, and other pious uses. Supported by these authorities, modern writers assume that no covetousness can be attributed to the sovereigns in the employment of these means for the public weal. Unfortunately, the records do not bear out these flattering assurances. The Inquisition, of course, had the first claim on the product of its labors, and its expenses were defrayed from this source. I have met with but two cases, one in 1500, and one in 1501, where a salary was paid from the royal treasury, and in both of these the recipient was Diego Lopez, member of the Suprema and royal secretary, a duplicate position which might justify calling upon either source of supply. 
during their war with Granada, ending with 1491, undoubtedly the funds derived from the industry of the Holy Office were largely employed in its prosecution, which, according to the standards of the age, was not only a patriotic, but an eminently pious use. While this drain continued, it is not likely that much of the confiscations was otherwise employed and I have met with but one or two pious gifts. In 1486, a thousand sueldos to aid in the construction of an infirmary for the Franciscan convent of Santa Maria de Jesus, and in 1491, a rent of five hundred sueldos a year to the church of San Juan of Calatayud. After the conquest of Granada, we find occasional grants to convents and churches, but they are not frequent, and as a rule are meagre in comparison with the profusion lavished on courtiers and servants. The only large recipient of bounty seems to have been Ferdinand's favorite Geronimite convent of Santa Engracia of Saragossa, to which, in 1495, he gave 13,000 sueldos for the purchase of certain lands and gardens, and in 1498, 10,000 more. There was, in addition, a yearly allowance of 6,000 sueldos for the maintenance of the frailes. The payment of this was suspended in 1498 on account of lack of funds. But Ferdinand, after some hesitation, made this good by transferring to the convent certain censos that had been appropriated to the Inquisition. In his correspondence of this period, up to 1515, there occur a few more pious expenditures, but all are of moderate amount and in no way justify the assertion that the confiscations were largely expended in this manner. The acquisitive secretary Calcena was a much more frequent beneficiary. His position gave him exceptional facilities for watching the confiscations and of profiting by his knowledge. His name continually recurs as the recipient of gifts of censos, houses, and money, and he had indirect means of participating, as we have seen when he shared in the ruin of the archdeacon of Castro. Some light is thrown on the methods in vogue when in 1500 the estate of Francisco López of Calatayud was confiscated. In this, certain houses valued at 10,000 sueldos were included, which the son of Lopez hoped to save, as belonging to his mother's dowry, but the father's papers had been seized, and the marriage settlement was inaccessible. The son thereupon promised Galsena a third of the valuation for a copy of the document. The effort failed, the houses were confiscated, and Ferdinand, compassionating Galsena's loss, not only gave him the promised third, but pledged himself to defend the title in case it should be attacked. This suggests a possible source of profit in favoring the sufferers by confiscation. Many instances have been cited above of Ferdinand's kindly consideration in mitigating exceptional cases of hardship, and we shall have occasion to refer to others. It would be pleasant to attribute them wholly to a side of his character that has not hitherto revealed itself in history. But one cannot escape an uneasy suspicion that as Calcena was the channel through which these bounties flowed, in some cases at least, the successful petitioners were those who had made it worth his while to aid them. The abuse of making to favorites grants of confiscations antedated the establishment of the Inquisition. The Cortes of 1447 petitioned against it, and Juan II assented in a fashion too equivocal to hold out much prospect of improvement. It continued, and, when the property of the new Christians came pouring in, Ferdinand yielded to the greed of his courtiers and nobles, with a profuseness which explains where much of the products of confiscation disappeared. His recklessness in this matter is illustrated by a complaint, in 1500, of the Admiral of Castile, representing that he had been given a censo on a biscondado of Cabrera, confiscated in the estate of Juan Beltran, but that certain parties to whom it had also been granted were suing him for it. 
Ferdinand evidently kept no record of these heedless gifts, for he could remember nothing as to this duplication, and he applied to the tribunal for a list of the provisions respecting the estate, so that he could decide between the claimants. His only serious collision with the Inquisition arose from this source, and he found its censures more effective than his own. His lavishness kept the tribunals drained to the point that frequently there was no money to pay the salaries. As early as 1488, the inquisitors assembled at Valladolid complained of this and supplicated the sovereigns to order receivers to provide for salaries before honoring royal drafts. If they failed to keep sufficient funds on hand for salaries, they should be subject to removal by inquisitors. This was ineffective. The royal treasury was chronically bankrupt. Endurance ceased to be a virtue, and the question came to a head at the close of 1497. On November 15th, Ferdinand wrote to receiver Juan Ruiz of Zaragoza to pay some small amounts, less than a hundred ducats in all, chiefly needed for an inspection and reform of Franciscan convents then on foot. He knew, he said, that the Saragossa tribunal was in great straits, but he could not furnish the money himself, and means must be found to raise it, without compelling him to write again. Ruiz, however, refused to make the payments, stating that the inquisitors-general had placed him under excommunication if he should pay any royal grants. Ferdinand shifted the order to the receiver of fines and penances, but the inquisitors-general had been beforehand with him by removing that official. Thus baffled, he wrote to them, January 28, 1498, telling them that these payments were absolutely necessary, and he had nothing wherewith to meet them. Besides, there were other pressing demands. The Cortes were about to meet at Saragossa, and he had ordered certain alterations in the Aljaferia to accommodate him during his residence, the cost of which Ruiz refused to pay, and the work was stopped. There was also the tomb of his father and mother, with alabaster statues, which he was building at the abbey of Poblet, the burial place of the kings of Aragon, at a cost of fifteen hundred ducats. Five thousand sueldos were due to the architect, Maestre Gil Morian, and when Ruiz refused to pay this from the confiscations, Ferdinand ordered the amount to be collected from the ground rent of Parascuellos, but it chanced that Ruiz himself owed that ground rent, and was in no haste to pay it. Meanwhile the salaries were paid, but the excommunication still hung over Ruiz, and he refused obstinately to furnish money for these needs, and for some more that were crowding in. February 28th, Ferdinand vainly endeavored to induce the Inquisitor to make Ruiz yield by excommunicating him, and he then appealed to Suarez de Fuentelsas, one of the Inquisitor's general, but equally without success. Finally, on March 30th, he wrote to Torquemada by a special messenger, with orders to bring an answer, telling him that as the salaries were paid, the excommunication must be lifted, for he would not permit it. This was successful, and on April 10th he wrote again, promising that in future he would not make grants from the confiscations and penances. On April 20th he communicated to Ruiz the removal of the excommunication, and urged the speedy completion of the alterations of the Aljaferia and the payment of Santa Gracia, of what was due. Thus ended this episode, which sheds a curious light on the relations of Ferdinand with the Inquisition, and on the precarious nature of public finance at the time. The excommunication had not been confined to Saragossa, nor was it removed elsewhere when Saragossa paid its salaries. In July, 1500, we find Ferdinand arguing with obdurate Juan de Montaña, receiver of Huesca and Lerida, that it did not apply to the completion of an old donation to the church of Lerida, which had never been fully paid. 
we hear nothing subsequently of the censure, though complaints continued of salaries in arrears, and the archdeacon of Almasan, who was inquisitor of Galataijuz, was consequently unable to pay his debts, when in 1500 he was transferred to Barcelona. The tribunal of Valencia was hopelessly bankrupt, when in 1501 there came a lucky composition, with the heirs of Juan Masip, for sixty thousand sueldos, which Ferdinand ordered to be applied to its liabilities, so that, for once, it might be out of debt. It is scarce necessary to add that Ferdinand's promise to make no more grants was violated almost as soon as made. In the profusion which kept the tribunals exhausted, it by no means followed that those who had no influence profited by the royal favor. In 1493, Ferdinand granted to Leonor Hernández two thousand sueldos as a marriage portion. Under various pretexts, payment was evaded. Leonor married and died, leaving the claim to her husband and brother, who in 1502 procured from Ferdinand an order for its immediate settlement, but whether this was honored is problematical. Even more delayed was a concession in 1491 to Martin Marin of Calatayud, of three thousand sueldos on the confiscations of his father and mother-in-law. In 1512 Marin represented that he had never been able to obtain it, and Ferdinand ordered its payment forthwith. These postponements were not always due to poverty. In 1491 a grant was made to Anton del Mur, royal alguacil of a vineyard, forming part of the confiscated estate of Pascual de Santa Cruz. Receiver Ruiz of Saragossa made answer that the vineyard had been sold, but when the king ordered him to make over the proceeds to Del Mur, the latter got nothing, and Ruiz managed fraudulently to keep the vineyard in the hands of a third party. After nineteen years, Del Mur, in 1510, revived the matter when Ferdinand ordered the inquisitor and receiver to find out who held the vineyard, and by what title, and, if it was not found that Ruiz had sold it for a just price, Del Mur was to be placed in possession. End of Book 5, Chapter 1, Part 5 Recording by Guero Book Five, Chapter One, Part Six of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Guero. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two, by Henry Charles Lee. Book Five, Resources, Chapter One, Part Six confiscation. The eagerness for these spoils was such that claims for them were put in without waiting for confiscation to be decreed, and it is evident that, when a man of wealth was arrested, there were agencies to convey the news to the expectants, and the prey was divided before the query was killed. After Isabella's death in 1504, these grants were an economical way to secure the fluctuating allegiance of the Castilian nobles which philip of austria was ready to exploit and the nobles eager to profit by when the licenciado de medina of valladolid was arrested the admiral of castile fadrique enriquez petitioned him at once for the confiscation and philip from brussels may five fifteen o five granted the request repeating it six months later while awaiting juana's confinement before sailing for spain the two spouses on September 12th, sent orders to all the cities, the nobles and officials, not to obey Ferdinand, or to pay taxes to him, and the receivers of the tribunals were specially told to withhold from him the confiscations. Philip's orders from Flanders, however, received scant respect, and his reign in Castile was too transitory for him to exercise any notable influence on the disposition of the confiscations. As for Ferdinand, what he granted with one hand he withheld with the other. February 23, 1510, 
he issued a cedula to all receivers, saying that, in consequence of the falling off in confiscations, if all the grants which he had made, and was making, were paid, the officials would not receive their salaries, and would abandon the work, to the great disservice of God. Wherefore, in future, no matter what orders he or the Inquisitor-General might issue, no grants were to be paid until all officials had received their salaries and ajudas de costa, and, when such grants were presented, he or the Inquisitor-General was to be consulted. The rule was to be that debts must be paid first, then salaries, and grants not until the last. Yet, on the day previous, he had given to Fernando de Masueco, a member of the Suprema, certain olive orchards and censos confiscated on Gonzalo Jimenez of Seville. The same day he ordered the receiver of Jaén to deduct twenty thousand maravedis from the appraised value of some confiscated houses wanted by Dr. Juan de Sontojo, former judge of confiscations of Jaén and he continued making gifts with reckless prodigality as though the royal treasurer were overflowing and the inquisition were richly endowed in january the admiral of castile had had a grant of houses valued at eight or nine thousand sueldos and on april second he ordered the receivers of toledo seville cordoba and jaen each to pay three hundred seventy five thousand maravedis or one million five hundred thousand in all to his servant juan rodriguez de porto carrero apparently it was exceptional for the inquisition to enjoy the product of its exertions for in may we find him assuring the suprema that no one had asked him for a confiscation of one hundred thousand maravedis just made in valladolid and that he will reserve it for the known necessities of that tribunal and in july that although he has been much importuned for another confiscation he will make no grant of it so that the officials shall not suffer want it is needless to point out what a stimulus this state of things gave to the condemnation of those whose estates promised relief ferdinand went on precisely as before and it would be superfluous to multiply instances of his reckless profusion save that we may mention a gift to his wife queen germain in 1515 of ten thousand florins from the confiscations of sicily and we may recall his attempted grant of ten thousand ducats to the marquis of denia from the composition of cordoba in this general scramble for fragments of the spoils there is one point that may be noted the demand for attractive slave girls how their existence came to be known to those who asked for them we can only guess and it would be indiscreet to inquire why reverend members of the suprema seem to be especially desirous of such acquisitions april seventh fifteen ten ferdinand writes to the receiver of cartagena that he is told that in the confiscated property of romando martin de santa cruz there is a moorish female slave named alia if this is so she is to be delivered to dr perez gonzalo manso of the suprema to be his property as a gift march eighteenth fifteen fourteen the licenciado ferrando de masuecos of the suprema petitions for a moorish slave girl confiscated among the property of juan de tena of ciudad real and ferdinand orders her to be given to him to do what he pleases with her there was some contest over fatima a white moorish slave girl confiscated in the estate of alonso sanchez del castillo the marquis of bigena asked for her and ferdinand granted his request june fifteen fifteen fourteen but when the order was sent to toledo the deputy receiver refused to obey it alleging that it was obtained by false representations as the suprema had already given her to the fiscal martin jimenez this was promptly answered in a letter signed not only by calcena but by the members of the suprema reiterating the grant to vigena and ordering the receiver to compensate jimenez for her value it is suggestive that no such eagerness is shown to obtain male slaves ferdinand himself was not above appropriating articles found among the spoils of his subjects in fifteen o two we find him taking fifty-five pearls from sardinia a part of the confiscation of miser rejadel burnt for heresy 
Sometimes he did not even wait for the conviction of the owner, as in the case of a horse, which in 1501 he gave to the inquisitor of Cordoba, and then, on learning that the animal would be serviceable to him in the chase, he had it sent to him and ordered four thousand maravedis to be paid to the inquisitor, wherewith to buy a horse or mule. He was even more unscrupulous in 1501, when in Granada, on hearing of the death of Bernaldaja, a prisoner not yet convicted, he ordered that the garden belonging to him in the Rambla should be seized and given to the Princess Juana for her pastime, although he did not know whether it had been sequestrated. It manifests the abiding confidence felt in the conviction of all who fell into the hands of the Inquisition. Yet it would be unjust to Ferdinand not to allude again to the numerous cases in which he softened the hardships of confiscations by concessions to the sufferers or their representatives, and this, when, as we have seen, his own treasury was empty. No doubt in many instances the influence of Calcena was purchased, but as a whole they are too numerous not to find their origin in a kindliness which has been deemed foreign to the stern consolidator of the Spanish monarchy. Nor could Calcena have ventured to presume too far, during a long series of years, in making his master an unconscious almoner. Two or three examples of this must suffice to show the spirit actuating him. In 1509, Juan de Peralta of Segovia betrothed himself to Francisca Nunez, daughter of Lope de Molina and his wife, who were prisoners of the tribunal of Jaén. They were condemned and burnt, their estate was confiscated, and Peralta petitioned the king, saying that he could not marry without a dowry and begging an allowance out of the estate whereupon Ferdinand ordered the receiver to give them two hundred thousand maravedis. The Inquisition was not to be balked. Francisca, in turn, was tried and reconciled with confiscation. Peralta made another appeal, and this time Ferdinand granted twenty thousand maravedis. October 21, 1500, he writes to the receiver of León to release Leonor González, reconciled, a vineyard confiscated on her, of the value of two thousand maravedis, because she is poor and has a daughter to marry. In 1510 he instructs receiver Badilla of Barcelona to collect from the bishop of Urgel ninety libras due to the confiscated estate of Guillén Dalla, and in view of the poverty and misery of Beatriz, Violante, Isabel, and Aldonza, his daughters, the money is to be paid to them. There was also an old debt due to Tala by Ferdinand's father, Juan II. This he orders to be collected from the rents of property set aside for the benefit of Juan Sol, and to also be paid to the daughters. These are only examples of numerous similar acts, which afford a welcome sense of relief as mitigations in some small degree of the miseries inflicted on thousands of the helpless through the pitiless enforcement of the cruel laws of the Church. It would be wrong not to bear testimony also to the spirit of justice, which is apparent in many of Ferdinand's decisions of questions brought before him. Thus on January 8, 1502, in instructing a receiver about a censo, in dispute with Galceran de Santangel, he concludes by telling him to act without legal delays, so that justice may be administered with rectitude and promptitude, and that nothing may be taken but what belongs to the fisc, without wronging any one. September 12, 1502, he wrote that Garcia Quartz complains that he had granted him certain censos, and, then by a second letter, had stopped the transfer, whereupon he now orders the matter to be settled, according to justice, without reference to what he may have written to the contrary. For it is not his will to inflict wrong on any one, it would be easy to multiply these examples from his confidential correspondence with officials when there could have been no possible object in a hypocritical affectation of fairness. If he not infrequently rebuked inquisitors and receivers for negligence in gathering in confiscations, it may be truly said that he more often scolded them for undue harshness and delay in settling honest claims. The pressure on Ferdinand for grants from the confiscations continued to the last, and was yielded to more often than prudence would dictate. 
the courtiers maintained intelligence with the tribunals to obtain advices in advance of the arrest or condemnation of wealthy conversos in order to make early application and occasional letters from the king to receivers asking information as to such estates and forbidding their sale without further orders indicate a growing sense on his part of the necessity of caution one of his latest utterances as mortal sickness was stealing over him is a letter of september twenty three fifteen fifteen to the receiver of toledo in reply apparently to a statement thus furnished he had received he says the information as to the confiscated property of pero diaz and his wife and also the representation as to the pressing needs of the tribunal in consideration of which he will change his mind and make no grants from it except of a hundred thousand maravedis to his treasurer vargas to reimburse him for certain outlays thus to the end was maintained the struggle between those who labored for the harvest and those who sought to reap its fruits when after his death jimenez sought to bring order into the finances of the inquisition he seems to have felt that his conjoined power as inquisitor-general and governor was insufficient to remedy these abuses and he procured from the young king charles a pragmatica dated at ghent june fourteen fifteen seventeen which was assuredly drafted by him this recites that the salaries and ordinary expenses of the inquisition are defrayed by the confiscations but experience shows that often they cannot be paid in consequence of the grants made by the crown this must be remedied or the inquisition cannot be sustained to the great damage of the royal conscience and therefore during the good pleasure of the king and until the salaries and ordinary expenses are provided for no graces donations or reliefs are to be complied with under pain of a thousand gold ducats copies of this are to be sent to every tribunal and all officials are exhorted to see to its enforcement the gloss put on this by cardinal adrian when sending it to the tribunal of sicily shows that there was no scruple in construing its provisions most liberally he says that he has heard that many are obtaining grants on the sicilian confiscations what was collected under ferdinand must be used as he had ordered which was to buy rents for the support of the tribunal the new pragmatica postpones all grants to the salaries and charges of the inquisition and as sicily must provide for the support of the suprema and of some of the home tribunals it can be alleged in refusing to pay all grants that are presented wherefore none must be paid without consulting him having issued this pragmatica charles proceeded to nullify it with all convenient speed but it served as a justification to the receivers in withstanding him three months later on september nineteenth he landed in spain surrounded by a crowd of hungry and greedy flemish favorites eager to enrich themselves at the expense of their master and his subjects this reinforcement of the importunate native beggars made the profusion of ferdinand seem niggardly by comparison peter martyr tells us that the flemings in less than ten months after their arrival had already sent home eleven hundred thousand ducats drawn partly from the indulgence of the santa cruzada and partly from the inquisition for they obtained grants not only of estates confiscated but also of those of prisoners still under trial showing how promptly they established relations which gave them secret information of the operation of the tribunals and how little chance of escape had the unlucky prisoners whose estates would have to be refunded if they were not convicted this was one of the abuses of which the cure was sought in the project of reform in fifteen eighteen which failed through the death of jean le sauvage the booty thus secured by the flemings shows how the confiscations had increased under this pressure especially as the spaniards were no less eager if not quite so fortunate this thoughtless prodigality of charles is emphasized by the fact that he was impoverished in the midst of his profuseness july five fifteen nineteen we find him ordering the receiver of cartagena to pay the paltry sum of thirty ducats to fernando de salmeron receiver-general of the suprema to reimburse him for a loan of that amount 
the receivers did all they could to check these extravagant liberalities for large as were the receipts the tribunals were threatened with bankruptcy saragossa in reporting march eighteen fifteen nineteen to the suprema some impending convictions endeavored to avert the dissipation of the results by representing its poverty the salaries of most of the officials were more than a year in arrears and if the king did not exercise more restraint the tribunal could no longer be maintained one or two instances of the struggles between the receivers and the recipients of the royal bounty will illustrate the existing conditions and incidentally show how adrian and the suprema were forced to bow to the tempest and to connive at the pillage of the resources of the holy office a letter of charles january nineteen fifteen nineteen to juan del pozo receiver of toledo relates how he had granted to monsieur de setebrun of his bodyguard the confiscation of alonso de baena and had ordered pozo to convert it into money and pay it to him how pozo had subsequently been notified that setebrun had sold it to inigo de baena son of alonso and had been ordered to deliver it to the latter how neither of them had been able to make him surrender it how another royal order had been served on him and then one from adrian and the suprema with no result save an assertion that he had no funds how baena had made four journeys to madrid to his great loss and expense the whole winding up with peremptory command to obey the repeated mandates without further delay or excuse it is probable that still more energetic measures were requisite to get the property for pozo was an obstinate man a letter from charles to him september five fifteen nineteen refers to an order on him for six hundred ducats in favor of monsieur baldre which remained unpaid in spite of repeated commands from the king and cardinal adrian whereat baldre is much aggrieved especially as he has been keeping a man in toledo at his expense to collect it charles now orders it to be paid within sixty days in default of which Bosso must within twenty days thereafter present himself at the court wherever it may chance to be with all his books and papers for examination this was a most formidable threat and perhaps brought Bosso to terms for on december second we find him ordered to pay on sight four hundred ducats to la scholz as procurator of the toison d'or and the next day five hundred more to jean vignacourt a gentleman of the royal chamber cristobal de prado receiver of cuenca was another troublesome subject charles granted to cortavila and armastorf two of his chamberlains the confiscated estate of francisco martinez and his wife it must have been a large one for a suggestion was made of giving the courtiers four thousand ducats and reserving two thousand to pay the salaries but they demanded the whole and charles april ten fifteen eighteen ordered it to be turned over to them and if any part had been converted to the use of the inquisition it was to be made good out of other confiscations prado staved it off for nearly eighteen months pretending to hesitate about including the dowries and marriage portions of the children until charles september five fifteen nineteen ordered all these to be swept into the grant soon after this on november ninth there was another crop of confiscations at an auto de fe at cuenca when in preparation for fresh bounties salmeron the receiver-general was ordered to report as to their value and also as to the condition of the salaries and other indebtedness this probably deprived prado of excuses for a while and we hear of no more refusals to pay until april sixteenth fifteen twenty the duke of escalona had asked for the confiscations of three of his vassals at alarcon amounting to three hundred and fifty ducats but prado alleged that only two of the parties named had been condemned and that the order therefore must be surreptitious he wrote in this sense to charles and to the suprema but on september seventh he was commanded to pay it and the letter was signed by doctor manso of the suprema and countersigned by cardinal adrian cuenca at this time must have been a mine of wealth just before sailing from coruna charles on may eight fifteen twenty ordered prado to pay a thousand ducats to antoine de coy two hundred to henri d'espinel 
four hundred to Simon Fisnal, Majordomo to Charles de Croy, Prince of Chimay, and five hundred to Adolf, Duke of Cleves. On October twenty third, Charles writes that his secretary, Guy Modijon, had been charged with these collections, reported that Prado refused to pay them, but he adds that, as there are now funds sufficient, after paying salaries and expenses, and the thousand ducats to Cardinal Adrian, they must be paid in preference to subsequent grants. As Adrian had been given an interest in this heavy raid on Cuenca, it is probable that Prado was coerced into obedience. Our old friend Vijasis of Seville was wary and experienced, and accustomed to hard blows. He gave the courtiers infinite trouble, but the cases in which he was involved were too numerous to be detailed here, and space can only be found for one of five hundred ducats to Francisco Guzman and Antonio Tobar, gentlemen of the king's chamber. This had originally been drawn on Cuenca, but Prado had been found too impervious and it was transferred to Seville. Vijasis evaded it until Charles, on May 6, 1519, threatened him with Merced, being placed at the king's mercy, if it was not paid at once. This was serious, but Vijasis was unmoved and merely replied that he had no money to pay the overdue salaries, besides large sums owing for services and for judgments rendered against the confiscations. The affair dragged on, until on August 23, 1520, Adrian and the Suprema ordered immediate settlement, in default of which an agent would be sent, at his expense, to do it personally. This was probably effective, as we hear no more of it. Aliaga of Valencia was one of Ferdinand's oldest and most trusted receivers, and had given evidence of similar powers of resistance if we may judge from the anticipatory measures taken when the interests of the powerful favorite, the Prince of Chimay, were involved. When news was brought to the court of the reconciliation and confiscation of the wealthy Alonso de Abeja of Valencia, a speedy partition was made among the vultures. Eight hundred ducats were assigned to Jean de Baudre and Philibert de la Bonne, gentlemen of the chamber, three hundred to another gentleman, Jaime de la Trujera, and the rest of the estate to the Prince of Chimay, after paying salaries, if they could not be met out of other confiscations. Orders to this effect were dispatched to Aliaga, July 5, 1519, with a pressing letter from Charles to the inquisitors. Apparently, the beneficiaries felt that more active measures were necessary. Simontis Not, the Prince's Mayordomo, was empowered to receive the property, and, as his agent, Guy Morijon, was sent to Valencia, July ninth, with letters to the inquisitors, to the governor of Valencia, and to Aliaga. The inquisitors were told that as the clause concerning salaries might be so construed as to consume the whole, they must order Aliaga, under pain of excommunication, to deliver to Chimay's agent, within three days, all the properties, goods, debts, and money of the confiscation except the eleven hundred ducats to the other courtiers. If the necessities of the tribunal required any portion, it must be very moderate, so that she may, if possible, might get the whole. The governor was ordered to help these not, and to urge the inquisitors to compel Aliaga to obey. Aliaga was told that under pain of deprivation of office, he must deliver the estate to Morijon, within three days, and must strain every nerve to meet the needs of the tribunal from other sources, so that she may, may suffer no deduction. If the salvation of the monarchy had depended on the realization of the grants, the letter could scarce have been more vehement. Yet it was all in vain. Aliaga was imperturbable, and on December 8th Charles expressed his displeasure that the eleven hundred ducats had not yet been paid though he had postponed to them the grant to Chimay, but it is not likely that his vague threats, in case of further delay, proved effective. In this carnival of plunder there is small risk in assuming that the pressure on the tribunals gave a stimulus to the prosecution of the richer class of the conversos, and that wealth became more than ever a source of danger. In fact, the number of large estates referred to in these transactions would seem to indicate 
that few escaped whose sacrifice would supply needful funds to the Inquisition, while ministering to the greed of the courtiers. It need occasion no surprise, therefore, if the threatened new Christians, in their despair, appealed to Leo X, and rendered it worth his while to remonstrate with Charles. Yet the latter, while scattering ducats by the thousand among his sycophants, had the effrontery to instruct his envoy, Lope Hurtado de Mendoza, September 24, 1519, to disabuse the Pope as to the accusation that the Inquisition was prosecuting the rich for the confiscations, the truth being that all, or nearly all, of those prosecuted were poor, and that the fisc had to support them while in prison, and to pay their advocates and procurators. After Charles's departure in May 1520 to assume the imperial dignity, we hear of a few new grants. He was rapidly ripening under the weight of the tremendous responsibilities accumulated upon him, and was recognizing that his position implied other duties than the gratification of his courtier's greed. It would seem that he willingly shifted upon the inquisitor-general and suprema the burden of such trivial matters, and left it to them to assent to, or dissent from, such graces as he might bestow. A grant from a confiscation at Zaragoza, dated at Brussels, October 1, 1520, bears the formula that it is with the assent and advice of the Inquisitor-General and Council of Aragon, and, though it is signed by Hugo de Urries by order of the Emperor, it has the vidmus of Cardinal Adrian. Practically thus the control was lodged with the Suprema, whose needs, as we have seen, prevented any accumulations in the tribunals, and we hear little or nothing subsequently of this dissipation of the confiscations. If I have entered thus minutely into the details of this branch of inquisitorial activity, it is because its importance has scarce been recognized by those who have treated of the Inquisition. It not only supplied the means of support to the institution during its period of greatest activity, but it was recognized by the inquisitors themselves as their most potent weapon and the one most dreaded by the industrious classes which formed their chief field of labor. Its potency is the measure of the misery which it inflicted through long generations on the innocent and helpless, far transcending the agonies of those who perished at the stake. To it was largely owing the ultimate extinction of Judaism in Spain, for the exalted heroism which might dare the horrors of the Brasero, might well give way before the prospect of poverty to be endured by disinheriting offspring. To it also is greatly attributable the stagnation of Spanish commerce and industry, for trade could not flourish when credit was impaired, and confidence could not exist when merchants and manufacturers of the highest standing might at any moment fall into the hands of the tribunal and all their assets be impounded. Even the liberality of the Spanish Inquisition in not confiscating the debts due by the heretic was but a slender mitigation of this, for the creditor was liable to ruin through the difficulties and delays interposed on the realization of his credits, and past transactions were not secure until protected by a prescription of forty years. The Inquisition came at a time when geographical discovery was revolutionizing the world's commerce when the era of industrialism was dawning, and the future belonged to the nations which should have fewest trammels in adapting themselves to the new developments. The position of Spain was such as to give it control of the illimitable possibilities of the future, but it blindly threw away all its advantages into the lapse of heretic Holland and England. Many causes, too intricate to be discussed here, contributed to this, but not the least among them was the bleeding to anemia through centuries of the productive classes, and the insecurity which the enforcement of confiscation cast over all the operations of commerce and industry. End of Book 5, Chapter 1, Part 6 Recording by Guero Book 5, Chapter 2 of The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Bloomfield. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 5, Resources. Chapter 2, Fines and Penances. Although, at least in the earlier period, confiscation was the main financial reliance of the Inquisition, it had other resources. Of these, a productive one was a pecuniary penance, which the tribunals had discretionary power of imposing on those whose offenses amounted only to suspicion of heresy, and not to the formal heresy which entailed reconciliation or relaxation with confiscation. Almsgiving and satisfaction of sin formed a feature of ecclesiastical practice, and, in the Middle Ages, the schoolmen had no difficulty in proving that pecuniary penance was more efficacious than any other. And it certainly was more efficacious in the sense that the enormous possessions of the church were largely gathered from this source. Moreover, the inquisitor inherited from his medieval predecessors an undefined duplicate function of confessor and judge. His culprits were penitents, and the punishments he inflicted were penances. Even when the canon law required the hardened or relapsed heretics to be relaxed to the secular arm for burning, they are sometimes alluded to as penitenciados. When, under the early edicts of grace, penitents by the thousand flocked to confess their sins and escape corporal penalties and confiscation, the inquisitor was instructed to make them give as alms a portion of their property according to the quality of the person and the character and duration of his offenses, and these penitentias pecuniarias were to be applied to the war with Granada as to the most pious of causes. Thus, at the start, pecuniary penance and almsgiving were regarded as convertible terms, both equally applicable to the discretionary fines which the inquisitor could impose on his penitent. There was a technical though not a practical, distinction between these and the mulks inflicted on offenders for other than spiritual offenses in the exercise of the royal jurisdiction conferred on the holy office. They formed together a common fund, which was known as that of the penas e penitentias, the fines and penances, of which the former were drawn from the secular and the latter from the spiritual jurisdiction. This distinction at best was shadowy, and though it was observed at first, in time the tribunals grew indifferent and recognized that penance was punishment. The earliest formality is seen in the case of Brianda de Bardaxi, where the Consulta de Fe, March 18, 1492, pronounces her guilty of vehement suspicion to be penanced at the discretion of the inquisitors. Accordingly, on March 20th, the inquisitors deliberated on the penance and pronounced an impositio penitentiae, consisting of five years' imprisonment with certain spiritual observances, and moreover we penance her in the third part of all her property, which we apply to the coffer of penances of this tribunal and to the costs of her trial, which third part, or its true value, we order to be paid within ten days to Martin de Cota, receiver of penances. By the middle of the 16th century, this scruple was overcome. In the case of Marie Serrana at Toledo in 1545, the Consulta de Fe, it is true, votes that she be penance in a third of her property, but the public sentence, which customarily did not specify the amount, after enumerating certain spiritual observances, adds, also the pecuniary punishment imposed on her, for a certain reason, is reserved for the present. So, in the case of Marie Gomez, in 1551, it is stated that she is condemned in twenty ducats for the expense of the tribunal, which she is to pay within nine days to the receiver. When the sentence was read to her in the audience chamber, she asked how she was to pay the twenty ducats, and was told it would come out of the property sequestrated at her arrest. Sequestration, we may observe, enabled the tribunal to help itself at discretion from the culprit's property and to proportion the penalty to his ability. There was an advantage to the Inquisition in considering these fines as penitential, 
for penance was part of the sacrament of absolution which was an ecclesiastical function the proceeds of which were controlled by the church and it differed thus wholly from confiscation it is true that practically this was merely a verbal juggle for the inquisitor did not absolve and as he was not necessarily a priest his office did not comprise the administration of the sacraments but the verbal juggle sufficed and serves to explain the rigid separation of the funds arising from penance and from confiscation even after both were controlled by the inquisition we have seen volume one page three thirty eight the prolonged struggle made by ferdinand to obtain possession of the penances which finally terminated in favor of the inquisition this was rather beneficial to the accused as the tribunal would be inclined to find him guilty only of suspicion of heresy enabling it to inflict a pecuniary penance for its own benefit rather than a formal heresy which inferred confiscation of course this passed away when financial control practically lapsed to the suprema but the distinction between the funds was still maintained in the earlier period the distinction was emphasized by the office of special receiver for the penances who seems to have been subject to the inquisitor general while the receiver of confiscations held from the king thus the sentence of brianda de bardaxi shows us martin dakota as receiver of penances in saragossa in 1492 and we still hear of him in that position in 1497 while ferdinand had as his own receiver juan denbin succeeded by juan roiz as early as 1486 esteve costa was receptor de las penitencias in valencia whose salary of fifty libras shows the office to be of much less importance than that of the receiver of confiscations still there came to be no settled rule about this in fourteen ninety eight juan royce was receiver of both penances and confiscations in saragossa and in valencia juan de monasterio was inquisitor and at the same time receiver of penances while in fifteen twelve in barcelona the fiscal also filled the latter office as we learn from his salary being suspended until he should render an account of his receipts as late as fifteen fifteen there was still a special receiver of penances in huesca the canon pero perez whose death revealed him to be a defaulter to the extent of four thousand sueldos when the office was consolidated with that of the receivership in fifteen sixteen among his other reforms ximenes abolished this special office and put the fines and penances in the hands of the receivers of confiscations with instructions however to keep the funds separate and not to disperse the fines and penances except on orders from the inquisitor general there had previously been in the suprema a receiver general of fines and penances an office which was likewise suppressed and all the revenues were placed in charge of a single official a regulation which was confirmed by Benrique in 1524. There was difficulty in preventing the unauthorized collection of these funds by other officials, with the consequent absence of responsibility and risk of embezzlement. In Instructions for the Prevention of Abuses, October 10, 1546, it is prescribed that all fines be paid to the receiver. Again, August 20, 1547, it is ordered that neither the inquisitors nor other officials save the receiver shall collect the penances or other monies inspection of the barcelona tribunal in fifteen forty nine showed that this was not obeyed other officials made the collections and they were not reported to the receiver all of which was forbidden for the future but the order of fifteen forty seven had to be repeated december fourth fifteen fifty one may ninth fifteen fifty three and December 20th, 1555. Evidently, there were leaks which the Suprema was vainly seeking to stop. A special commission was issued January 12th, 1549 to Geronimo Zorita as contador for the kingdoms of Aragon to audit the accounts of all receivers, past, present, and to come, concerning the fines and penances and other parties caswells, with full powers to send for persons and papers under such penalties as he might designate which is highly significant 
Possibly his investigations led to a carta acordada of September 23, 1551, which states that in some tribunals some of the pecuniary penalties are not entered in the book of punishments. The notaries of sequestrations are therefore impressively ordered under holy obedience and major excommunication, leto sententiae, to make such entries when sentence is rendered, stating whether they are applicable to the Inquisition or to some pious work, so that the contador may know whether they are collected, and all fines thus omitted are to be deducted from the salaries of the notaries. As by this time the fines and penalties were invariably applied to the Inquisition, the pretense of appropriating to pious uses was presumably a mere device for embezzling them. The Suprema evidently had no doubts as to this, when the inquisitors of Barcelona, in the case of Piero de Gauzaga, imposed a penance of three hundred ducats and appropriated twenty-five to the convent of En Señora de los Ángeles, twenty-five to the nuns of San Geronimo, and the remainder to beds and garments for the poor. It told them, in 1568, that all fines were for the expenses of the Inquisition and required them, within thirty days, to furnish authentic evidence of the disposition made of the two hundred and fifty ducats under pain of rigorous proceedings against them as for holding the notaries responsible there was manifest injustice in this for they were powerless to prevent fraud by the inquisitors in fifteen twenty five some instructions to the tribunal of sicily mentioned that the notary had repeatedly and vainly requested that notice be given to him of all penances in order that he might charge them to the receiver. How reckless sometimes were the inquisitors appears in the case in the murder of Juan Antonio Manigat, deputy receiver at Puiserda. In 1565, the three Barcelona inquisitors inflicted on the accused certain heavy fines which were duly collected and placed in the coffer with three keys, after which they coolly helped themselves to a thousand reals apiece, under pretext that it was for fees in trying the case. On this being discovered in the inspection by de Soto Salazar, the Suprema ordered the money to be returned to the coffer and satisfactory evidence of the restitution to be furnished within thirty days. The distinction between the confiscations and the fines and penances was rigidly maintained when both were concentrated in the hands of the receiver. A special commission was issued to authorize him to receive the latter, and he was straightly instructed to keep the accounts separate. The confiscations were devoted to salaries and, if there was an overplus, to investments of a more or less permanent character, while the fines and penances were levied, as the formula of the sentences habitually expressed it, for the gastos extraordinarios, the other and extraordinary expenses of the tribunals. Still, when the confiscations ran short, there was no hesitation in drawing upon the other fund, although a special order of the Suprema was necessary for its authorization. Ayudas de Costa were generally drawn from the fines and penances, though frequently the receiver is told to pay them out of any funds in hand. In 1525, Manrique directed the house rents of the officials to be paid from the fines and penances. In 1540, Tavera granted, from the same fund in Valencia, 3,000 sueldos to the nunnery of Santa Julia, as the dowry of a reconciled morisca, placed there to save her soul. In 1543 he calls upon the receiver of Granada to furnish, from the same source, 200 ducats to Juan Martinez Lesau, secretary of the Suprema, on the occasion of his marriage. In 1557 the inquisitors of Saragossa were allowed, in the same manner, to defray the cost of alterations in the Aljaferia. In short, this fund was expected to meet the innumerable miscellaneous expenses of the tribunals and to supply all deficiencies rendering the inquisitors watchful to keep it abundantly supplied. There were occasions when penances replaced confiscations to the manifest advantage of the tribunals. Thus, in 1519, when the estate of Fernando de Villarreal was subject to confiscation, Charles V authorized the inquisitors to impose on him such penance as they deemed fit and released to him the surplus. It is not likely that this surplus was allowed to be large, for when in 1535 the tribunal of Valencia was trying the bachelor Molina and learned that the viceroy had promised Molina's wife that, in case of confiscation, he would ask the emperor to forego it, 
The inquisitors wrote to the Suprema that they proposed not to confiscate his property, but to impose a penance of something less than its value. This indicates that the penances were not subject to the crown, and thus it exposes the disingenuousness of the Suprema in replying to a petition of Valencia in the Cortes of Monzon in 1537 that the Inquisition should be restrained from penancing the Moriscos. It argued that these pecuniary penances were applied to the royal treasury and that His Majesty should not be asked to remit them or be required to supplicate the Pope to revoke what the canons prescribe. The canons prescribed confiscation, but there was no hesitation, as we have just seen, in substituting penance. The largest scale on which this was tried was in the kingdoms of Aragon, where the Moriscos were mostly vassals of the gentry and nobles, who suffered when they were impoverished and their lands were taken. The Fueros of Valencia provided that feudal lands confiscated, whether for heresy or other cause, should revert to the Lord and this was repeatedly sworn to by Ferdinand and Charles, but the Inquisition calmly disregarded all laws and insisted on confiscating for its own benefit. Even a brief of Paul III, August 2, 1546, decreeing that for ten years and subsequently, at the pleasure of the Holy See, there should be no confiscations or pecuniary penances inflicted on the Moriscos, received no attention, and the practical answer to the remonstrances of the Cortes of 1564 was a specific instruction from the Suprema to the Valencia Tribunal to go on confiscating, no matter what the people might say about their privileges. Aragon, meanwhile, had obtained in 1534 a pragmatica by which Charles renounced his right to the Morisco confiscations, which were to revert to the heirs or be distributed as intestate, and to this the assent of the Suprema was secured. This was, however, practically nullified, for in 1547 the Cortes complained that confiscations were replaced by penances greater than the wealth of the culprits, who were obliged to sell all their property and, in addition, to impoverish their kindred, to which the Suprema loftily replied that, if anyone was aggrieved, he could appeal to it or to the inquisitors. A lucrative bargain was finally made with Valencia, which had the largest Morisco population. In 1537, the Cortes proposed that, for a payment of 400 ducats a year, the Inquisition should abstain from penancing the Moriscos, but the Suprema refused, on the ground that it would be a disservice to God. It was shrewd in this, for, in 1571, it secured an agreement under which, for an annual payment of 50,000 sueldos, 2,500 ducats, it abandoned confiscation and limited penance to ten ducats, the payment of which was rendered secure by levying it on the alhamas of the culprits. Favorable as was this, the inquisitors did not restrain themselves to its observance. In the auto de fe of January 7, 1607, there was a penance of fifty ducats, one of thirty and one of twenty, and while there were only eight reconciliations, there were twenty penances of ten ducats. The Suprema took exception to this, saying that, without reconciliation, the fines were uncalled for, in the absence of some special offense. The agreement, in fact, was one under which the gains of the tribunal were limited only by its industry, for there was no lack of Morisco apostates. The little village of Mislata, near the city, must have been well-nigh bankrupted, for it was liable for the penances of its inhabitants of whom there were eighty-three penanced in 1591 and seventeen in 1592. As confiscations diminished throughout Spain, the unrestricted power to impose fines and penances came in opportunely to fill deficiencies. They could be levied in a vast variety of cases, not only for suspicion of heresy and for faltership, but for bigamy, blasphemy, ill-sounding expressions, and all offenses against the tribunal and its officials, as well as for those of the officials themselves and the familiars. The temporal jurisdiction especially afforded large opportunities, for the defendant, whether he was a familiar or an outsider, could always be fined for the benefit of the tribunal, and this was rarely omitted. It was no secret within the Holy Office that this discretional power was to be exercised, not in accordance with the merits of the case, but with the needs of the Inquisition. As early as 1538, this was intimated in the instructions to Inquisitor Valdiolite of Navarre, 
when sent on a visitation to investigate witchcraft. He was forbidden to inflict confiscations, but was told he could impose fines and penances, in proportion to the offenses and wealth of the culprits, in order to meet the expenses and enable the receiver to pay salaries. In time, the Suprema grew more outspoken. A carta acordada of October 22, 1575, told inquisitors that they could impose pecuniary penalties while on visitations, as well as when sitting in the tribunal, and must bear in mind the poverty of the Suprema, as well as the wealth of the culprits and the character of the offense. This was repeated in 1580, and in 1595 attention was called to the necessity of relieving the wants of the Inquisition in this manner, an exhortation repeated in 1624. This stimulation was apparently superfluous, for the Inquisitors exploited their powers in this respect to a degree that sometimes moved even the Suprema to reproof. In a visitation of Garona and Elm by Dr. Zorita of Barcelona in 1564, we find him inflicting fines and penances continually of four, six, ten, twenty, thirty, or one hundred ducats, apparently limited only by the means of the victim. His colleague, Dr. Mejia, on a visitation penanced Damien Cortez in one hundred ducats because thirty years before, when someone told him to trust in God, he had exclaimed, Trust in God! By trusting in God last year I lost fifty ducats. And when Juan Barbero made a comment on this sentence, he was fined twenty ducats and costs. When this last exploit was reported by de Soto Salazar, the Suprema ordered the fines to be refunded, as it also did with those inflicted by Mejia of sixty, forty, and fifteen ducats, on the bail of Indoli and two jurados, for an offense so trifling that their names were ordered to be stricken from the records. When sitting as a tribunal, these inquisitors were even more liberal to themselves, for they fined the abbot of Kippel four hundred ducats for keeping a nun as a mistress, an offense wholly outside of their jurisdiction. As late as 1687, the tribunal of Logroño furnished a flagrant instance of this abuse of arbitrary power, when it excommunicated and fined in two hundred ducats D. Miguel Urban de Espinosa, a knight of Santiago, and familiar because when summoned to attend at the publication of the Edict of Faith, he sought to enter the church while wearing a sword. The Inquisitor General promptly ordered his absolution and suspended the fine until further information. The receipts from penances, although fluctuating, were a substantial addition to income. In the Seville auto de fe of May 13, 1585, a penitent accused of Lutheranism was penanced in 100 ducats, a bigamist in 200 provided it did not exceed half his property. For asserting fornication to be no sin, one man was penanced in two hundred ducats or less, according to his wealth, another in two hundred, and two in one thousand merevedis apiece, while, for concealing heretics, there was a penance of fifty ducats. In all, the auto yielded eight hundred fifty ducats and two thousand merevedis. Even more productive was the auto of June fourteenth, 1579 at Yerena, where the tribunal harvested 626,000 maravedis and 2,700 ducats, or about 4,375 ducats in all, owing to some of the penitents being well-to-do ecclesiastics given to Illuminism. Toledo, in 1604, imposed a penance of 3,000 ducats on Geraldo Paris, a German of Madrid, guilty of sundry heretical propositions, including the assertion that St. Job was an alchemist. The same tribunal, in 1649 and 1650, penanced four persons engaged in endeavoring to shield a Judaizer, two of them five hundred, and the other two three hundred ducats apiece. In 1654, again, in two autos, November 8th and December 27th, it realized a total of four thousand ducats, after this it had occasional good fortune, and in 1669 it was supremely lucky in a rich penitent, Don Alonso Sanchez, priest and physician to the Cuenca Tribunal, whom it convicted of faultership and penanced in the large sum of 13,000 ducats. In 1654 Cuenca realized 2,250 ducats besides 13 confiscations for its auto of June 29th. Cordova was more fortunate. 
In an auto of May 3rd, 1655, when a group of wealthy Judaizers and their friends yielded an aggregate of 7,000 ducats. In addition to this source of revenue from penance imposed on penitents, there were the fines inflicted in the exercise of the secular jurisdiction of the Inquisition. How liberally this power was exercised, even when the delinquents were officials, is seen in the defense offered by the Suprema in 1632 when strenuous complaints were made about the familiars of Valencia. It instanced the case of Jaime Blau, who was fined 600 libras, half to the complainant and half to the fisc. Vicente de San Germán fined 300 libras, Jerónimo Yodra 500 ducats, Pedro Carbonell 500 ducats, Tomás Real 300 ducats, Miguel Rubio 400 libras, and Jerónimo Pilart 500 libras. Doubtless through these inflictions the culprits escaped corporal punishments much less endurable, and they served to explain the persistent multiplication of familiars coupled with disregard of the character of the appointees. It was the same with outsiders who were prosecuted for offenses against officials as when, in 1565, Don Tristan de Uria of Saragossa was fined sixty ducats for insulting a notary. In the 17th century, the Suprema claimed these fines as its special perquisite. When Jaime Blau, for instance, was mulcted in three hundred ducats for the fisc, no sooner was the Suprema apprised of it than it ordered the amount to be remitted at once, and the length of correspondence which ensued indicates that this was a novelty submitted to unwillingly. Even a fine of 100 libras, imposed on Ignacio Navarro in 1636, was called for immediately and remitted, as was also soon afterwards 100 ducats with which he purchased his pardon. As he was forthwith arrested again for murdering Don Juan Agustin Soluco, he probably yielded another series of fines. In the extreme exigencies of the royal treasury, the king claimed a portion of these receipts, and, by a decree of September 30, 1639, he ordered one-fourth of all fines for secular offenses to be paid to the official designated to receive the fines of the royal courts. In the unscrupulous exercise of discretional power, fines and penances were frequently imposed beyond the culprit's ability to pay, and inquisitors had a habit of adding in the sentence the alternative of some corporal punishment, such as the galleys, scourging, or vergüenza, with the object of inducing the kindred to contribute, in order to avert from the family the shame of the public infliction. The instructions of 1561 strictly forbid this cruelty. The sentences are to be without condition or alternative, and inability to pay is not to be thus visited. This receives scant obedience. In 1568, it was the ordinary practice of the Barcelona Tribunal to enforce payment of its arbitrary impositions by the alternative of such punishments. About 1640, however, we are told by an inquisitor that the question was evaded by the prudent custom of sending poor men to the galleys in reserving pecuniary penance for the wealthy. In fact, after the middle of the 17th century, the number of such penances diminished, and they are usually for larger amounts. In a record of the Autos de Fe of Toledo, from 1648 to 1794, there is but one that is less than 100 ducats, and that one is for 50. In all, there are but 64 penances imposed, up to 1742, and none subsequently. The aggregate is 30,600 ducats, besides 14 of half the property of the culprit. Whether from a growing sense of their indecency or from a lack of material, the custom of imposing pecuniary penances rapidly declined in the 18th century. In a collection of 66 autos de fe between 1721 and 1745, comprising in all 962 cases, there is not a single pecuniary penance. Fines, however, continued to be imposed to the last. March 27, 1816, Pasquale Francini of Madrid, for possessing two indecent pictures, was fined 100 ducats and, as these are defined as applicable to the royal treasury, it would appear that the crown had absorbed this trifling source of revenue. In this matter, the Roman Inquisition offered a creditable contrast to the Spanish. Except in Milan, Cremona, and other places under Spanish rule, 
pecuniary punishments were rarely to be inflicted the assent of the congregation of cardinals was required and they were at once to be distributed in pious uses of which a strict account was required thus in fifteen ninety five one of four thousand crowns was given to the poor of genoa and in the same year at naples one of four hundred crowns was parcelled out among the charitable establishments even this was felt to derogate from the character of the holy office and in sixteen thirty two urban the eighth decreed that papal confirmation must be had in each case and at the same time he withdrew the special privileges of the milanese tribunals so strong was the disgust felt in rome for this commercialized zeal for the faith that when the fiscal cabrera was there representing the inquisition in the case of villanueva an arce iranoso sent to him for presentation to the pope a report of an auto celebrated by the tribunal of santiago with the expectation of arousing his sympathy for an institution that was doing so much for religion cabrera replied january sixth sixteen fifty six that he would not present it without special orders alexander the seventh he said disliked pecuniary penalties in matters of faith and there were some of these in the report his holiness had already spoken to him on the subject and it was wiser not to call his attention to it afresh end of book five chapter two book five chapter three of the history of the inquisition of spain volume two this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Bloomfield. The History of the Inquisition of Spain. Volume 2 by Henry Charles Lee. Book 5. Resources. Chapter 3. Dispensations. The Roman Curia had so long accustomed Christendom to the idea that pardon for the consequences of sin was purchasable, that we cannot be surprised if relief from the penalties imposed by the Inquisition was a marketable commodity to be regarded as a source of revenue. We have already seen this exemplified in the compositions for confiscation, and it was carried out with regard to the more personal inflictions prescribed by canon and municipal law, the disabilities of culprits and their descendants alluded to above page 287 the instructions of 1484 and 1488 adopted these and extended the sumptuary regulations by including the carrying of arms and riding on horseback they enlarged the list of prohibited callings and applied them all to the descendants of those who were burnt in person or effigy then ferdinand and isabella by Pragmaticas in 1501, made the prohibition of office-holding and the following of numerous trades and professions a matter of municipal law, reserving the right to grant relief by royal licenses. Thus these disabilities, which weighed cruelly upon penitents and their descendants, drew their origin from different sources. The sumptuary restrictions, which came to be known as cosas arbitrarias, were considered to be the act of the tribunal, which could remove them. Permission to hold office or to follow the inhibited callings was a royal prerogative, while the Holy See, as the guardian of the faith and of the canon law, and as the supreme source of inquisitorial jurisdiction, claimed a general control, which was grudgingly conceded. In addition to these disabilities were the personal punishments, relief from which was claimed by the Inquisition, those which concern us here were the galleys, exile, imprisonment, and the wearing of the sanbito, or habito, a kind of yellow tunic with a red St. Andrew's cross, a mark of infamy, and a severe infliction, as it largely impeded the efforts of the penitent to gain a livelihood. The curia was not long in recognizing the abundant market opened for its dispensations by the large numbers of those subjected to disabilities. In the taxes of the penitentiary, there was inserted a clause offering the fullest possible dispensation for Marania. To a cleric, the price was sixty gross tournois, or fifteen ducats. To a layman, forty gross, or ten ducats. 
besides a fee to the datary of twenty gross. When the dispensation was partial, allowing a layman to follow his accustomed calling, or a priest to celebrate mass, the charge was twelve gross, or three ducats, but if the profession was that of a physician or advocate, the charge was double. We have seen the extreme jealousy which existed as to any papal interference with the Inquisition, and Ferdinand's repeated efforts to suppress papal letters, but the power to issue these dispensations could not be questioned. Cardinal Mendoza, Archbishop of Toledo, held from Innocent VIII a faculty to grant rehabilitations, and one of these, issued to Pero Diaz of Cifuentes, whose mother had been burnt, was recognized and confirmed in 1520 by the Suprema and Charles V. At the same time, the Inquisition claimed the right to control relief from the punishments which it inflicted, and it held these favors at a far higher price than the cheap papal dispensations. Anchius, the secretary of the Saragossa Tribunal, tells us how Juan Geranimo was sentenced to wear the San Benito and carried it for a long time, until his father paid for him to the tribunal a thousand florins for permission to abandon it. Some of the gold proved to be of light weight, and eighteen or twenty florins were demanded of him to make good the deficiency, when he handed them to the messenger, saying, How is this? Are not the signores well paid for the merchandise they sold me? But take it, and welcome. When exactions on this scale were possible, we can readily believe that Dr. Giral, the embezzling inquisitor of Cordova, could easily secrete a hundred and fifty thousand maravedis from the dispensation sold to the wearers of the San Benito, volume 1, page 190. Nor can we wonder that the Holy Office was resolved to maintain a hold on so prolific a source of gain. The situation was complicated by the pretensions of the sovereigns to intervene and claim their share, and this they sought to establish by procuring from Alexander the Sixth a brief of February 18, 1495, which recites that the inquisitors collect various sums from those who had obtained papal rehabilitations and retained them. All such monies theretofore and thereafter received for commutations and rehabilitations were to be placed at the disposal of the sovereigns, under pain of ipso facto excommunication. It is obvious from this that the papal dispensations were not admitted without the exaction of further payments, that the Pope was content with this so long as the taxes of the penitentiary were paid in Rome, and that Ferdinand was concerned only with the destination of the proceeds and was quite willing to acknowledge the papal authority when it was exercised for his benefit. He lost no time in availing himself of the papal grant on a large scale, and, before the year was out, we find him selling relief in mass to all those disabled by the Tribunal of Toledo, a transaction which brought in large returns, for, in 1497, Alonso de Morales, the royal treasurer, acknowledges the receipt of six million four hundred ninety nine thousand twenty eight maravedis from toledo commutations and rehabilitations and this was doubtless only one of numerous similar compositions the inquisition was not disposed to abandon its profitable commerce the suprema continued to assert its control in instructions june third fourteen ninety seven ordering inquisitors to take no fees for rehabilitations without consulting it. May 25, 1498, it declared that if there were no inquisitors general, there would be no one able to grant rehabilitation or to relieve from San Benitos, and it forbade the tribunals to commute for imprisonment except by spiritual penances. There was evidently a contest on foot between the Inquisition and Ferdinand, of which the details are lost, for we have a letter from him, February 24th, 1498, to a tribunal in which he says, You know that we have granted a privilege, through which the children of condemned heretics are rehabilitated as to the cosus arbitrarius imposed by you. As it is our will that this privilege be maintained, we charge you not to levy or take anything from them for the enjoyment of it, and if, perchance, 
the inquisitors general have written or shall write anything contrary to this consult us before acting on it and we will write to them and to you what most comports with our service the sovereigns however yielded the point when by a cedula of january twelfth fourteen ninety nine they formally made over to the inquisitors general all the monies accruing from penances commutations and rehabilitations in the kingdoms of castile and aragon in order to provide for the salaries but this grant as usual was practically subject to the exigencies of the royal treasury and the promise was irregularly kept the inquisitors seem to have speedily arrogated to themselves this profitable privilege for the instructions of fifteen hundred forbid them to grant dispensations and commutations the right to which is reserved to the inquisitors general it was greatly impaired however by the next move in the game the pragmaticas of fifteen o one which made disability to hold office or to follow numerous callings a matter of municipal law, and reserved to the crown the right to issue licenses in derogation of it, thus depriving the Inquisition of control over this important section of penalties. While Ferdinand thus secured a share in the business, he fully admitted the necessity of papal rehabilitation as a condition precedent. In 1510, writing to a member of the Suprema about the rehabilitation of Gerardo Alonso de Medina, issued at the request of Queen Juana, he says that it was granted under the belief that Medina held a papal brief. If he did not, it was invalid, as there must first be papal rehabilitation. Yet papal action amounted to nothing in these matters without the royal license. About this time, the licenciado Portillo applied to him, stating that, as the memory of his grandfather had been condemned, he was incapacitated from holding office. He had been rehabilitated by the Pope, and now he asked for a license in view of certain services rendered, and Ferdinand granted the prayer. The strictness with which these licenses were construed is illustrated by a petition in 1515 from Dr. Jaime de Lis, a physician of Logroño, representing that, by the condemnation of his parents, he had been incapacitated. He had procured a papal brief authorizing him to practice everywhere, and a royal license to practice in Logroño. Unable to resist importunities, he had exceeded his bounds, for which he craved pardon, and also permission to attend the Duke of Najera, who joined in the supplication. This was granted, with a warning not to transgress again, and the tribunal of Calahorra and the magistrates of all the towns were charged to make him observe the limits. When the papal dispensation was issued to ecclesiastics, the king did not intervene, but there can be no doubt that the vidimus, or confirmation of the Suprema, was required and had to be paid for, for it had, on January 8th and February 12th, 1498, summoned all reconciled penitents to present the absolutions and dispensations which they had procured from Rome, a significant indication that otherwise they would not be respected. Such dispensations were issued as readily as those to laymen, though, as we have seen, the price was fifty per cent higher. Thus, April eighth, fifteen fourteen, Leo the tenth dispensed Cristobal Rodrigo, priest of Luduena, from the disabilities incurred by the condemnation of his parents, and authorized him to retain his benefices, acquire others, and perform all his functions. So also, november third, fifteen fourteen, he dispensed Bartolome Eruelo beneficed in the convent of Santa Cruz of Saragossa from all the disabilities resulting from the heresy of his paternal grandfather. Yet there frequently occur cases of rehabilitation in which there is no mention of papal intervention, under circumstances where it could scarce fail to be alluded to had it existed. There would seem to have been no thought of invoking the cooperation of the Holy See in the great composition of Seville, under which twenty thousand ducats were obtained by Ferdinand for the rehabilitations alone, and, when it was extended to Cordova and other places, they formed part of the inducements offered. So when Cardinal Manrique issued by wholesale licenses to hold office to the large districts of Seville, Cordova, Granada, and Lyon, there is no allusion to papal dispensations. For some reason, probably financial, these licenses were issued for short terms and required renewal. In one case, a document issued in February 1528 
prolonged the time to April 15th, and then on April 6th it was extended to the end of June. This disregard of papal participation seems to have provoked the Curia to retaliatory action, and it issued rehabilitations with clauses of censures and penalties for all who might impede them, thus rendering unnecessary the concurrence of the king and the Inquisition. Charles thereupon reissued the Pragmaticas of 1501 and empowered the Inquisition to enforce them, while the Suprema explained to the tribunals that there was a disability under the canons and another under the Pragmaticas, so that the papal rehabilitation was insufficient without the royal and vice versa, wherefore the inquisitors were instructed to look closely into this and prosecute those who did not possess both. It withdrew, however, from this position and issued Cartas Acordadas May 15, 1530 and May 16, 1531, complaining of this new form of papal dispensations. If these were allowed to continue, it said, all the disabled would be rehabilitated and the laws of the kingdom would be annulled. Wherefore, when such letters were presented, the fiscal was ordered to draw up a supplication to the Pope setting forth that the disabilities were enacted by the laws of the land, and that it had been found by experience that these children of heretics, if they obtain judicial positions, condemn Christians to death unjustly, or, if they become physicians, surgeons, or apothecaries, give their patients poisons in place of remedies. All these supplications were to be sent to the Suprema, which would forward them to the Roman agent of the Inquisition, and meanwhile, we may assume, the papal letters were suspended. In another document of the period, opposition to the papal rehabilitations is enumerated as one of the regular duties of the fiscal. It is somewhat remarkable that this seems to have been confined to Castile for, in 1535, the Suprema learned that the Valencia tribunal accepted and respected papal rehabilitations and hastened to instruct it to follow the Castilian method. The struggle continued, and the instructions of 1531 were repeated July 19th and October 26th, 1543, and May 14th, 1546. The strenuous days of Ferdinand were passed and resistance was vain. The Curia continued imperturbably to sell dispensations of the most liberal character, which completely annulled Spanish legislation. One bearing the name of Paul III, February 1, 1545, issued to Juan de Haril of Hain, whose grandparents had been birthed in effigy, gives assurance of his high deserts and concedes that, even if his progenitors had been condemned and burnt, he can ascend to the degrees of bachelor, licentiate, and doctor. He can assume the office of judge, corregidor, advocate, procurator, and notary, legate, nuncio, physician, surgeon, apothecary, farmer of revenue, collector, and receiver of taxes, and all honors and dignities, including professional chairs. He can wear garments of any color and material, ornaments of gold and silver and jewels. He can bear arms, and ride on horses and mules, inherit from any kindred, acquire property of all kinds, enter the priesthood, and obtain any dignity or preferment, and all inquisitors and secular powers are forbidden to interfere with him in the enjoyment of these privileges. This is evidently the customary formula of these dispensations, and it was galling to have the laws of the land and the jurisdiction of the Inquisition thus calmly set at naught but there was no help for it. Sometimes, however, the recipients of these papal rehabilitations deemed it wise to show humility, in which case they were fairly assured of a benignant reception. In 1548, the Saragossa tribunal penanced for faltership five hidalgos, vassals of the Count of Ribagorzo, in a way disabling them from holding office. They procured letters from Rome, but submitted them to the Suprema and declined to use them whereupon Valdez told the inquisitors to follow the letters and dispense the penitents from their disabilities. Roman competition, however, by no means destroyed the home traffic in dispensations. Whatever was imposed by the inquisitors could be removed by the inquisitors general, as when Valdez, May 27, 1551, 
granted license to Leandro de Loris to accept the position of assessor to the Bail of Valencia after he had been disabled by the tribunal from holding any office of justice. When, however, disabilities were the result of pragmaticas, it was recognized that their removal was a function of the crown. Thus, in 1549, the Suprema expresses pleasure that those reconciled under an edict of grace should procure rehabilitations from the king, and in 1564, it explains that the dispensations granted by the Inquisitor General only relate to the sumptuary cosas arbitrarias, so that those obtaining them who exceed in this are to be prosecuted. The functions of the Inquisition thus were restricted to enabling the disabled to wear costly apparel and jewels, to bear arms and ride. These, which were known as dispensations in lo arbitrario, were in great demand, and a brisk business was done in them. In the records, of course, there is nothing said about their being sold, or the prices paid for them, which were doubtless proportioned to the station or wealth of the penitent or of his kindred. But that they were articles of traffic is shown by their being frequently given as gratifications to the lower officials, issued in blank, to be disposed of at the best price that could be had. So customary, indeed, became the issue of these dispensations that, toward the close of the sixteenth century, Pena closes his remarks on disabilities by saying that, after a time, it is usual to dispense for them. The rehabilitation for holding office and trading was likewise a source of profit to the crown and its officials. The sale of these became so general that, in 1552, it formed a subject of complaint by the Cortes of Madrid, which represented that the children and grandchildren of condemned heretics were rich and obtained rehabilitations from the king, in contravention of the pragmaticas, to the great detriment of the republic. To the petition that this should cease, the reply was that the supplication would be borne in mind and the pragmaticas be observed. That this promise was kept may well be doubted, especially as, in time, the curia abandoned its claim to issue dispensations of this nature. When in 1603 and 1604 several applications for such a grace were made to it, the congregation of the Inquisition refused to interfere. The curia had never assumed to interfere with the commutation or redemption of the punishments inflicted by the Inquisition. In these it therefore had a free hand, and the resultant revenue must have been important, for it was always ready to show mercy for a reasonable consideration. The speculative value of such commutations were recognized, at least as early as 1498, when they were already regarded as a regular source of income. For Juan de Monasterio was then characterized as Inquisitor of Valencia and receiver of penances and commutations. In 1524 we find Manrique commissioning Francisco de Salmeron to collect from the receivers of the tribunals all penas y penitencias, commutaciones y habilidades, and a similar grouping in 1540 and 1544 shows that they all continue to be sources contributing to a common fund. Of these punishments, the one most productive and most commonly commuted was the San Benito, or penitential habit, released from which in the early period, as we have seen, was reckoned, in one case at least, at a thousand gold florins. The severity of the infliction is well set forth in the petition, about 1560, of Lo Povero Notar Jacobo Damiano, to the Sicilian Tribunal. He says that he has tried in every way to earn a living without success, and his only resource is a return to his birthplace, Racalmuto, where his family will aid in his support, and he can end the few days that remain to his age and infirmities. But, as his kindred are persons of honor, if he comes with a San Benito, they will drive him away and leave him to die of starvation. He therefore begs to have the habit commuted to a money payment for the redemption of captives, and some other penance, and he will raise the amount from his family. Otherwise, he is in peril of death from want, as he is abandoned by all. What, between the degradation and the impediment to winning a livelihood, those subjected to the penalty and their kindred were likely to pay whatever sum they could afford for release. It was commonly coupled with imprisonment. The carcel y abito usually went together, and commutation covered both. As a rule, 
inquisitors were prohibited from granting these commutations. The temptation to retain the proceeds was doubtless too great. In 1513, Ximenes, on learning that some inquisitors were doing so, forbade it for the future, and reserved the right to the inquisitor general. There were some exceptions, however, especially in the case of distant tribunals, as in a commission granted to Sicily in 1519, to Navarre in 1520, and a limited one to Majorca in 1523. As a rule, all applications were submitted to the Suprema, which gave the necessary instructions and directed the money to be remitted to it, or to be held subject to its order for pious uses. Its full realization of the financial possibilities of the matter is seen in instructions in 1519 to Barcelona, and doubtless to the other tribunals, to report how many penitents were wearing San Benitos and how much could be obtained from them for commutations. When conviction would bring not only confiscation, but the prospect of another contribution from the kindred, it will be realized how great was the temptation to severity. The pious uses for which the payments were ostensibly received were various. Dr. Arganda, inquisitor of Cuenca, in rendering May 9, 1585, a statement revealing a deficit in revenue, renewed a request of the month previous that the Suprema would grant the, to the tribunal the commutations of Francisco Abist and Juan Waybit, Moriscos. They were very old, had been sentenced ten years before, and would die moors. Therefore, it would be well that the tribunal should have the benefit of the four thousand reals which they offered. The Suprema replied with an inquiry whether this was the utmost that could be obtained from them. Then on August ninth, the Inquisitor urged the acceptance of the offer, so that the money could be used for a much-needed prison for familiars and other purposes, and reminded the Suprema that, in 1583, it had made a similar grant of commutations for a building. Another pious use was giving to Dr. Ortiz, when sent to Sicily as Inquisitor in 1541, certain commutations as part of his salary. They must have been considerable, for the fees accruing on them to Secretary Zarita amounted to fifty-five ducats. Still another pious use is indicated in an order from the Suprema, in 1549, to the Tribunal of Granada, to commute the San Benito of Catalina Ramirez into spiritual works and such pecuniary penance as she could pay for pious uses. The latter are explained, in an accompanying private note of instruction, to hold the money until the apparitor Cuevas marries his daughter, when he is to be aided with it. He evidently had petitioned for a commutación de abito, and it was accorded in this form. These commutations, in fact, became a sort of currency in which favors were asked and granted, replacing, to some extent, the confiscations of an earlier period. Thus, in 1589, the Valencia convent of the discalced Carmelites of Santa Teresa petitioned for the grant of the commutations of certain San Benitos, and soon afterwards the Dominican convent made a similar request. The most usual pious work, however, for which they were ostensibly employed, was in assisting the redemption of captives. Yet this formula frequently covered other destinations, as in the case of Martin de Bergera of Calatayud, who was relieved of prison in San Benito for fifteen ducats, para reducción de cautivos, and the ducats were simultaneously granted to Pedro Salvan, a parator of the Saragossa Tribunal. When the proceeds were really to be employed for the redemption of captives, precautions were taken to see that they were so applied. These are expressed January 18, 1559, by Valdez de Horosco de Arce, Inquisitor of Sicily, when empowering him to grant commutations to four penitents, provided their sentences are not irremissible, and they have completed three years of imprisonment, when, besides the money payment, there are to be simple penances of fasting, prayer, and pilgrimage. The penitents are to be designated by Nicholas Calderon or his agent, who will bargain as to the amounts of payment, and the money is to be given to him for the ransom of his mother, sister, and two nieces, on his furnishing good security that, within a term to be designated by the Inquisitor, he will present them to the tribunal, or refund the money. The condition in this, that the penalty commuted, must not be irremissible, was not always observed. Such sentences, as we shall see, were reserved for cases of special guilt, but they yielded to the powerful solvent of money. 
a larger price presumably being demanded. Thus, March 7, 1560, the Sicilian Inquisitor was ordered to select some one who had served not less than nine years under such a sentence, and commute it for the ransom of the wife of, of Sibdadella. Even the galleys, which were regarded as a much severer punishment than the carceli abito, were commutable, though, as the prisoner was an encumbrance, while the galley slave was useful and the supply was always deficient, we may infer that his commutation was held at a higher price. Condemnation to the galleys was also much less frequent than to the San Benito, and of course was only inflicted on able-bodied men, so that cases of its commutation do not occur in such abundance. Yet they were sufficiently numerous to lead to complaint by the Suprema to Charles V in 1528, that when it sent messengers to liberate those whose sentences were thus commuted, the commanders of the galleys refused to surrender them, whereupon Charles issued a cedula ordering their liberation under pain of two thousand florins. Commutations for the galleys had various shapes. In 1543, Don Luis Munoz, lord of Ayodan, offered two slaves as substitute for two of his Morisco vassals, Juan Maimon and Juan Munoz, condemned to serve the one for ten and the other for twelve years, of which three had elapsed, and, after investigation, to see that the substitutes were able-bodied, the bargain was closed. In 1517, Miguel Mercado obtained the remainder of his sentence to the galleys, commuted to service on the French border, when presumably there was some money consideration. It is probable that commutations for money became too frequent for the good of the naval service, for in 1556 the Suprema strictly forbade them for the future, doubtless under royal command. This prohibition seems to have lasted for a considerable time, as the Spanish Armada was greatly in need of men, and we happen not to meet with cases until near the close of the century, when they reappear in the Valencia records. In 1590, Giuseppe Gasset, a familiar condemned for the murder of his wife, obtained a commutation of a sentence. In 1596, a new Christian, Gaspar Moy, negotiated for release from the three years which he still had to serve, and, after investigation into his means, it was fixed at seven hundred libras and a slave. Moy, however, on his liberation, found that his San Benito was not included in the bargain, and he had to pay a hundred libras more for its removal. In 1597, Onufri Quintana offered two thousand reals and a slave, which were accepted. In the same year, Miguel Sosa applied for a commutation. When the Suprema instructed the tribunal to ascertain what he would pay for it, and the same answer was given, in 1600, to a similar petition from Jaime Cornexo. It is apparent from the high value set on these mercies that comparatively few convicts could afford their purchase. Evidently, the Suprema paid little heed to the instructions of Philip II to Manrique de Lara in 1595 to be very cautious in granting of dispensations for galleys, exile, reclusion, and San Benitos. There must be ample cause, and no attention should be paid to prayers and favors, for it was essential the senses should be completely executed. This was repeated with some amplification by Carlos II in 1695 showing that there was still occasion to restrain the holy office from bartering pardons for money. End of Book 5, Chapter 3 Recording by Mike Bloomfield Book 5, Chapter 4 of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 2, by Henry Charles Lea. Book 5. Resources. Chapter 4. Benefices. When the Inquisition was established, it was apparent that, if its officials, or a portion of them, could be quartered on the church, there might be less diversion of the confiscations from the royal treasury. At the very commencement, in 1480, Ferdinand and Isabella obtained, from Sextus IV, an indult authorizing them to present the four earliest inquisitors to benefices, of course, 
without obligation to reside. As yet, however, the Inquisition had not inspired general terror, and the people refused to admit the intruders, whereupon the sovereigns provided them with four chaplaincies in the royal chapel. The attempt was not abandoned, and, in the supplementary instructions of December 1484, Torquemada announced that it was the intention of the sovereigns to procure a papal indult, authorizing them to bestow benefices, not only on the inquisitors, but on all the clerics employed in the holy work. Something of the kind was evidently obtained, for, when the holy office was organized in 1485 under Torquemada, the brief confirming his appointment dispensed from residence all officials in its service, who held or might thereafter obtain preferment. New appointees were released from the customary temporary residence, and all were assured of their full revenues without deduction, all apostolical and conciliar decrees to the contrary notwithstanding. There was nothing in this to shock public opinion, for the canon law permitted canons to be absent for study in any recognized university, and the enjoyment of benefices everywhere by the creatures of the curia was legalized by assuming service to the Pope to be equivalent to service in a chapter. Yet the Spanish church, apparently, was not disposed to submit quietly to this, and its resistance may be assumed as the cause of another brief of Innocent VIII on February 8, 1486, which limited the grant to five years and required the beneficiary to supply a vicar to fill his place. At the same time, it specified all officials, down to messengers and jailers, as entitled to its benefits, and provided for opposition by appointing the bishops of Cordoba and Leon, and the abbot of San Emiliano of Burgos, as executors with full powers to suppress recalcitrants. When the five years expired, the indult was renewed for another five years, and so it continued until the end of the Inquisition, the popes steadily refusing to prolong the term, as it gave them an important advantage in their frequent collisions with the Spanish Holy Office, to say nothing of the fees consequent upon the issue of briefs so voluminous and so valuable. The next step was to procure the power of presenting to benefices, and this was secured by another brief from Innocent the Eighth in 1488, granting to the sovereigns the patronage of a prebend in each metropolitan, cathedral, and collegiate church, excepting, in prudent defense to the sacred college, those of which the bishops were also cardinals. Of this brief, Alonso de Burgos was made executor, enabling him to fulminate censures and take all necessary steps until the appointee enjoyed pacific possession of his prebend. Under it, Ferdinand and Isabella, on October the 30th of the same year, made the first presentations, amounting to ten, six being inquisitors, two fiscals, one an apparitor, and one designated merely as an official. This brief, probably, was good only for five years, for in 1494 the sovereigns obtained from Alexander the Sixth another, with enlarged powers, of which Martin Pons, Bishop of Avila, was executor. Under this, on April the 11th, 1495, they made twenty-four appointments, mostly inquisitors, but comprising seven fiscals, two members of the Suprema, and two Roman agents of the Inquisition. Among the inquisitors, we recognize the notorious Lucero and his predecessor in Cordoba, the embezzling Dr. Girl. It is probable that these briefs encountered resistance, for, in this latter case, we chance to hear of a prolonged struggle required to install Dr. Manuel Fernandez Angulo of the Suprema in the Seville canonry given to him. Haughty canons of noble blood might well resent the intrusion of low-born officials such as Ferdinand sometimes thrust upon them. Thus, in 1499, on the death of Inquisitor Cevalos of Barcelona, 
his first appointee to a prebend in the church of Santa Ana, in the same city, he replaced him with Juan Moya, a simple tonsured clerk and jailer of the tribunal. Nor was this the only instance of such abuse of patronage. He also availed himself largely of the privilege of non-residence by appointing canons and other beneficed clerks to positions in the tribunals, and his letters of the period are numerous, in which he notifies the chapters that their members have been thus drafted to the service of God, during which they are, under the papal letters, to be reckoned as present, and are not to be deprived of any of the fruits of their preferment. So, when he drew the licentiate Pero Gonzalez Manso from the professorship of law in Valladolid, he told the college that the chair would be filled by a substitute at half price during Manso's absence. Everything was subservient to the Inquisition, and all other institutions were expected to minister to its needs. When Julius II, on November 16, 1505, renewed the quinquennial indult, he no longer appointed executors, but empowered the inquisitor-general to coerce with censures the chapters to account for and pay over to the appentees the revenues of their benefices. It appears that they sometimes compel the appointees to agree under oath that they would take only a portion of the fruits, for Julius pronounced such agreements to be void, and released the incumbents from their oaths. This brief he repeated on September the 8th, 1508, with some additions, of which more hereafter. The opposition of the chapters, in fact, had in no way diminished, and the feat only seemed to intensify their obstinacy. When, in 1501, Diego de Robles, fiscal of the Suprema, was granted a canonry in the church of Zamora, the persistence of the chapter carried the matter to Rome, where Gracian de Valdez, nephew of the bishop, boasted that he would get the pope to reserve the benefice to himself. It gave infinite vexation to Ferdinand, who wrote to the canons, on July 24th, that if they did not admit Robles within three days, they must leave the city and present themselves before him within thirty days, under pain of forfeiture of citizenship and temporalities. Similar orders were sent to the provisor. The corregidor was commanded to see to their execution, while urgent letters were addressed to Rome to counteract the labors of Valdez. These vigorous measures brought the chapter to terms, and Ferdinand, on September the 2nd, accepted their submission, revoking their banishment to take effect after their giving possession to Robles. Simultaneously, a similar quarrel was on foot with the chapter of Barcelona over the grant of a canonry to the inquisitor of Saragossa, who was already archdeacon of Almazan, and this was likewise carried to Rome. So resolutely did the chapters resist the invasion of their rights that in Guerra, Inquisitor General of Aragon and Bishop of Lerida in 1512, had to invoke both royal and papal authority to secure the revenues of benefices held by him in the churches of Tarragona and Lerida, and, with regard to the latter, the Pope was obliged to appoint executors to enforce his briefs. If Ferdinand had expected, by this abuse of patronage, to lighten the burden of supporting the Inquisition, he was doomed to disappointment. He probably found that those who thus obtained positions for life could not be depended upon to perform gratuitous service in the tribunals. Their full salaries had to be paid, and their benefices were only an extra gratification, so that his anxiety to secure these for them must be attributed to his desire to obtain able and vigorous men for the moderate remuneration provided by the payroll. When Pedro de Belorado was sent to Sicily in 1501 as Archbishop of Messina and also as Inquisitor, the receiver was ordered to continue to him the salary paid to his predecessor, Sgalambro. So it continued. When in 1540 Villas Ortiz was commissioned as Inquisitor of Valencia, 
the orders were to pay him the regular salary of six thousand sueldos, although, as canon of Toledo, he possessed a handsome income. By this time, these matters were in the hands of the Suprema, and its members and officials were too eager seekers, after pluralities, not to enforce the papal indult with vigor, giving rise to incessant struggles with recalcitrant churches. Thus, in 1546, when Pedro Ponce de Leon was made a member, he was Mestre Escuela in the church of Alcalá de Henares. There was trouble about his revenues, for, on February the 27th, 1547, Valdez summoned the abbot and chapter to keep on paying him, and expressed the hope that they would not compel him to resort to censures. Similar letters, about the same time, were issued in behalf of the private secretary of Valdez, Fortuno de Ibarquen, who was an insatiable pluralist, being archdeacon of Siguenza and canon in the churches of both Leon and Oviedo. Simultaneous were letters to the chapters of Segovia about the revenues of its dean and canon Miguel de Arena, who was inquisitor of Seville, and to that of Siguenza, for its treasurer and canon, Menendo de Valdez, who was inquisitor of Valladolid. A couple of months later, there were letters to the chapters of Badajoz about its canon, Baltodano, who was inquisitor of Toledo, and in August to the chapter of Majorca about Juan Garcia, who had been appointed consultor to the tribunal of Saragossa. In October, prosecutions were commenced against the recalcitrant chapter of Leon, which had refused to pay the fruits of the canonries of Ibarguen and of Cervantes, the inquisitor of Córdoba. It would be useless to multiply examples of this incessant strife, in which the chapters persistently, but unavailingly, sought to prevent the absorption of the revenues by the Holy Office. The resistance was hopeless, for, even with the most resolute, it was only a question of time when opposition was broken down by excommunication and the summons to appear before the Suprema, while appeal to Rome was fruitless when it was the duty of the Spanish ambassador to watch for such cases and oppose them. Of course, the greater number yielded without remonstrance, and we hear only of those who dared to offer a futile opposition. It is observable that all the cases which thus come before us involve benefices without cure of souls. The papal indults comprised both those with and without such cure, and it is not to be supposed that the former were not extensively exploited, though we do not hear of them, because in such cases there was no organized body to feel aggrieved and raise a contest. When came the counter-reformation, the Council of Trent pronounced strongly against non-residents by beneficiaries holding cure of souls. Special episcopal license was required for absence, which, save in exceptional cases, could not exceed two months, and no privilege could be pleaded. Accordingly, when in 1567 Pius V was called upon to renew the quinquennial indult, he expressly accepted parochial churches and benefices with cure of souls. This was somewhat tardily obeyed, and it was not until June the 8th, 1571, that the Suprema announced the limitation. There was another provision of the Council of Trent, which met with less observance. It required all obtaining preferment of any kind to make, within two months, profession of faith in the hands of the ordinary or chapter. No attention was paid to this, and the chapters, waking up to the advantage that it gave them, refused to pay the fruits, giving rise to multitudinous suits. At length, in 1612, a brief was procured from Paul V, declaring that the work of the inquisitors was most necessary to the church, and could not be interrupted to travel to the distant seats of their benefices. He therefore evoked all pending cases, imposing perpetual silence on the chapters, and validating all payments made to incumbents, 
who were allowed in Spain six months, and in the colonies two years, to perform the duty. In future, it should suffice to do it in the place of their residence, and furnish a public instrument attesting the fact within six months or two years. The Council of Trent was of small importance when brought into collision with the Inquisition. At length, Philip the Third listened to the complaints of the chapters, and, in a decree of December the 24th, 1599, addressed to the Suprema, he called attention to the injury inflicted on the cathedral services by withdrawing canons from their duties, and he ordered that, in future, much caution be exercised, especially as regarded the deans, the doctoral and magistral canons, and the penitentiaries. If this produced an effect, it was but temporary. In 1655, we chanced to learn that, in the tribunal of Córdoba, of the three inquisitors, Bernardino de León de la Rocha was a prebendary of Córdoba and collegial of the cathedral of Cuenca. Bartolomé Buján de Somoza was a canon of Cuenca, and Fernando de Villegas was collegial of San Bartolomé. In addition, the fiscal... Juan Maria de Rodesno was collegial of Cuenca, and the secretary, Pedro de Armenia, was prebendary of Córdoba. This single tribunal thus deprived Cuenca of three of its dignitaries, and Córdoba of two. The doctoral and magistral canonries alluded to by Philip afforded a special grievance. These were stalls in each chapter to be occupied, respectively, by a doctor of laws and a master of theology, for the purpose, apparently, of furnishing to the church what it might need as to law and faith. They had been instituted by Sextus the Fourth, who decreed that the holders should not absent themselves for more than two months without express license of the chapter under pain of her feature. The Inquisition was restive under this limitation on its acquisitiveness, and, at its special request, Julius II, in his second brief of September the 8th, 1508, revoked the decree of Sextus, and included them among the benefices that could be held by officials without residence. At length, in 1599, the chapter of Córdoba, in a contest over the matter, procured a papal brief requiring the residence of the doctoral canon who was not to be excused under pretext of serving the Inquisition. Apparently this was disregarded, for Philip III, in his instructions of 1608 to Sandoval y Rojas, called special attention to the matter. Even this failed until there was a sharp conflict with the chapter of Toledo over the case of Dr. Bernardo de Rojas, in which the chapter won and he was forced to resign an appointment as inquisitor. Then again, the question came up in 1640, when Philip IV appointed Dr. Andrés de Rueda Rico as supernumerary member of the Suprema. It resented the intrusion and addressed to the king a very free-spoken consulta, in which it laid particular emphasis on his being doctoral canon of Córdoba, and therefore obligated to residence. Yet, in spite of this, when the Córdoba chapter refused to pay him his fruits, the Suprema decided against it. Then the chapter carried the case to Rome, where, as the agent of the Inquisition reported on September the 12th, 1640, Urban the 8th, to evade the direct decision, revived the brief of Sixtus the 4th, forbidding the use of the doctoral and magistral canonries in this matter. Córdoba followed up its victory, and in 1641 obtained another brief forbidding Rueda from receiving the fruits, and appointing the nuncio and the ordinary of Córdoba executors to enforce it, and to relieve the chapter from any censures fulminated in consequence. The Suprema was flushed with its recent victory over the chapter of Valencia, in the matter of Sotomayor's preband and pension, and, in 1642, it addressed to the king an urgent appeal to suppress all such briefs, as Ferdinand had done, 
and representing the eagerness of the curia to destroy the independence of the inquisition and the prerogatives of the crown philip however was not embarrassed with the catalan and portuguese revolts and for once was moderate merely ordering the chapter to desist from the appeal and to surrender the briefs while the inquisitor-general must require rueda to abandon the canonry seeing that he had enough to live on with his salary in the suprema and the wealthy archidiaconate of castro which he also held incidentally the suprema declared that the magistral canonries were out of reach but the doctoral ones were not probably presuming on the royal ignorance trouble continued to the end in sixteen eighty four the chapter of santiago contested vigorously the right of the receiver-general of the suprema to hold a canonry and in spite of the prohibition to appeal to rome it carried the matter there arguing that the officials of the suprema were not included in the papal briefs in this it had the support of the churches in general which united in a memorial to the holy see but the effort was fruitless close watch seems to have been kept on the expiration of the quinquennial periods for in seventeen twenty eight the chapter of valencia refused the daily distributions to non-resident members on the ground that the indult had run out the tribunal appealed to the suprema which replied on april twenty second with a copy of the renewal of the grant by benedict the thirteenth carrying in it to seventeen thirty three Apparently, there had nearly been a lapse. Commissioners were frequently selected from the chapters of their places of residence, and it was a long-debated question whether they were entitled to constant non-residence, seeing that their duties were occasional and mostly local. It was finally settled that they should enjoy the fruits when absent on duty for the Inquisition, but even this was disputed in 1780, by the collegiate church of San Ildefonso Lirena, in the case of the prebendary Pedro Enriquez Verones, a commissioner of the Valladolid tribunal, who was refused his share of the distributions during absence by order of the inquisitors. Inquisitor General Bertran complained to Carlos the Third, who peremptorily ordered payment whenever absent on business of the faith. A similar question apparently arose in eighteen eighteen for the Suprema sent on July the 18th to the Tribunal of Llerena a statement of the case with a copy of the letter of Carlos. The Napoleonic Wars caused a slight lapse in the quinquennial indults. One expired on February the 6th, 1813, a few days before the publication of the Edict of Suppression by the Cortes of Cadiz. When the Inquisition was re-established, it promptly applied for a renewal of the privilege, and on November the 19th, 1814, the Suprema announced that Pius the Seventh had not only granted it, but had ratified the receipt of revenues by non-residents during the interval. This renewal expired on February the 6th, 1818, when there was delay, and the new brief was not issued until March the 15th, but it does not appear that any chapter took advantage of the interval. When this expired, there was no longer an acting inquisition. The overgrown church establishment of Spain, with its accumulation of wealth, afforded a fair mark for acquisitiveness, and several efforts were made to obtain from it a permanent foundation for the inquisition. We have seen how waste and prodigality, to say nothing of peculation, notwithstanding the active business of confiscation, rendered it difficult, in 1497 and 1498, to pay the salaries of officials. A remedy for this was sought in the spoliation of the church, and Ferdinand and Isabella turned to Alexander the Sixth, representing the constant increase of heresy, the additional efforts required for its extirpation, and the insufficiency of confiscation to meet expenses. If the holy work were not to end, aid was needed, and those engaged in it were performing a service to God, equivalent to that of canons in the recitation of the daily offices. If a canonry with its free band in each metropolitan, cathedral, and collegiate church were devoted to the support of the officials, 
so long as the Inquisition should last, it would be a great safeguard to the faith and aid in the destruction of heresy. Alexander granted the request, and by a brief of November the 25th, 1501, he incorporated in the Inquisition a canonry and preband in every church, authorizing the Inquisitor-General to take possession of the first vacancies, and appointing the bishops of Burgos, Córdoba, and Tortosa as executory, with power to suppress all resistance without appeal. It is remarkable that we hear nothing more of this portentous grant. No evidence has reached us of any attempt to enforce it, or of any resistance. Probably even Ferdinand recognized an opposition too dangerous to be provoked, and contented himself with using it as a threat against unruly chapters, which objected to his using canonries to pay his inquisitors. In the project of reform drawn up in 1518, it was proposed that, in place of living on the confiscations and penances, the inquisitors should have one or two canonries for their support. After this scheme fell through, Charles adhered to the idea, and on October 29th, he instructed his ambassador at Rome to procure from Leo X a brief similar to that of Alexander VI. Without some such support, he said, it would be impossible to procure the services of men of proper character and learning. Leo was not as complacent as Alexander, although Charles repeated the request in a personal letter to him on September the 3rd, 1520. Then, on August the 14th, 1521, Cardinal Adrian wrote to Charles, reminding him that, long before, the Pope had conceded a prebend in every church where there was a tribunal in order to remove the infamy ascribed by some persons to inquisitors of desiring the condemnation of the accused in order to assure their support. That concession had not been enforced, principally because the revocation was awaited of the bull against the Inquisition. Now, the Bishop of Alguer, the Roman agent of the Inquisition, has announced the revocation of the bull, and, in order to remove the infamy and perpetuate the Inquisition, he urges Charles to write to Don Juan Manuel in Rome, to procure the grant of the prebends in accordance with a list prepared by the Bishop of Alguer. Charles was probably too much engrossed in the attempt to suppress Luther to devote much attention to the matter, and Adrian, when he succeeded to the papacy, did not use his power to make the grant, although he was involved in a quarrel with the stubborn chapter of Almeria, which refused to admit his transfer to Inquisitor Churruca of Valencia, of a precentorship which he held in that church, a quarrel which lasted until 1524, and required the united efforts of the Suprema, the Tribunal of Murcia, and of the Emperor to bring to a termination. We hear nothing more of the effort at this time, but Charles bore it so strongly in mind that in his will, executed in Brussels, June the 6th, 1554, he dwelt upon the advantages of the measure, and ordered Philip, in case of his own death without obtaining it, to labor with the Holy Father to procure what would be of such advantage to the Inquisition and service to God. The occasion came, in a few years, with the panic caused by the discovery of Protestantism among a few people of quality, a panic skillfully stimulated and exploited. Philip urged his ambassador, Vargas, to obtain from Paul IV a grant of one per cent of ecclesiastical revenues to relieve immediate necessities, and the suppression of a canonry and preband in each cathedral and collegiate church. The Suprema aided in a report to the Pope on September the ninth, 1558, on the alarming progress of Lutheranism. After exaggerating the danger and the labors of the Inquisition, which could only have been carried on through the gift of ten thousand ducats by the king, and contributions from Bales, for it was penniless, the report went on to state that, when the Inquisition was established, there was a tribunal in almost every bishopric, but, as the confiscations fell off, they were diminished to the few that remained, so that there was one which had fifteen sees in its district, 
and it had not funds enough to pay the slender salaries of its officials. Although this had been repeatedly represented to the popes, no remedy had been granted, but now, in these perilous times of heresy, it seemed necessary that the tribunals should be multiplied, as at the beginning, and rendered permanent. All this could very readily be accomplished if the Pope would apply some ecclesiastical revenues, which were of little service to God, and could be better employed in sustaining the holy office, now so enfeebled through lack of funds. Although its work was pushed with all possible diligence, its future was uncertain, if it could not be sustained, and the remedy for this lay with His Holiness. This lying plea aided the pressure brought to bear by the king, and on December the 10th, Vargas was able to report that he and Cardinal Pacheco had had an audience of the Pope, who manifested great goodwill and offered to grant a concession of a hundred thousand ducats to be levied on the clergy in place of one percent on the revenues. After considering the question of the prebends, including the doctoral and magistral ones, he was content to apply to the Inquisition the first vacancy in each cathedral and collegiate church in Spain. This, Vargas adds, should receive special consideration, as it might be refused by another pope, and, when this was gained, if the expenses of the Inquisition increased, there would be little trouble in getting it duplicated. The spread of heresy in France and the dread of its infecting Spain had brought the curia to a complying mood. The Suprema needed no urging to secure so great a prize without loss of time. There could have been little opportunity for discussing details between Rome and Madrid, for the brief was signed on January the 7th, 1559. It recited the reasons set forth in the report of September the 9th, and argued that, as the churches could not subsist without faith, it was better for them to sacrifice a portion of their substance than to risk the whole. Wherefore, motu proprio, with certain knowledge and in the plenitude of apostolic power, the Pope suppressed one canonry and preben in all cathedral and collegiate churches in Spain and the canaries, the first falling vacant, no matter who might have the collation of it, and applied its revenues in perpetuity to the Inquisition. As each fell vacant, the Inquisitor-General should appropriate it and collect the fruits, the consent of the diocesan or of anyone else being in no way requisite, notwithstanding all conciliar decrees and papal constitutions to the contrary, or the claims of holders of expectatives or reversions, or of a long list of possible claimants, which shows how these benefices had been made matters of trade in every possible way. It can only have been the haste in which this long and elaborate document was prepared that explains the omission of executors and power to break down the opposition to be expected from the whole Spanish hierarchy. Valdez, however, boldly assumed that he had the power. On April the 29th, he sent the papal letter to all prelates and chapters, with a missive exhorting bishops, under pain of interdict of entrance to their churches, and requiring all deans, chapters, etc., under penalty of excommunication and two thousand gold ducats, to hold as suppressed, extinct, and perpetually united to the Inquisition the first vacant canonry and preband. In the name of the Inquisition, he accepted them and declared them incorporated in it, and ordered the revocation of all nominations and collations that might have been made since the date of the letters or might be made thereafter. The chapters were commanded to pay over all emoluments as completely as though the canonry were served by an incumbent at all services, and inquisitors were empowered to prosecute all who resisted and to inflict censures and penalties, as well as to appoint procurators to take possession and collect the revenues. And all this he audaciously said that he did by virtue of the sad apostolic faculty conceded to us. Pius IV died on December the ninth, 
1565, and Baldes was shelved in 1566. The brief had conferred the power on his successors as well as on himself, and there was no necessity for its confirmation, but one was procured from Pius V on July the 15th, 1566. The object, evidently, was to cure the defect as to executors who were now appointed with full and arbitrary powers, those named being the bishops of Ziguenza and Palencia and the auditor-general of the papal camera. Some details were added, an unusual feature being the prohibition to assail the letters as surreptitious and obreptitious, showing that this argument had been freely used in the endeavor to escape from their operation. A further confirmation was obtained from Gregory the Thirteenth on July the 8th, 1574, but none seems to have been subsequently thought requisite. No time had been lost in gathering the fruits of the papal grant. On April the 16th, 1559, a provision was dispatched to take possession of a preban which had fallen vacant in the church of Palenosia. On April the 27th, another for one in Leon, and soon afterwards for others in Calahorra and Saragossa. Frequently they were found to be burdened with pensions that had to be recognized, but the process went on, and in comparatively a few years it would seem that vacancies had occurred in most of the chapters. Possession, however, was not had without sturdy resistance, during which, at one time or another, nearly all the chapters were under excommunication. Legal proceedings were frequently resorted to in the desperate hope of averting the absorption, but it was futile. The Suprema was the court of appeal. The cases, practically, were prejudged before they were commenced, and there was no escape. In the end, of course, it made little difference, but a more shameless mockery of justice can scarce be conceived than that which made the tribunal which was to profit by the suppression the judge in its own case. The process may be followed in the voluminous proceedings attending the seizure of a prebend in the collegiate church of Belmonte, a town of some importance in the diocese of Cuenca. In 1559 it fell vacant by the death of Gregorio Osorio, and was filled by the appointment of Francisco Garcia del Espinar, at the instance of the Duke of Escalona, who seems to have had the collation. Bales ordered its seizure, and the matter took the form of a suit between the fiscal of the tribunal of Cuenca on the one side, and on the other the Duke, Espinar, and the prior and chapter of Belmonte, with the Cuenca tribunal as judge, by virtue of a commission from Baldes. The judicial farce ended on October the 8th, 1560, by the inquisitors gravely reciting that they had heard the case and duly considered it with the assistance of persons of conscience and learning, and had found judgment in favor of the fiscal, suppressing the preban and ordering all the income to be turned over to the receiver of the tribunal, including what had accrued since the death of Osorio. It is a striking illustration of the perversion of the sense of justice induced by the inquisitorial process that they were unconscious of the grotesqueness of such a performance, which was rounded out with a long and detailed enumeration of the penalties of disobedience, first a fine of two thousand ducats, and then all the steps of excommunication, anathema, and cursing with bell, book, and candle, an interdict on the town of Belmonte. This formidable sentence was served on October the 15th, on each member of the chapter, and the notarial act was taken of the service. Resistance was felt to be useless. On the 16th, the chapter met and adopted a formal act of obedience, stating that it was through fear of the penalties threatened. The suppression of the preban was ordered to be entered on the capitular records, with the addition that, as the sentence gave no instructions as to the services or masses dependent upon it, or as to the payment of the accrued revenues received by Espinar, the necessary action would be taken subsequently. While thus summarily enforcing the papal grant, the Inquisition prudently respected papal infractions of it. Advantage was taken of the papal claim to all benefices 
falling vacant while their possessors were in Rome, doubtless a costly proceeding, but better than for future. Thus, Gaspar Escudero promptly went to Rome and resigned his canonry of Calahora in the hands of the Pope, and his brother, Rafael, obtained bulls for it, probably subject to a pension. Similarly, Diego de Ortega went through the same form, and Francisco de Bellasagne secured the bulls. The inquisitors claimed them as vacancies, but there was risk in contesting the papal prerogative. Valdez decided, on July the 6th and the 8th, 1559, in both cases, that the vacancies had occurred in Rome, and that the bulls were good. We meet, in 1560, with several similar cases, in Córdoba, Alcalá de Henares, and Tudela, where, after proceedings more or less vigorous, the papal action was respected. Another device to save something from the wreck was to obtain papal grants of pensions. Thus, on January the ninth, 1560, Andrés Martín presented bulls entitling him to a pension of thirty ducats on a canonry of Calahora, vacated by the death of his brother, and it was ordered to be paid. It was the same with a pension of fifty ducats on a suppressed canonry of Cuenca, for which bulls were obtained by Juan Rodríguez and Pedro Vara. Respect at first was also shown to canonries under royal patronage. In Logroño, the inquisitors seized one in the church of Santa Maria la Redonda, but it proved to be a patrimonial one and was released. In time, however, this respect for the crown was surmounted, and we have seen in the century-long contention over the canonries of Antequera, Malaga, and the canaries. It was necessary to systematize the new business thus thrown upon the tribunals, and in August 1560, agents were appointed in the inquisitorial districts to keep watch over vacancies occurring and to take the necessary action. They also made the collections and rendered accounts, but, as the income was largely payable in kind, the disposal of which was a matter of judgment, they were to make no sales without consulting the Suprema, nor payments without its orders. This arrangement was soon found unsatisfactory. The variable character of the revenues, chiefly based on diets and dependent on harvests and markets, afforded abundant opportunity for malversation, it seemed best to come to some understanding with the chapters, and, after much investigation into details, the policy was adopted of farming out the prebends to them. In 1565 and 1566, we find numerous arrangements made of this kind. This, too, proved short-lived, and in 1567 it was determined to farm them out to the best bidders. Finally, in 1570, Regulations were adopted for putting them up at auction, thus ensuring full competition and preventing collusion, and, in 1586, the returns were required to be placed in the coffers with three keys, a system which seems to have continued to the end. There were many intricate questions affording prolific causes of quarrel to keep alive the hostility between the chapters and the Inquisition, engendered by the seizure. There were frequent appeals to Rome, which appear rarely to have benefited the appealant, and the Inquisition eventually was left in assured possession of its acquisitions. Yet the friction was constant, and was inevitable when the relations were so close between parties who disliked and distrusted each other. Thus, in 1665, we find the Suprema rebuking the Barcelona Tribunal for requiring a chapter to exhibit its books to show what were the allotments made to the resident canons. The information, it said, could be obtained in a less offensive way. Again, about the same time, when the Tribunal ordered the farmer of the revenues of the prebend of Guisana to investigate whether the chapter was defrauding it, the Suprema wrote that, as no increase of revenue could be thus obtained, it would be more prudent to keep quiet, especially if the farmer was a beneficed member of the church. It would be better to order the commissioner at Agramont to examine the books of the chapter, because the fifty libras paid by the farmer 
when compared with the two hundred distributed to the canons, was too small. To this, the tribunal replied that it had long been exposed to frauds and suppression of the value of fruits by some of the chapters. As for that of Guisana, it would be useless to examine the books, as the contador would be the first of the conspirators. Petty quarrels such as these are significant of much that was going on everywhere, and of the chronic condition of enmity between the tribunals and the chapters. The former, doubtless, received considerably less than their dues, and the latter, regarding themselves as despoiled, felt justified in withholding from the spoiler whatever they could per fas et nefas. Yet, however much the revenues may have suffered in this way, the prebends constituted, as we shall see hereafter, three-eighths of the resources of the tribunals, reaching in 1731 to nearly 600,000 reales a year, and enabling them to prolong their existence during the later period, when the confiscations and fines and rehabilitations had ceased to furnish available means of support. But for the brilliant stroke by which Valdez secured them in 1559, it may be doubted whether the Inquisition would not have proved so heavy a burden that Carlos III would have allowed it to perish of inanition. End of Book 5, Chapter 4《Book Five, Chapter Five, Part One of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two, by Henry Charles Lee. Book Five, Resources, Chapter Five, Part One, Finances. Indications are not lacking that, when the Inquisition was established, it was not regarded as a permanent institution, but as one to last only until it had purified the land of Jewish apostates. Had its prolonged existence been expected, doubtless provision would have been made, during the early period of large confiscations, to lay aside a fund sufficient for its support after the tide of spoliation should have ebbed. Ferdinand occasionally manifested a desire to establish a foundation for its maintenance, but his own necessities and the greedy pressure for grants rendered nugatory whatever intentions of the kind he may have entertained from time to time. In the proposition made to Charles V in 1519, there is allusion to such a plan, proposed by Ferdinand, of securing censos which should place the institution on a firm financial basis, and which had been partially carried out in some places. There is slender trace, however, of any results of such policy. When there were large confiscations in Sicily, he ordered, June 27, 1513, that none of the censos so obtained should be sold, but that they should be kept for the support of the tribunal. Apparently this was not done by the receiver, Diego de Obregón, who, on quitting Sicily in 1514, left behind him the considerable sum of twelve hundred ounces, which Ferdinand ordered his successor, Garci Seethe, to invest in censos, but the subsequent condition of the tribunal shows that peculation and extravagance rendered impossible any accumulation. We have seen that, in 1517, Seville and Cordova had reserved funds in public securities, but they were absorbed by the Suprema. Possibly these were derived from the great composition described above, a cedula bearing the name of Queen Juana, February 24, 1516, states that it was devoted to the purchase of censos for the Inquisition, but we have had occasion to see how it was frittered away so that only a moderate portion can have reached its destination. The Toledo Tribunal, in 1515, received from Ferdinand the absolute ownership of the building occupied by it and some other properties. Doubtless there were other donations of greater or less amount, but these are the only appropriations for the permanent support of the tribunals of Castile that I have met with. As for those of Aragon, a letter of Cardinal Adrian, January 30, 1520, 
allowing Saragossa to draw upon the fines and penances for its expenses, until it could get some confiscations, shows that it had no other source of support. Barcelona was somewhat better off, for the local government, in consideration of the Concordia of 1520, granted it 12,000 libras, and though the Inquisition subsequently saw fit to deny this, a letter of the Suprema in 1521 directing the Diputados to invest in censos the sum, which they had already deposited, shows that on their side at least the bargain was honestly carried out. What between this and the results of the somewhat irregular industry of the inquisitors, the tribunal must have been fairly well supplied, for in 1550 we chance to hear of an ayuda de costa of twenty-four ducats granted to its notary Bartolomé García for his labor in copying the books of censos which it held in Perpignan and the accounts of the receiver. As for Valencia, at this period, I have met with no data. These indications are fragmentary, but they suffice to justify the conclusion that the proceeds of the great confiscations in the early period were dissipated without laying up any permanent provision for the future. As the Suprema, throughout the first half of the sixteenth century, was constantly drawing upon the tribunals, it proves that, as a rule, they were making more than their expenses, and that when one chanced to run short, its deficiency was supplied from some more fortunate one. The grant, in 1559, of a hundred thousand ducats, levied upon the Spanish ecclesiastics, was probably, for the most part, invested by the Suprema for its own benefit, though ten thousand ducats were placed in the hands of its alguacil mayor, Ibarra, to be drawn upon for special purposes. Then came the suppression of the prebends, which was expected to relieve all necessities, but it seems to have led to improvidence, for, in 1573, the Suprema complained that monies received from redemption of censos had not been reinvested but had been spent, and it called for reports as to amounts received and expended. Apparently the explanations were not satisfactory, for, in 1579, peremptory orders were issued that, when a censo was paid off, the money must be reinvested in another, no matter how imperative might be other calls. Thus, in 1586, the tribunals were called upon for reports of their revenues, as it was understood that these had increased, together with statements as to the product of the prebends and censos. It is not likely that these were fully and frankly rendered. Under the rules, as we shall see, monthly statements were required, which should have made demands for special reports superfluous, but the tribunals were apt to observe towards the Suprema the same reticence which it showed to the king. We happen to have the report of Valencia, made in 1587, in response to this order, and find that it is quite imperfect. No mention is made of the confiscations and penances, and various items are omitted, while the 2,500 ducats levied on the Moriscos shrink to 1,500 libras, and the total amounts to about 5,000 libras for the year. Yet Valencia must have been abundantly supplied, for, when in 1601 the Suprema gave it permission to have a canopy, for occasions of extraordinary sentences, made at a cost not exceeding 500 ducats, when it was finished the bill amounted to over 900. The Suprema grumbled at this extravagance, but finally ordered it to be paid. The tribunal of Logroño must also have been in funds, for we chance to learn that, in 1587, it lent to the Countess of Orsono the sum of 155,535 reales, 17 maravedis, for which it received the annual interest of 4,552 reales, 5 maravedis, or about 3%. At this period the Inquisition ought to have been financially comfortable, with its prebends and ordinary sources of income, besides having nearly all its higher officials quartered on the churches. But the fall in the purchasing power of money had necessitated a rise in all salaries, and it is not backward in making complaint. In 1595 a memorial of the Suprema to Philip II refers to frequent previous appeals representing the diminution of its property and income, together with the multiplication of officials, 
and declares that, if some remedy is not found, the king will be obliged to make up the deficiency. Soon after this, the tribunals of the kingdoms of Aragon suffered considerably from the expulsion of the Moriscos in 1609-10, to to which they had so largely contributed. The blow fell with special severity on Valencia, where the Moorish population was largest, and the tribunal lost its 2,500 ducats a year and unlimited power of inflicting ten ducat fines. In 1615 we find the Suprema ordering the salaries prorated in conformity with the collections, though at the same time the alcalde Gil no Guerol was jubilated with a salary of 40,000 maravedis, and Nicholas Claver, the steward of the prison, was told to look for something from which a grant could be made to him. Ample use was made of the distress in Aragon to stimulate royal liberality. January 30, 1617, the Suprema represented it to Philip III, but his extravagance had kept him penniless, and the appeal was unanswered. It returned to the charge, October 22, 1618, perhaps thinking that the fall of the Duke of Lerma might lead to a more favorable hearing. The condition of the tribunal of Majorca was represented as deplorable. It could no longer be helped, as formerly, by Valencia, for that tribunal had a yearly deficit of four hundred ducats. Barcelona was in like evil plight, and the tribunals of Castile could no longer afford it the aid they used to give. As for Saragossa, its distress had already been represented to the king, who was prayed to order the vice-chancellor of Aragon to make provision for its relief. Then, in another consulta of 1619, the Suprema asserted that, taking the Inquisition as a whole, its expenses exceeded its income, and that the deficiency must be supplied by the king. As a convincing argument, it added that, when vacancies occurred, it proposed to suppress three inquisitorships, sixteen secretaryships, and its own three supernumerary members, an intention that failed of realization we may responsibly hesitate to accept these clamorous complaints of poverty when the suprema so carefully kept the sovereign in the dark as to its real resources nor is it easy to reconcile with them the assertion of fray bleda in sixteen eighteen that the spanish inquisition was so richly endowed that it had a hundred places in receipt of incomes larger than those of many italian bishoprics no doubt, during the ensuing period of war, misgovernment, and elaborate financial blundering, the Inquisition in some degree shared the distress which was universal throughout Spain, but it had resources more available and more jealously husbanded than the other departments of the state. It was exposed to less pressure, and it managed to meet the incessant demands of Philip the Fourth with no very severe sacrifice of its invested capital." Of course, the customary complaints continued. In a consulta of March 28, 1681, the Suprema bewailed the poverty of the organization, the lack of means among the tribunals to pay the salaries and maintenance of prisoners, which it had repeatedly represented with statements of the contador general showing the income of each tribunal with its deficit. This may have been true as regards some of them, owing to special causes. Thus a consulta of November 6, 1677, asserts that the Concordia of 1646 had reduced Saragossa to such penury that the last statement of its very moderate salaries showed an amount of 111,246 silver sueldos due to the officials, forcing the Suprema this year to assist it with 1,750 pieces of eight, a grant that it cannot repeat owing to its own very narrow means. In other cases, distress may be attributed to incurable laxity of management, as in Toledo, where a statement of 1647 shows a payment by the receiver of 105,984 maravedis to the inquisitor Santros de San Pedro, accompanied with the remark that lack of means prevents his paying the balance still due but it also shows that the receiver held 801,724 maravedis of obligations so worthless that the auditor did not consider advisable any attempt to collect them. 
and that there were arrearages due on sensos and other sources of revenue amounting to one million three hundred fifty three thousand four hundred fifty two maravedis this justifies what was asserted in the plain spoken memorial of sixteen twenty three to the suprema that through negligence there have been such losses that if they had been avoided the tribunals would be abundantly provided this is attributed to the beggarly salaries of the financial officials not having enough to support them they engage in other occupations and being sure of their salaries they pay no attention to their duties another effect is that it is necessary to appoint natives who through kinship or fear of offending their neighbors do not execute orders or who grant such delays that the chances of collecting are lost moreover as they get no fees for looking up evidence and documents suits miscarry incompetent slovenly and often corrupt administration such as this affords ample explanation of whatever distress may have existed nor was malversation confined to the local tribunals in november sixteen forty two madrid was startled when by order of the inquisitor-general the presiding member of the suprema pedro pachecho was suddenly arrested for malversation in office and was hurried off to leon without allowing him to communicate with the king or with olivares and every one said that it was a judgment of god on him for his extortions the same pacheco to whom philip had just granted some thirty thousand ducats accruing from the sale of offices there is significance in the cautious remark of pelliser august fifteenth sixteen forty three comparing the death of don lope de morales of the council of castile who died very poor and of inquisitor alcedo of the suprema who died very rich leaving forty thousand ducats in gold and silver the financial elasticity of the tribunals was remarkable especially when stimulated by the pressure of poverty for they held the means of recuperation in their own hands valencia undoubtedly suffered for a while from the morisco expulsion yet in sixteen thirty we chance to learn that it had forty five thousand five hundred ducats invested in municipal bonds at five per cent yielding an income of two thousand two hundred seventy five ducats in sixteen thirty three the suprema is scolding it for its extravagance in illuminations and bullfights and in the same year it is seeking investments for its spare funds this prosperity continued for in sixteen sixty a statement of its income shows four thousand six hundred libras from interest on bonds and five hundred thirty from the rents of some houses in addition to the four canonries and the fines and confiscations after the suppression of the catalan rebellion in sixteen fifty two the restored barcelona tribunal had to reconstruct itself from the foundations but it speedily became opulent for in sixteen sixty two to four it spent more than four thousand two hundred libras in damask hangings repairs and extraordinary ayudas de costa and in sixteen sixty six it was investing one thousand libras in a censo as in duty bound a portion of the savings of the inquisition was invested in government securities between sixteen sixty one and sixteen sixty seven there were placed in this manner from the proceeds of confiscations sums amounting to six hundred ninety one thousand two hundred seventy two maravedis and in sixteen sixty eight this was increased by two hundred two thousand seven hundred seventy one the whole aggregate at this date being seven million eight hundred seventy seven thousand nine hundred ninety nine with customary favoritism its holdings were exempted from the deductions amounting to partial repudiation in which the necessities of spanish finance sought relief taking it as a whole i think we may assume that during the vicissitudes of the seventeenth century the inquisition had abundant means for its support and that despite its incessant complaints of poverty it suffered less from the exigencies of the time than any other department of the government internal mismanagement or external causes may have brought temporary distress on individual tribunals but persecution was still a lucrative business and such troubles were speedily overcome as for the suprema we have seen that it was always in funds 
not only for its necessities but for its luxuries and for the liberalities showered upon its members and subordinates while the examination of a large series of receipts for salaries and perquisites shows that payments were made with a punctuality rare in the Spanish administration of the period. Certain it is that the Count of Frigiliana, in his addition to the Consulta Magna of 1696, assumes that the Inquisition was richly endowed with the prebends, the real estate acquired through confiscation, and the censos and other investments which it had accumulated. The opening of the eighteenth century was ominous of troubles to come. The war of succession threw everything into disorder. Not only were the inquisitorial finances affected, but the exigencies of the Bourbon government caused it to levy exactions which Philip the Fourth, in his deepest distress had not ventured upon. About 1704 a tax of five per cent was laid on the salaries of all officials, and this soon afterwards was increased to ten. Then, in 1707, the Inquisition had to bear its part in a general donation, the collection of which was entrusted to the bishops, as though the Suprema was distrusted, and in 1709 this was followed by an honesto subsidio. To obtain some return for this, the Suprema ordered lists to be made up of all benefices not requiring residence throughout Spain, under royal patronage, and asked the king to incorporate them in the Inquisition, but this somewhat audacious request was refused. Complaints of poverty continued, and, if we may trust a tabular statement of the receipts and expenditures of each tribunal, drawn up in 1731, they were fully justified, for the finances must have undergone a most notable deterioration under Philip V. Indeed, it is a mystery how the institution continued to exist under such conditions, with a yearly deficit of over half a million reales, and nearly a million and a half of overdue wages to its employees. The expenses of the Suprema are represented as about double its receipts. Only two tribunals, those of Santiago and Seville, show a small excess of income, while Valencia prudently squares its accounts to a maravedi. The rest all show a greater or less deficit. The Suprema no longer draws at will on the tribunals, but some of them have to make to it definite subventions. Thus Santiago is obliged to contribute 18,000 reales, Cordova 10,000, Seville 20,000, Murcia 45,000, and Majorca 10,000, the rest nothing, but on what principle these payments were based does not appear. Each tribunal, although subordinate to the Suprema in financial matters, has its own budget, its own independent resources, and is left to manage its deficit as best it can. The result, as might be expected, is various. Cordova, Murcia, and Majorca would be solvent but for the subventions to the Suprema. The little Majorca tribunal, formerly so necessitous, was now the largest salary list of all, amounting to 104,694 reales, but it likewise enjoys the largest revenue from investments, 96,829 drawn naturally from its lucky confiscations in 1678 and 1691, from which it doubtless secured an endowment. Toledo, with but a moderate deficit of 27,000, owes over 250,000 reales to its officials. Saragossa continues unfortunate. It was ejected from the Aljaferia, probably as an incident of the War of Succession, but Philip V, in 1708, granted it 5,200 ducats a year out of the confiscations to rent buildings. This was withdrawn in 1725, and in 1727 the Suprema appealed to the king with a deplorable account of its condition, dependent on its prebends and with an income less than half of its payroll. Its position had not improved in 1731. It had undertaken to put up new buildings, on which 20,000 ducats had been spent, and more than 20,000 additional were required for their completion. It was very expensively managed, with a salary list of nearly 93,000 reales, and total expenses of 118,000, on an income of about 80,000, 
while Barcelona paid in salaries only 50,000, and its whole expenditure was less than 60,000 on an income of 48,000. Santiago was fortunate in its prebends, which brought in nearly 88,000 a year. Outside of this, it had only 5,000 from investments, but it was able to pay its subvention and had surplus of nearly 4,000. In only four tribunals, Santiago, Seville, Murcia, and Valencia, were the salaries fully paid up. The whole statement illustrates the curious lack of system under which the Inquisition had continued since its foundation. Under Ferdinand, he handled its finances as his own, using them according to his necessities, with improvident disregard of the future, and without formulating an arrangement by which its affairs could be placed on a stable basis, although its gains were aleatory and subject inevitably to diminution as it accomplished the object of its creation. Then, under Charles V, the Suprema assumed control, supplying its own wants from any surplus presumably existing in any tribunal, and transferring sums from one to another as exigencies presented themselves in the fluctuating stream of confiscations. The absorption of the prebends afforded for the first time a more stable revenue, although these two were variable. Each tribunal acquired those which fell within its district, thus obtaining an unequal basis of support, and becoming in a certain sense financially independent, although subject to the scrutiny and control of the Suprema. Thus one might be wealthy, and another poverty-stricken. There was no solidarity, no common treasury into which the receipts of each were poured, and from which their necessities were supplied. The Suprema had a general auditor's office, to which the accounts of all the receivers or treasurers were rendered, enabling it to exercise supervision, and a more or less fitful and efficient direction, but it was more intent on providing for its own wants than in enforcing responsibility upon the local financial officials. It wasted its energies on the prettiest details, while distance and difficult communication forced it practically to leave important questions to the discretion of the tribunals. The anomalous financial organization, which thus developed, combined the vices of centralization and local self-government with divided responsibility and inefficient supervision. A tribunal which chanced to have large confiscations or numerous and lucrative prebends, with honest and capable administration, prospered, while others not so fortunate were reduced to penury. Towards the middle of the century, the condition seems to have slightly improved. A writer, evidently well informed, who complains bitterly that the usefulness of the Inquisition was crippled by inadequate means, states its revenues at 948,000 reales, derived from invested property, and 637,000 from a hundred prebends and some pensions, while its salaries and expenses amount to 1,900,000, leaving a deficit of 400,000. He proposes that the property derived from confiscations, representing a capital of 36 million, should be abandoned to the king, and that the church be levied upon to raise the total income to 2,700,000, which he assumes to be absolutely essential. It is scarce necessary to enter into the details of this proposed levy, except to mention that he says that there were a 113 collegiate churches in which no prebend had been suppressed, and these, averaging them at 2,500 reales, would yield 282,500 a year. Also that there were 49 inquisitors enjoying prebends and benefices, averaging 11,000 a year, which should be incorporated, yielding 539,000. Another writer of the same period seeks relief by suppressing unnecessary officials and absorbing some more prebends, after which the king should assume the whole responsibility, appointing the salaried officials, collecting the revenues, and paying the expenses, when, if he had to make good a deficiency, he could not devote public money to a cause more useful and just. This writer also makes a most earnest appeal for increased salaries for the inferior officials, who, he says, were objects of popular derision in consequence of the meanness of their appearance. When one died, 
the expenses of his sickness and burial had to be defrayed by the tribunal in the shape of an ayuda de costa, and while living they were overwhelmed with debts which they had no means of paying, as shown by the number of claims filed by creditors. In the provinces they often had to supplement their wages by beggary, and their integrity suffered, for the starving are easy objects for temptations. I have not met with statistics as to the subsequent condition of each tribunal, but there are indications that some at least were comfortably endowed. Thus Valencia which, in 1731, showed a carefully balanced statement of receipts and expenditures, is found, in 1773 and 1774, purchasing real estate as an investment for surplus funds. In 1792, the Suprema, in response to a demand for increase of salaries, ordered from all the tribunals a statement of income and expenses for the seven years, 1784 to 90. The return of Valencia shows, for 1790, an income of 12,207 libras and an expenditure of 7,777, or a surplus of 4,430, though its payroll comprised twenty-five officials, receiving in all five thousand six hundred sixteen. Its coffer contained at the same time an accumulation of thirty-two thousand seven hundred seven libras, although, for the five years previous, it had spent an average of five thousand libras a year in permanent improvements and investments. Perhaps this can scarce be taken as an example of all the tribunals, but it would indicate that some, at least, were not oppressed with poverty, while the absurdly small item of thirty-nine libras for sueldos expended on maintenance of prisoners in 1790 indicates how little real work was performed by its overgrown staff. This flourishing condition was not destined to continue. The necessities of the government, in its foolish wars with France, England, and Portugal, caused it to call upon the Inquisition to convert its investments into public funds. The Valencia Tribunal reported to the Suprema, February 23, 1802, that, in obedience to its order of January 22nd, there had been realized from the sale of farms the sum of 62,584 libras, which had been duly paid over to the Caja de Consolidación de Valles, and of course all such patriotic contributions disappeared in the years of trouble which ensued. Equally unfortunate was an investment made in 1795, likewise by order of the Suprema, of 6,640 libras in an obligation of the Real Compañía Maritima, on which, as it reported in 1805, it had never received any interest. In the same year it presented a dolorous account of the misery of its officials, who, from their inadequate salaries, had been forced to make a voluntary donation of four per cent to the government, and, under pressure from the captain-general, to contribute one hundred seventy-five reales to the support of the silk weavers thrown out of employment, which, it suggested, should be paid for them by the tribunal, as, for two years and a half, it had had no fiscal, and thus had saved his salary. The tribunal of Logroño must have husbanded its resources, for it was able, July 23, 1808, to lend to the authorities thirty thousand reales towards a fund demanded by the French general Verdier for abstaining from sacking the town. Under the restoration, a return of the loan was vainly claimed. End of Book 5, Chapter 5, Part 1book five chapter five part two of the history of the inquisition of spain volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the history of the inquisition of spain volume two by henry charles lee book five resources chapter five part two finances Worse was to come in the revolutionary times which followed. 
Napoleon, on his arrival at Madrid, December 4, 1808, issued a decree abolishing the Inquisition and confiscating its property to the crown, and this, of course, was enforced wherever the French armies penetrated. On the other hand, the Cortes of Cadiz had learned, from the example of the Inquisition, that useless benefices were a financial resource, and one of their earliest acts was a decree of December 1, 1810, forbidding the nomination of incumbents to all prebends, raciones, and benefices, vacant or falling vacant, except magistral, doctoral, lectoral, and penitentiary prebends, or benefices having cure of souls, under which the suppressed canonries were made to contribute to the War of Independence. The Holy Office was virtually extinct when it was suppressed by the Cortes in 1813, and we shall see hereafter how painful was the resuscitation of its finances under the Restoration. The financial organization of the Inquisition at first was simple and even crude. The receiver of confiscations, or treasurer, was a royal official. Ferdinand always speaks of him as mi receptor, and it was the king who issued commissions to all the officials on the financial side of the tribunals, the receiver, the auditor, and the judge of confiscations, although, after the incorporation of the prebends, the inquisitor-general added powers to administer the revenues from ecclesiastical sources, as this was his exclusive province under papal briefs. When Ferdinand died, January 23, 1516, it is not surprising that difficulties were thrown in the way of the receivers, on the ground that their commissions expired with him. To meet this, letters were issued to them, in the name of Queen Juana, February 28th and March 4th, instructing them that they were still in office, with full authority to make collections and to pay salaries and expenses. By the time of the resignation of Charles V, the system had become so firmly established that no questions seemed to have arisen, although probably with each new monarch commissions were renewed. The office was rightly considered to be one of much importance, especially in the early period of large confiscations. In 1486, the receiver figures in the Saragossa payroll for a salary of 3,000 sueldos to 4,000 for the inquisitors, while in those of Medina del Campo and Jaén he has 80,000 maravedis to 60,000 for the inquisitors. In 1515, the receiver and the inquisitor in Sicily both received three hundred ducats. The receiver necessarily required assistance and agents, as the properties under his charge were scattered throughout his district. At first these were paid by the fisc, but Jimenez, in his reform of 1516, required receivers to pay for them out of their salary of sixty thousand maravedis, an economy of doubtful wisdom. In time, the comparative importance of the receiver diminished, and in the middle of the eighteenth century, we find him, or treasurer as he is then called, rated at four hundred ducats, while the inquisitors and fiscal have eight hundred. At times there were distinct receivers for the confiscations and for the fines, penances, and rehabilitations, but usually one sufficed, though the accounts were kept separate. The receiver was required, by the instructions of 1498, to give satisfactory bonds to the amount of 300,000 maravedis. A regulation of 1579 prescribed that these bonds were to be renewed every three years, and that, when one of the bondsmen died, he was to be replaced at once, under pain of major excommunication, la toe sententioe, but the frequency with which this rule was enunciated indicates how difficult was its enforcement. While the power of the receiver in making collections was almost boundless, in disbursements he was prudently limited. An instruction of Desa, in 1504, requires the auditors not to pass in the accounts any item for which the receiver could not exhibit an order from the king, the inquisitor-general, the suprema, or the judge of confiscations in matters adjudicated by him. In Aragon, the accounts were audited by the maestre racional, or auditor-general of the kingdom, and in Castile, by the auditor of the Suprema, after which they are submitted to Ferdinand, who examined them minutely and decided as to the items disallowed by the auditors. 
All this, as we have seen, passed into the hands of the Suprema, which exercised the most careful watchfulness over all gastos extraordinarios, or expenditures other than the regular payment of salaries and the like. Thus, in 1645, Martin Pretel, the treasurer of Toledo, paid out, on orders of the inquisitors, one hundred ninety and one-half reales for repairs to a house occupied by one of them, and one hundred sixteen reales for repairs to the prison. The auditor refused to pass these trivial outlays, and it was not until 1654 that the Suprema allowed them, with a caution that in future the cartas acordadas must be observed. The utmost precision and minuteness were exacted, with elaborate vouchers containing the order authorizing payment and the receipt of the payee. In the accounts for 1524, of Cristóbal de Medina, receiver of Valencia, he recites an order issued by the inquisitors to Pere Sorel, who was repairing the palace of the Inquisition, granting him an old chain which hung under some of the windows, and he includes Sorel's receipt for it. Similarly, in the Valencia accounts for 1759, we find the inquisitors issuing orders and receipts taken in the case of the charwoman, Josefa Serra, who was paid three libras for sweeping out the rooms from January 1st to St. John's Day, and five libras for carrying the seat of honor twice to the church of Santa Ana, and once to San Salvador. So with Juan Garcia, paid one libra ten sueldos for taking up and putting down the mats, and one libra four sueldos for two cords for the well." There was perhaps some excuse for dilatoriness in rendering accounts so elaborately minute, accompanied with the requisite orders and vouchers, but a more efficient reason was that the receiver was apt to be in arrears, using the funds for his own profit, in defiance of stringent regulations, and his account rendered was sure to be followed with a demand to pay a balance due. Ferdinand, as we have seen, and after him the Suprema, labored vainly to secure promptitude and regularity. In 1560 it devised an elaborate plan for appointing an auditor for every two tribunals, with a salary of forty thousand maravedis, for which he was to spend alternate years in examining their several accounts. Collusion between him and the receivers was guarded against by severe penalties for paying his salary except on orders from the Suprema and threats of prosecuting him for neglect of duty. When a balance was struck, the receiver was to deposit it within nine days in the coffer of the tribunal, and furnish the Suprema with evidence of the fact within nine days more. If he failed in this, the inquisitors were to imprison him under pain of forfeiting their salaries from that time forth. As each account was completed, the auditor was to forward a copy to the Suprema, and he was further to supervise the accounts of the collectors of the suppressed prebends, and to see that all receipts were duly deposited in the coffer. The scheme has interest from the insight which it gives into the disorder and dilapidation characteristic of inquisitorial finance, rather than from any improvement which it caused, for it seems to have proved impracticable. It is true that, in 1570, there were some additional instructions as to details, which look as if, after ten years, there was an effort to make it work, but it was soon afterwards abandoned, and, in 1572, there was a return to the old system by ordering from each tribunal an annual statement. This was followed by requiring a monthly report as to the management of property and the returns collected, but this seems to have received as little obedience as previous instructions. The memorial of 1623 to the Suprema urges strongly the enforcement of the instructions of 1560, that an auditor should, every year, audit the accounts of the treasurer in the presence of an inquisitor, under penalty of forfeiture of a year's salary by both. The statements thus rendered should then be examined by the fiscal of the Suprema, with the aid of an expert accountant, for, through the lack of this, in the previous accounts there have been great errors, and if they were reviewed by a shrewd examiner it would be discovered how large have been the losses. The writer evidently had little faith in the receivers-general and auditors-general on whom the Suprema depended, 
but his suggestions were not acted upon, and the Suprema contented itself with calling upon the dilatory treasurers for annual reports, and occasionally getting their statements. The secret of the delay is indicated in instructions to the Valencia Tribunal, in 1633, that, when Melchor de Mendoza, the treasurer, has finished the accounts which he has commenced, pressure must be brought to bear to make him pay the balance against him. The depositarios de los pretendientes, who had charge of the deposits of those seeking proofs of limpieza, emulated the treasurers. A letter of March 28, 1665, to the Barcelona Tribunal, calls attention to a carta acordada of January 16, 1620, ordering the accounts of the depositario to be included in the annual statements required for the Auditor General. The latter, however, reports that he has received none for many years, wherefore it is ordered that an itemized statement in detail, including everything since the last account rendered, shall be made out, showing what is due to all parties concerned. It may reasonably be doubted whether the command was obeyed. In 1713, orders were sent to Valencia that, if the depositario did not pay the balance in four months, pressure was to be brought to bear upon him, and the secretaries were to be forced to pay him what they owed him. The pressure was unavailing, for a prolonged correspondence ensued on the subject throughout 1714. Towards the close of the century, however, we find the depositario of Valencia rendering statements with some degree of regularity every two years. If the accounts of the tribunals are thus carelessly kept, those of the Suprema would appear to be equally disordered. At least such conclusion is justified when, in 1685, we find it asking the Tribunal of Valencia for a statement of the remittances which it had made to the Treasurer-General. In 1695, the request is repeated for the years 1693 and 1694, and again in 1714, 1715, and 1726, all of which would argue most slovenly bookkeeping. Towards the close of its career, apparently, the Inquisition had succeeded in establishing a more methodical system. In 1803, Barcelona is rendering monthly statements of receipts and expenditures with commendable regularity, and we may attribute to the political perturbations the fact that the accounts of Valencia for the years 1807, 1809, and 1810 were not audited by the Suprema until 1816. Confidence in the integrity of the average receiver was evidently neither felt nor deserved, and at an early period the device was adopted of the Arca de Tres Llaves, a coffer placed in the secreto, with three locks of which the keys were held by the receiver, by an inquisitor, and by the scrivener of sequestrations, so that it could be opened only in the presence of all three. In this repository the receiver was required to place all monies coming into his hands, and so it remained until the last, as a fine example of archaic simplicity. To this there were occasional variations, such as requiring two areas, one for confiscations and one for fines and penances, or, when the tribunals were living on their incomes, one for capital and the other for revenue. As a rule, however, one sufficed, and it was customarily divided into two compartments, for confiscations and fines and penances respectively. The rules prescribed in 1514 by Inquisitor General Mersader indicate the precautions regarded as necessary to reduce to a minimum the temptations of the receiver. He was to receive no money save in presence of the scrivener of sequestrations or of the secreto. All collections were to be placed in the coffer within three days of their receipt in the presence of an inquisitor and of a scrivener. When subordinates brought funds from other places, they were to be delivered to him within two days in presence of a scrivener, and he was required to deposit them within twenty-four hours. Fraud and deceit, Mersader says, must cease in the collection and sales of confiscations, and in depositing and taking out monies from the coffer. All expenses, ordinary and extraordinary, were to be paid with money taken from the coffer. The scrivener must, with his own hands, keep duplicate books, 
with dated entries, of all deposits and withdrawals, one copy to be kept in his possession, and the other in the coffer. No monies must be taken out for loans or other purpose, save the expenses of the tribunals, without the express license of the king and inquisitor-general. Every two months the receiver and scrivener, in presence of an inquisitor, must verify the accounts and the money on hand, and must send a written statement of the latter to the inquisitor-general. Any omission or deviation from this, by receiver, inquisitor, or scrivener, was punishable with excommunication and a fine of five hundred ducats. All the officials concerned were to be furnished with copies of these instructions, and one was to be placed in the coffer. It was one thing to frame precise regulations, and another to secure their observance. These instructions were sent to Sicily in 1515, but evasions were speedily invented, for already in 1516 a letter of the Suprema asserts that experience had shown that the custodians of the three keys, by lending them to each other, committed frauds on the monies in the coffer. To prevent this, it devised wholly inefficient regulations as to the parties to whom the keys should be confided in the absence of the regular custodians, so that, as it naively remarked, no frauds may be committed in the future. It argues a singularly hopeful spirit in the Suprema if it expected that such precautions would preclude embezzlement, when the standard of official morality was so low that malversation was prevalent everywhere and was rarely if ever punished by dismissal from office. How tenderly such indiscretions were treated is manifested in a case occurring in Barcelona in 1514. Francisco de San Clement owed 186 libras to the confiscated estate of Bernardo and Dionis Venet. His father paid 150 on account, but this was not credited, being evidently embezzled, and on June 13th, Ferdinand ordered the receiver, Mateo de Morano, not to press the suit against San Clement on account of the damage it would inflict on the honor of the officials. The matter was to be hushed up in order to spare the reputation of the tribunal. When theft was thus condoned, we need not wonder at the condition of the receptoria of Saragossa, characterized by fraud, disorder, and neglect, as described by the auditor Anton Navarro, in a letter which Ferdinand gave, in 1515, to the archdeacon of Almasan, when sending him thither as inspector. Allusion has been made above to the remedy sought by Jimenez in 1517 by sending an auditor-general to inspect all the tribunals and ascertain the balances due. It was probably in consequence of this that Juan Martinez de Guilestegui, the former receiver of Toledo, was found indebted in the sum of 51,500 maravedis, but there was no thought of punishing him, and, with customary tenderness, Charles V forgave him half of the debt, and promised that on payment of this he should be free of all further claim. Apparently it was a matter of course that receivers should be in debt to the fisc, although, if the rules as to the three-keyed coffer were observed, there was no opportunity for them to be in arrears. The rules, in fact, were disregarded with impunity. Inquisitor-General Manrique, writing to Sicily in 1525, says that they had not been observed for several years, and orders them to be enforced under the prescribed penalties. But as he did not inflict those penalties for past disobedience, his threats were a mere brutum fulmen. The consequence of this condonation of malpractice appears wherever there is opportunity of investigation. One of Ferdinand's most trusted receivers was Amador de Aliaga of Valencia, on his death, about 1529, when concealment was no longer possible, he was found to be a defaulter, and as one of the inquisitors was his heir, the Suprema ordered him to make good the deficit out of the estate. Then Pedro Sorel, a notary of the Secreto, was in the enjoyment of certain confiscated houses granted to him by Ferdinand, subject to a censo of 2,975 sueldos. This had clandestinely been paid out of the funds of the tribunal. Sorel refused restitution, and the Suprema merely told the inquisitors to persuade him to refund the amount without a suit. This same Sorel had covertly, through a third party, 
purchased a censo of eight thousand swellos, particularly well secured, sold by the fisc in order to pay salaries. The Suprema rebuked the tribunal for parting with so choice an investment, but there was no talk of dismissing or punishing the guilty notary. When the officials enriched themselves with impunity, it is not difficult to understand the incessant complaints of the poverty of the tribunals. That a receiver was expected to use the money in his hands, and to be in arrears, is indicated by a letter of the Suprema, in 1542, on learning the death of Ramon de Esparza, receiver of Majorca. He had not sent in his accounts, and the inquisitor was empowered to compel his heirs to render a statement, and to pay whatever balance might be found due. The device of the coffer had fallen evidently into complete neglect, and the Suprema endeavoured to resuscitate it by a carta acordada of December 9, 1545, which prescribed that all collections were to be deposited within three days of receipt, if made in the city, or within four days if made in the country, and salaries and other expenses were to be paid only from the money in the coffer, under pain of excommunication, la te sententiae, and of ten ducats for each infraction. This was the commencement of an endless series of legislation reiterating or modifying the regulations in a manner to indicate how impossible it was to enforce observance. The delay allowed for deposit was increased from three days to ten. Receivers were required to take an oath to obey. Reports of all deposits and withdrawals were ordered to be rendered every four months. These constant repetitions are the measure of their inefficiency, and the hardened indifference of the receivers is evidenced by a complaint of Reynoso, inquisitor of Toledo, in 1556, that since the accounts of the receiver had been balanced, he had received large sums which he refused to deposit in the coffer, saying that his accounts had been settled. Then, in 1560, the order of 1545 was reissued, with instructions that, in case of infraction, the receiver was to be prosecuted and punished, evidence of which was to be furnished to the Suprema. It was all in vain, and the receivers continued to hold their collections at their convenience. In 1569, with the object of reducing to some kind of order the finances of the tribunals, a junta de hacienda, or finance committee, was constituted in each, consisting of the inquisitors, the judge of confiscations, the receiver, and the notary of sequestrations, which was to meet on the last day of each month and consider all questions of property and income, deciding them by a majority vote. This, with occasional modifications, remained a standing feature of the tribunals, although the repeated exhortations and commands that the sessions be held regularly show how difficult it was to secure business-like action and management. The attempt was made to utilize this organization in compelling the receivers to deposit their collections in the coffers. In 1576, and again in 1579, orders were issued that, at the monthly meetings, the receiver should declare, under oath and under excommunication, the amount of money in his hands, what he had collected, and what placed in the coffer. This was ineffectual, and then it was tried to compel the notary of sequestrations to make a declaration that the receiver had deposited all that he admitted to have received. Then, in 1584, a concession was made allowing the receiver to make his deposits monthly, which of course only increased the risk of defalcations. This was followed, in 1586, by orders that he must be compelled to collect and deposit promptly the revenues of the prebends, and that, at the monthly meetings, the schedule of income was to be examined in order to see what had been collected and deposited. It would be wearisome to pursue further these details, which continued indefinitely, with perpetual and ineffectual iteration, to compel the receivers to hand over their collections without delay. It hardly needs the assertion of the memorial of 1623 that the coffer was used in but very few places as a depository for the funds of the tribunals. The writer adds that the receivers thus incur excommunication and commit perjury monthly. The finances suffer great losses, and the receivers are ruined by squandering the money, 
but the only remedy that he can suggest is that the penalties be increased and strict orders be issued that under no pretext should funds be left outside of the coffers these expedients had been abundantly tried but in the absence of rigid discipline and of punishment of offenders they had been and continued to be fruitless another and most serious omission pointed out was that in many tribunals there was no libro becerro or register of property with descriptions and titles the lack of which led to great losses and much difficulty in making collections the cause of the poverty complained of is not far to seek under the flagrant disregard of the prescribed safeguards it is not surprising that defalcations were by no means infrequent the general negligence and the tenderness manifested to official malfeasance facilitated and encouraged embezzlement it could be concealed by skillfully falsified statements but when a receiver died his estate was not uncommonly found to be indebted to the fisc thus in the account of lasado del mar of valencia in 1647 there is an item of three hundred seventy two libras fourteen sueldos two ducats still due by the heirs of the late receiver minuarte although two thousand four hundred libras had already been collected of them during the previous five or six years so when in sixteen sixty four juan mathieu receiver of barcelona was murdered and his accounts were finally reduced to order in sixteen sixty six they were found to be short in the large sum of forty seven thousand three hundred fifty nine libras one swell though the widow petitioned to be released or at least to have an abatement which was refused but she was given two years in which to settle a somewhat typical antemortem case was that of carlos albornoz receiver of valencia who it may be remembered endeavored in seventeen thirteen to secure the reversion of his office for his son aged twelve and a few years later succeeded in so doing there was trouble in getting him to render his accounts for seventeen twenty three and three or four subsequent years and making him pay over the tolerably large confiscations of all our son and macanas in seventeen twenty seven he was allowed to resign in favor of his son and in seventeen twenty eight active measures were taken to compel him to furnish his accounts and make payments which resulted in obtaining six thousand reales and a statement on this in december seventeen twenty eight the auditor-general found a balance against him of six thousand two hundred forty eight libras ten sueldos one ducat besides sums paid by the towns of villanueva de castellon and denia which were not entered in his books then commenced the attempt to effect a settlement which continued until seventeen thirty four with more or less success his son being meanwhile continued in office while in the whole voluminous correspondence there is no intimation of any thought of punishing him for his inveterate disobedience and dishonesty the confiscations in fact seemed to carry with them an infection the licentiate vicente vidal was administer of the valencia portion of the estate of macanas and on settlement of his accounts he was found to be in debt some eighteen hundred libras the administration was transferred to manuel molner to whom he gave a deed for a property renting for one hundred libras in seventeen twenty nine he paid his debt and then in seventeen thirty two he had the effrontery to ask the suprema to refund to him the rents received from his property while in molnar's hands while thus much of the chronic complaint of indigence may reasonably be attributed to mismanagement and peculation it would be unjust to the inquisition to ascribe to it a specially bad eminence in this respect it was probably neither better nor worse than the other departments of the government neglect of duty and misappropriation of funds common enough to this day in public affairs were in past times rather the rule than the exception and flourished in spain perhaps to a greater extent than elsewhere multiplication of offices and inadequate salaries are direct incentives to irregular gains and the practical immunity of offenders caused by the unwise effort to preserve the external reputation of the holy office was an encouragement which could not fail to induce slovenly service disobedience of rules and frequent embezzlement
End of Book 5, Chapter 5, Part 2「Book Six, Chapter One of the History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Peck, also known as Papa Man. The History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume Two by Henry Charles Lay. Book Six, Practice, Chapter One, The Edict of Grace. Allusion has occurred above to the Edicts of Grace, which, in the earlier period, played an important part in the machinery of the Inquisition. It was a custom inherited from the 13th century, of which the conditions, as adopted in Spain, are expressed in the instructions of 1484. When, at any place, a tribunal was open, at the close of the initial sermon, the inquisitors were to publish a term of grace, lasting for thirty or forty days, during which those conscious of heresy could come forward, making complete confession of all errors remembered, including those of others. They were to be assured that all who did so, with contrition and desire to abjure, would be charitably received, would be given salutary penance, and would not be condemned to death, to perpetual prison, or to confiscation, but the inquisitors were empowered to reconcile them, and, at their discretion, to require them to give as alms a certain portion of their property, in aid of the holy war with the Moors. Spontaneous Confession after the term of grace, provided the parties had not been testified against, secured reconciliation with confiscation, where adverse testimony had been received, heavier penalties, even to perpetual prison, could be inflicted. In the supplementary instructions of December 6, 1484, Torquemada added that the sovereigns granted to those thus reconciled the right to collect debts and confirm all alienations made prior to the reconciliation but that no subsequent alienations or encumbrances on real estate would be valid without special royal license. This still left questions unsettled, and in Torquemada's further instructions of January 5, 1485, it was provided that, if the reconciled held public office, they were to be temporarily disabled until their steadfastness in the faith was proved. Those who had been prevented by sickness or other just impediment from availing themselves of the term of grace, were to be admitted, but, if there was proof against them, they were subject to confiscation, and their cases would be submitted for the royal decision. Those who did not confess fully as to themselves and others were to be regarded as fictitious converts, and, if evidence was received against them, were to be prosecuted with the utmost rigor. Fugitives coming forward within the term were to be admitted. A case occurring in 1483 shows that this was a mitigation of the pitiless strictness with which the limits of the term of grace had been observed. When, in December of that year, Juan Chinchilla was on trial at Ciudad Real, one of the articles of accusation was that he had not come forward during the term. In reply, he stated that the Commodore del Carral had sent him away during that time, that he had gone to the Inquisition to confess, but Padre Chantano had retired after hearing Mass, and he had been told to return at another time. Then he went to the receiver and begged him for God's sake to get him admitted. The receiver had promised to do so, and came to summon him. He thought that he was being taken to the Inquisitors, but found himself thrown in prison. His explanation availed him nothing, nor did his free confession of his errors, and he was duly burnt. In the awful confusion and haste of those opening years, such cases must have been frequent. There were few formalities observed, for there had not been time to develop an elaborate course of procedure, and each inquisitor, to a large extent, followed his own devices. I have nowhere met with the full text of an Edict of Grace, 
but the substantial formula is given in the sentence pronounced January 30th, 1484, in Ciudad Real against the fugitives Sancho de Ciudad and his wife. This recites that, as there was a public report that in Ciudad Real many nominal Christians followed the law of Moses, the inquisitors had verified it by testimony that, desiring to treat them with clemency, they had issued their edict that all thus guilty should come forward and abjure within thirty days, when they would be treated with all possible mercy, that they had extended this for thirty days more, and had received all who desired to present themselves, after which they had issued their summons and edict against all who had fled, and had been testified against as suspect and defamed for heresy. We have seen what this mercy in penitential processions and heavy immersements, and we shall see how illusory in many cases was the promised immunity owing to the diminution or imperfection of the confession. It was required to be full about themselves and others. The assumption necessarily was that they were genuine converts at heart, and as such must be eager not only to discharge their consciousness as to all past errors, but to aid in the punishment of all heretics and apostates, including those nearest and dearest to them. Anything short of this showed that their confession was fictitious, and thus it only added to their guilt. Ample evidence against them was attainable, not only from informers, who were numerous and active, but from the confessions of others, whether coming in under the edict or on trial. The tribunals were watchful in utilizing all this material, and reconciliation under the edict was apt to be supplemented by arrest and condemnation. The confessions under the edict of grace are pitiful reading. The poor creatures naturally admit as little as possible in the hope of diminishing the pecuniary penance. They strive to extenuate their errors and throw the blame on those who misled them. They grovel before the inquisitors, profess the deepest contrition, and promise strenuous perseverance in the faith. They rarely go out of their way to compromise others, but they frankly state who it was that perverted them and have no hesitation in implicating parents and kindred and benefactors. Unlike the priests in the confessional, the inquisitors abstained from interrogating them or seeking information about themselves or others. It was not their policy to stimulate confession, and the penitent was allowed to state as much or as little as he chose. The results are evidently the unassisted work of the penitents, inconsistent, rambling, frequently almost unintelligible, whether written by themselves or taken down verbatim by the notaries, for it was essential that they should be of the record, to be brought up against them in the probable case of backsliding or of testimony to admitted facts. The Confession of Maria Gonzalez de la Papana, Ciudad Real, October 9, 1483, may be taken as a specimen. In it, she throws all the blame upon her husband and recites the thrashings received at his hands to force her to follow Jewish observances. She was duly admitted to reconciliation, but in about three months she was arrested and tried and was burnt in the great auto de fe of February 23, 1484. The unsubstantial character of the mercy promised in the Edict of Grace is illustrated in the typical case of Andres Gonzalez, parish priest of Talavera. Soon after the Tribunal of Toledo had been organized, and before there had been any proclamation in the Archdeaconate of Talavera, he sought to protect himself by appearing before the Tribunal, making confession and obtaining reconciliation. Doubtless prisoners on trial testified against him, for he was soon afterwards arrested. November 5th, 1484, he made a fuller confession, covering all the points of Judaism and disbelief in the sacraments which he had been administering. In spite of his professions of repentance, the fiscal claimed that this was extorted by fear, and presented the evidence of ten witnesses whose testimony as a whole was but a confirmation of his confession. He gained nothing by his self denuation He was degraded from the priesthood and burnt in the auto de fe of August 17, 1486.
If thus the edict of grace was of little benefit to the new Christians, it was the of utmost service to the Inquisition. The multitudes who came forward contributed large sums in their alms. They gave the tribunals wide knowledge of suspects and a means of subsequently convicting them on the score of their imperfect confessions, for their confessions could not fail to be technically imperfect. Moreover, the necessity of denouncing all accomplices furnished an invaluable mass of testimony for further prosecutions. Thus, by this simple and apparently merciful expedient, the Inquisitor was provided with funds and had his work laid out for him, enabling him to gather in his harvest with small labor of investigation and with full certainty of results. The Fisk, who had a further advantage in the opportunity afforded by the imperfect confessions of the reconciled, Besides the general compositions for confiscation described above, there were special ones exempting the conversos from this particular peril. Thus, a royal cedula of April 6, 1491, grants to those of Valencia for 5,000 ducats release of confiscation for all imperfect confessions and for heresies committed up to that date, except in cases of relapse. Their fears were speculated upon in every way conceivable. This probably explains some obscure allusions to a time of mercy, as distinguished from the time of grace, of which the clearest account we have refers to Majorca. A contemporary relates that some years after the time of grace, perhaps too, when many heretics had confessed some errors, but not all, and had suppressed the names of many accomplices, a rigorous inquisition was made against them. Then, at the persuasion of a certain great rabbi, nearly all the apostates, seeing the afflictions visited upon them, came to the palace of the inquisitors with loud cries and tears. I wish they were sincere, begging for pardon. Then new confessions were made, and by command of the inquisitor general, with the consent of King Ferdinand, they were admitted to mercy with a moderate pecuniary fine to redeem their lawfully confiscated property and that time was called the time of mercy. And this incurred in our city of the kingdom of Majorca, the time of grace in 1488, and the time of mercy in 1490, when I was ten years old. Yet the grace and mercy were of little avail, for, from then until the current year 1524, the inquisition against them has never ceased. Many were delivered to the secular court, and very many exposed to shame and imprisoned for life and their property confiscated, yet never would they amend. However successful was the device of the Edict of Grace, from the point of view of inquisitor and king, it evidently won over but few to the faith, and after a comparatively brief experience, the conversos recognized that those who availed themselves of it were in a distinctly worse position than before, as their confessions were on record against them in case of relapse, and they were exposed to the added danger that any imperfections in those confessions were legally construed as impenitence, which was mortal. We shall see, when considering the subject of confession, that this question of imperfection was treated so rigidly as to render its avoidance practically impossible, and of this the Inquisition took full advantage for we find a Suprema instructing the tribunals to scrutinize carefully all confessions made by those under trial and compare them with those presented in the time of grace to see whether anything had been concealed and whether the so-called penitents counsel with each other to shield their friends and kindred. This latter clause points to another serious bar to the success of Edicts of Grace in the obligation to denounce accomplices, which involved the exposure to prosecution of all the friends and kindred of the penitent. This was especially felt when the enforced conversion of the Moriscos subjected them to the Inquisition, for one of their evil qualities, we are told, was that, while they could be forced to confess freely about themselves, they could not be induced to betray their neighbors, wherefore they were burnt for impenitence. The Moriscos offered the largest field for the exploitation of terms of grace during nearly a century. There was an earnest desire, for reasons of state, to secure their conversion, and special concessions were made to them with little result. 
The details of these will be more conveniently considered hereafter, and it will suffice here to mention that King Philip II, towards the close of his reign, proposed to issue an edict of a comprehensive character which should determine the question of expulsion. Thence of the futility of such measures involving the denunciation of accomplices, he applied to Clement the Eighth for permission to omit it, but the pontiff was more rigid than the king, and, in his brief authorizing the edict, he insisted on the denunciation of apostates. Philip's death in 1598 postponed the issue of the edict until August 22, 1599. Every effort was made to render it successful, and the twelve months conceded in it were extended to eighteen, expiring on February 28, 1601. The result was awaited with anxiety, and on August 22, 1601, the inquisitors reported that during the whole term only thirteen persons had taken advantage of it, and these had made such imperfect confessions and had so shielded their accomplices that they deserved condemnation rather than absolution. For two centuries after the expulsion of the Moriscos, we hear nothing more of Edicts of Grace. There were no longer in Spain bodies of heretics or suspects to whom such expedients were applicable, and the desired unity of faith was secured so far as practicable, but with the Napoleonic Wars there came new sources of infection. Spain was traversed from end to end by armies composed of heretics, like the English, or the largely of three thinkers, like the French. Jews had taken advantage of the troublous times to pollute the sacred soil and liberal ideas. Abhorred alike by church and state had ample opportunity of dissemination. With the reestablishment of the Inquisition in 1814, it seemed opportune to meet the flood of heresy and libertinism by the old methods. On January 2nd, February 10th, and April 5th of 1815, therefore, the Inquisitor General issued Edicts of Grace, promising that all who during the current year should come forward and denounce themselves for heresy or other crimes justicable by the Inquisition should be absolved without punishment and without obligation to denounce accomplices. This was followed April 12th with orders to collect all information possible, but not to prosecute until after the expiration of the term, when all who should not have spontaneously presented themselves were to be put on trial. This comprehensive plan can scarce be pronounced a success. The records show that a few Espanados availed themselves of the promised grace, but the number was lamentably insignificant. This did not encourage prolongation of the term, and on January 12, 1816, another edict announced its expiration and the revival of the old obligation to denounce all offenses known to the penitent. There does not seem to have followed any outbursts of prosecutions. The tribunals, doubtless, had been too much occupied in repairing their shattered fortunes to waste much thought on accumulating information as to heretics. End of Book 6 Chapter 1